All Cats Are Grey by Andrew North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. All Cats Are Grey by Andrew North. Under normal conditions, a whole person has a decided advantage over a handicapped one. But out in deep space, the normal may be reversed. For humans, at any rate. Steena of the Spaceways, that sounds just like a corny title for one of the Stella Vido spreads. I ought to know. I've tried my hand at writing enough of them. Only this Steena was no glamour babe. She was as colourless as a lunar plant. Even the hair netted down to her skull had a sort of greyish cast, and I never saw her but once draped in anything but a shapeless and baggy grey space all. Stina was strictly background stuff, and that is where she mostly spent her free hours, in the smelly, smoky background corners of any stellar port dive frequented by free spacers. If you really looked for her, you could spot her, just sitting there listening to the talk, listening and remembering. She didn't open her own mouth often, but when she did, spacers had learned to listen. And the lucky few who heard her rare spoken words, these will never forget Steena. She drifted from port to port. Being an expert operator on the big calculators, she found jobs wherever she cared to stay for a time, and she came to be something like the master-minded machines she tended, smooth, grey, without much personality of her own. But it was Steena who told Bob Nelson about the Joven Moonrites, and her warning saved Bob's life six months later. It was Steena who identified the piece of stone Keen Clark was passing around a table one night, rightly calling it unworked slightite. That started a rush, which made ten fortunes overnight for men who were down to their last jets. And, last of all, she cracked the case of the Empress of Mars. All the boys who had profited by her queer store of knowledge and her photographic memory tried at one time or another to balance the scales, but she wouldn't take so much as a cup of canal water at their expense, let alone the credits they tried to push on her. Bub Nelson was the only one who got around her refusal. It was he who brought her bat. About a year after the Joven affair, he walked into the freefall one night and dumped bat down on her table. Bat looked at Stina and growled. She looked calmly back at him and nodded once. From then on they travelled together, the thin grey woman and the big grey tomcat. Bat learned to know the inside of more stellar bars than even most spacers visit in their lifetimes. He developed a liking for vernal juice, drank it neat and quick, right out of a glass and he was always at home on any table where Steena elected to drop him. This is really the story of Steena, Bat, Cliff Moran, and the Empress of Mars, a story which is already a legend of the spaceways, and it's a damn good story too. I ought to know, having framed the first version of it myself. For I was there, right in the Rigel Royal, when it all began on the night that Cliff Moran blew in, looking lower than an ant-man's belly, and twice as nasty. He'd had a spell of luck foul enough to twist a man into a slug snake, and we all knew that there was an attachment out for his ship. Cliff had fought his way up from the back courts of Venaport, lose his ship, and he'd slip back there to rot. He was at the snarling stage that night when he picked out a table for himself and set out to drink away his troubles. However, just as the first bottle arrived, so did a visitor. Steena came out of her corner, Bat curled around her shoulders stolewise, his favourite mode of travel. She crossed over and dropped down without invitation at Cliff's side. That shook him out of his sulks, because Steena never chose company when she could be alone. If one of the manstones on Ganymede had come stumping in, it wouldn't have made more of us look out of the corners of our eyes. She stretched out one long-fingered hand and set aside the bottle he had ordered, and said only one thing. It's about time for the Empress of Mars to appear again. Cliff scowled and bit his lip. He was tough, 
tough as jet lining. You have to be granite inside and out to struggle up from Venaport to a ship command. But we could guess what was running through his mind at that moment. The Empress of Mars was just about the biggest prize a spacer could aim for. But in the fifty years she had been following her queer, derelict orbit through space, many men had tried to bring her in, and none had succeeded. A pleasure ship carrying untold wealth, she had been mysteriously abandoned in space by passengers and crew, none of whom had ever been seen or heard of again. At intervals thereafter she had been sighted, even boarded. Those who ventured into her either vanished or returned swiftly, without any believable explanation of what they had seen, wanting only to get away from her as quickly as possible. But the man who could bring her in, or even strip her clean in space, that man would win the jackpot. All right, Cliff slammed his fist down on the table. I'll try even that. Steena looked at him, much as she must have looked at Bat the day Bub Nelson brought him to her, and nodded. That was all I saw. The rest of the story came to me in pieces, months later, and in another port half the system away. Cliff took off that night. He was afraid to risk waiting, with a writ out that could pull the ship from under him. And it wasn't until he was in space that he discovered his passengers, Steena and Bat. We'll never know what happened then. I'm betting that Steena made no explanation at all. She wouldn't. It was the first time she had decided to cash in on her own tip, and she was there. That was all. Maybe that point weighed with Cliff. Maybe he just didn't care. Anyway, the three were together when they sighted the Empress riding, her dead lights gleaming, a ghost ship in night space. She must have been an eerie sight because her other lights were on too, in addition to the red warnings at her nose. She seemed alive, a flying Dutchman of space. Cliff worked his ship skillfully alongside, and had no trouble in snapping magnetic lines to her lock. Some minutes later, the three of them passed into her. There was still air in her cabins and corridors, air that bore a faint corrupt taint which set back to sniffing greedily, and could be picked up even by the less sensitive human nostrils. Cliff headed straight for the control cabin, but Steena and Bat went prowling. Closed doors were a challenge to both of them, and Stina opened each as she passed, taking a quick look at what lay within. The fifth door opened on a room which no woman could leave without further investigation. I don't know who had been housed there when the Empress left port on her last lengthy cruise. Anyone really curious can check back on the old photo reg cards. But there was a lavish display of silk trailing out of two travel kits on the floor a dressing-table crowded with crystal and jewelled containers, along with other lures for the female which drew Steena in. She was standing in front of the dressing-table when she glanced into the mirror, glanced into it, and froze. Over her right shoulder she could see the spider-silk cover on the bed. Right in the middle of that sheer, gossamer expanse was a sparkling heap of gems, the dumped contents of some jewel-case. Bat had jumped to the foot of the bed, and flattened out as cats will, watching those gems, watching them, and something else. Steena put out her hand blindly, and caught up the nearest bottle. As she unstoppered it, she watched the mirrored bed. A gemmed bracelet rose from that pile, rose in the air, and tinkled its siren song. It was as if an idle hand played. Bat spat almost noiselessly, but he did not retreat. Bat had not yet decided his course. She put down the bottle, then she did something which perhaps few of the men she had listened to through the years could have done. She moved without hurry or sign of disturbance on a tour about the room. And, although she approached the bed, she did not touch the jewels. She could not force herself to that. It took her five minutes to play out her innocence and unconcern. Then it was Bat who decided the issue. He leaped from the bed and escorted something to the door, remaining a careful distance behind. Then he mewed loudly twice. Stina followed him and opened the door wider. Bat went straight on down the corridor, as intent as a hound on the warmest of scents. Stina strolled behind him, holding her pace to the unhurried gait of an explorer. 
What sped before them both was invisible to her, but Bat was never baffled by it. They must have gone into the central control cabin almost on the heels of the Unseen, if the Unseen had heels, which there was a good reason to doubt. For Bat crouched just within the doorway and refused to move on. Stina looked down the length of the instrument panels and officers' station seats to where Cliff Moran worked. On the heavy carpet her boots made no sound, and he did not glance up, but sat humming through set teeth as he tested the tardy and reluctant responses to buttons which had not been pushed in years. To human eyes they were alone in the cabin, but Bat still followed a moving something with his gaze, and it was something which he had at last made up his mind to distrust and dislike. For now he took a step or two forward and spat, his loathing made plain by every raised hair along his spine, and in that same moment Stina saw a flicker, a flicker of vague outline against Cliff's hunched shoulders, as if the invisible one had crossed the space between them. And why had it been revealed against Cliff and not against the back of one of the seats or against the panels, the walls of the corridor or the cover of the bed where it had reclined and played with its loot? What could Bat see? The storehouse memory that had served Stina so well through the years clicked open a half-forgotten door. With one swift motion she tore loose her space all and flung the baggy garment across the back of the nearest seat. Bat was snarling now, emitting the throaty rising cry that was his hunting song. But he was edging back, back towards Stina's feet, shrinking from something he could not fight, but which he faced defiantly. If he could draw it after him, past that dangling space all, he had to. It was their only chance. What the... Cliff had come out of his seat and was staring straight at them. What he saw must have been weird enough. Stina, bare-armed and shouldered, her usually stiffly netted hair falling wildly down her back. Stina watching empty space with narrowed eyes and set mouth, calculating a single wild chance. Bat crouched on his belly, retreating from thin air, step by step, and wailing like a demon. "'Toss me your blaster!' Stina gave the order calmly, as if they still sat at their table in the Rigel Royal, and as quietly Cliff obeyed. She caught the small weapon out of the air with a steady hand, caught and levelled it. "'Stay just where you are,' she warned. "'Back, Bat! Bring it back!' With a last, throat-splitting screech of rage and hate, Bat twisted to safety between her boots. She pressed with thumb and forefinger, firing at the space oars. The material turned to powdery flakes of ash, except for certain bits which still flapped from the scorched seat, as if something had protected them from the force of the blast. Bat sprang straight up in the air with a scream that tore their ears. What? began Cliff again. Stina made a warning motion with her left hand. Wait! She was still tense, still watching Bat. The cat dashed madly around the cabin twice, running crazily, with white-ringed eyes and flecks of foam on his muzzle. Then he stopped abruptly in the doorway, stopped and looked back over his shoulder for a long, silent moment. He sniffed delicately. Stina and Cliff could smell it too now, a thick, oily stench which was not the usual odour left by an exploding blaster shell. Bat came back, treading daintily across the carpet, almost on the tips of his paws. He raised his head as he passed Stina, and then he went confidently beyond to sniff, to sniff and spit twice at the unburned strips of the space hall. Having thus paid his respects to the late enemy, he sat down calmly and set to washing his fur with deliberation. Stina sighed once and dropped into the navigator's seat. "'Maybe now you'll tell me what the hell's happened,' Cliff exploded as he took the blaster out of her hand. "Gray," she said dazedly, "'it must have been grey, or I couldn't have seen it like that. I'm colour-blind, you see. I can only see shades of grey. My whole world is grey. Like Bat's, his world is grey, too. All grey. But he's been compensated, for he can see above and below our range of colour vibrations, and, apparently, so can I. Her voice quavered, and she raised her chin with a new air Cliff had never seen before, a sort of proud acceptance. She pushed back her wandering hair, but she made no move to imprison it under the heavy net again. 
That is why I saw the thing when it crossed between us. Against your space orb, it was another shade of grey, an outline. So I put out mine and waited for it to show against that. It was our only chance, Cliff. It was curious at first, I think, and it knew we couldn't see it, which is why it waited to attack. But when Bat's actions gave it away, it moved. So I wanted to see that flicker against the space saw, and then I let him have it. It's really very simple. Cliff laughed a bit shakily. But what was the grey thing? I don't get it. I think it was what made the Empress a derelict, something out of space, maybe, or from another world somewhere. She waved her hands. It's invisible because it's a colour beyond our range of sight. It must have stayed in here all these years. And it kills, it must, when its curiosity is satisfied. Swiftly she described the scene in the cabin and the strange behaviour of the gem pile, which had betrayed the creature to her. Cliff did not return his blaster to its holder. Any more of them on board, do you think? He didn't look pleased at the prospect. Steena turned to bat. He was paying particular attention to the space between two front toes in the process of a complete bath. I don't think so, but Bat will tell us if there are. He can see them clearly, I believe. But there weren't any more, and two weeks later Cliff, Steena and Bat brought the Empress into the lunar quarantine station. And that is the end of Steena's story, because, as we have been told, happy marriages need no chronicles. And Steena had found someone who knew of her grey world, and did not find it too hard to share with her, someone besides Bat. It turned out to be a real love match. The last time I saw her she was wrapped in a flame-red cloak from the looms of Rigel, and wore a fortune in Joven rubies blazing on her wrists. Cliff was flipping a three-figure credit bill to a waiter, and Bat had a row of vernal juice glasses set up before him. Just a little family party out on the town. End of All Cats Are Grey by Andrew North The Anglers of Ours by Roger D. Aycock This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. The Anglers of Ours. The third night of the Marco Four's landfall on the moonless Altarian planet was a repetition of the two before it, a nine hour intermission of drowsy pastoral peace. Navigator Arthur Farrell, it was his turn to stand watch, was sitting at an open side port with a magna scanner ready but in spite of his vigilance he had not exposed a film when the inevitable pre-dawn rainbow began to shimmer over the eastern ocean. Sunrise brought him alert with a jerk, frowning at sight of two pinkish bipedal Arzean fishermen posted on the tiny coral islet a quarter mile offshore, their blank triangular faces turned stolidly toward the beach. "'They're at it again!' Farrell called and dropped to the mossy turf outside. Roll out on the double. I'm going to magnafilm this." Stryker and Gibson came out of their sleeping cubicles reluctantly, belting on the loose shorts which all three wore in the balmy Arzian climate. Stryker blinked and yawned as he led himself through the port, his fringe of white hair tousled and his naked paunch sweating. He looked, Farrell thought for the thousandth time, more like a retired cook than the veteran commander of a Terran colony's expedition. Gibson followed, stretching his powerfully muscled body like a wrestler to throw off the effects of sleep. Gibson was linguist ethnologist of the crew, a blocky man in his early thirties, with thick black hair and heavy brows that shaded a square, humorless face. "'Any signs of the squids yet?' he asked. "'They won't show up until the dragons come.' Farrell said. He adjusted the light filter of the magnascanner and scowled at Stryker. "'Lee, I wish you'd let me break up the show this time with a disbeam. This butchery gets on my nerves.' Stryker shielded his eyes with his hands against the glare of sun on water. "'You know I can't do that, Arthur. These Arzians may turn out to be fifth-order beings or higher.' 
and under Terran regulations our tampering with what may be a basic culture pattern would amount to armed invasion. We'll have to crack that cackle and grunt language of theirs and learn something of their mores before we can interfere." Farrell turned an irritable stare on the incurious group of Arzians gathering, nets and fishing spears in hand, at the edge of the sheltering bramble forest. "'What stumps me is their motivation,' he said. Why do the fools go out to that islet every night, when they must know damn well what will happen next morning?" Gibson answered him with an older problem, his square face puzzled. For that matter, what became of the city I saw when we came in through the stratosphere? It must be a tremendous thing, yet we've searched the entire globe in the scouter and found nothing but water and a scattering of little islands like this one, all covered with bramble. It wasn't a city these pink fishers could have built either. The architecture was beyond them by a million years." Stryker and Farrell traded baffled looks. The city had become something of a fixation with Gibson, and his dogged insistence, coupled with an irritating habit of being right, had worn their patience thin. "'There never was a city here, Gib,' Stryker said. You dozed off while we were making planet fall, that's all." Gibson stiffened resentfully, but Farrell's voice cut his protest short. "'Get set! Here they come!' Out of the morning rainbow dropped a swarm of winged lizards, twenty feet in length and a glistening chlorophyll green in the early light. They stooped like hawks upon the islet offshore bearing the two Arzian fishers instantly under their snapping, threshing bodies. Then around the outcrop the sea boiled whitely, churned to foam by a sudden uprushing of black, octopoid shapes. "'The squids,' Stryker grunted, "'right on schedule. Two seconds too late, as usual, to stop the slaughter.' A barrage of barbed tentacles lashed out of the foam and drove into the melee of winged lizards. The lizards took the air at once, leaving behind three of their number who disappeared under the surface like harpooned seals. No trace remained of the two Arzian natives. "'A neat example of dog-eat-dog,' -dog, Farrell said, snapping off the magnascanner. "'Do any of those beauties look like city-builders, Gib?' Chattering pink natives straggled past from the shelter of the thorn forest, ignoring the earthmen, and lined the casting ledges along the beach to begin their day's fishing. "'Nothing we've seen yet could have built that city,' Gibson said stubbornly. "'But it's here somewhere, and I'm going to find it. Will either of you be using the scouter today?' Stryker threw up his hands. I've a mountain of data to collate, and Arthur is off duty after standing watch last night. Help yourself, but you won't find anything." The scouter was a speeding dot on the horizon when Farrell crawled into his sleeping cubicle a short time later, leaving Stryker to mutter over his litter of notes. Sleep did not come to him at once. A vague sense of something overlooked prodded irritatingly at the back of his consciousness but it was not until drowsiness had finally overtaken him that the discrepancy assumed definite form. He recalled then that on the first day of the Marcos planet fall one of the pink fishers had fallen from a casting ledge into the water, and had all but drowned before his fellows pulled him out with extended spear shafts. Which meant that the fishers could not swim, else some would surely have gone in after him and the Marcos crew had explored ours exhaustively without finding any slightest trace of boats or of boat landings. The train of association completed itself with automatic logic, almost rousing Farrell out of his doze. "'I'll be damned,' he muttered. "'No boats, and they don't swim. Then how the devil do they get out to that islet?' He fell asleep with the paradox unresolved. Stryker was still humped over his records when Farrell came out of his cubicle and broke a packaged meal from the food locker. The visicom over the control board hummed softly, 
its screen blank on open channel. "'Gibson found his lost city yet?' Farrell asked, and grinned when Stryker snorted. "'He's scouring the daylight side now,' Stryker said. "'Arthur, I'm going to ground Gib tomorrow, much as I dislike giving him a direct order. He's got that phantom city on the brain, and he lacks the imagination to understand how dangerous to our assignment an obsession of that sort can be." Farrell shrugged. "'I'd agree with you offhand, if it weren't for Gibbs' bull-headed habit of being right. I hope he finds it soon, if it's here. I'll probably be standing his watch until he's satisfied." Stryker looked relieved. Would you mind taking it tonight? I'm completely bushed after today's logging." Farrell waved a hand and took up his magnascanner. It was dark outside already, the close, soft night of a moonless tropical world, whose moist atmosphere absorbed even starlight. He dragged a chair to the open port and packed his pipe, settling himself comfortably while Stryker mixed a nightcap before turning in. Later he remembered that Stryker dissolved a tablet in his glass, but at the moment it meant nothing. In a matter of minutes the older man's snoring drifted to him, a sound faintly irritating against the velvety hush outside. Farrell lit his pipe and turned to the inconsistencies he had uncovered. The Arzians did not swim, and without boats. It occurred to him then that there had been two of the pink fishers on the islet each morning, and the coincidence made him sit up suddenly, startled. Why two? Why not three or four, or only one? He stepped out through the open lock and paced restlessly up and down the springy turf, feeling the ocean breeze soft on his face. Three days of dull routine log-work had built up a need for physical action that chafed his temper. He was intrigued and at the same time annoyed by the enigmatic relation that linked the Arzian fishers to the dragons and squids, and his desire to understand that relation was aggravated by the knowledge that ours could be a perfect world for Terran colonization. That is, he thought wryly, if Terran colonists could stomach the weird custom pursued by its natives of committing suicide in pairs. He went over again the improbable drama of the past three mornings, and found it not too unnatural until he came to the motivation and the means of transportation that placed the Arzians in pairs on the islet, when his whole fabric of speculation fell into a tangled snarl of inconsistencies. He gave it up finally. How could any Earthman rationalize the outlandish compulsions that actuated so alien a race? He went inside again, and the sound of Stryker's muffled snoring fanned his restlessness. He made his decision abruptly, laying aside the magnascanner for a hand flash and a pocket sized audiocom unit which he clipped to the belt of his shorts. He did not choose a weapon because he saw no need for one. The torch would show him how the natives reached the outcrop, and if he should need help, the audiocom would summon Stryker. Investigating without Stryker's sanction was, strictly speaking, a breach of Terran regulations, but— Damn Terran regulations, he muttered. I've got to know. Farrell snapped on the torch at the edge of the thorn forest and entered briskly, eager for action now that he had begun. Just inside the edge of the bramble he came upon a pair of Arzians curled up together on the mossy ground, sleeping soundly their triangular faces wholly blank and unrevealing. He worked deeper into the underbrush and found other sleeping couples, but nothing else. There were no humming insects, no twittering nightbirds or scurrying rodents. He had worked his way close to the center of the island without further discovery, and was on the point of turning back disgusted when something bulky and powerful seized him from behind. A sharp sting burned his shoulder, wasp-like and a sudden overwhelming lassitude swept him into a darkness deeper than the Arzian night. His last conscious thought was not of his own danger, but of Stryker, asleep and unprotected behind the Marco's open port. He was standing erect when he woke, 
his back to the open sea and a prismatic glimmer of early dawn rainbow shining on the water before him. For a moment he was totally disoriented. Then from the corner of an eye he caught the pinkish blur of an Arzian fisher standing beside him, and cried out hoarsely in sudden panic when he tried to turn his head and could not. He was on the coral outcropping offshore, and except for the involuntary muscles of balance and respiration his body was paralyzed. The first red glow of sunrise blurred the reflected rainbow at his feet, but for some seconds his shuttling mind was too busy to consider the danger of predicament. Whatever brought me here anesthetized me first, he thought. That sting in my shoulder was like a hypo-needle. Panic seized him again when he remembered the green flying lizards. More seconds passed before he gained control of himself, sweating with the effort. He had to get help. If he could switch on the audio comm at his belt and call Stryker. He bent every ounce of his will toward raising his right hand and failed. His arm was like a limb of lead, its inertia too great to budge. He relaxed the effort with a groan, sweating again when he saw a fiery half-disk of sun on the water, edges blurred and distorted by tiny surface ripples. On shore he could see the Marco Four resting between thorn forest and beach, its silvered sides glistening with dew. The port was still open, and the empty carrier rack in the bow told him that Gibson had not yet returned with the scouter. He grew aware then that sensation was returning to him slowly, that the cold surface of the audio comm unit at his hip, unfelt before, was pressing against the inner curve of his elbow. He bent his will again toward motion. This time the arm tensed a little, enough to send hope flaring through him. If he could put pressure enough against the stud, the tiny click of its engaging sent him faint with relief. Stryker! he yelled. Lee! Roll out! Stryker! The audio comm hummed gently without answer. He gathered himself for another shout and recalled with a chill of horror the tablet Stryker had mixed into his nightcap the night before. Worn out by his work, Stryker had made certain that he would not be easily disturbed. The flattened sun disk on the water brightened and grew rounder. Above its reflected glare he caught a flicker of movement, a restless suggestion of flapping wings. He tried again. Stryker! Help me! I'm on the islet! The audio comm crackled. The voice that answered was not Stryker's, but Gibson's. Farrell, what the devil are you doing on that butcher's block? Farrell fought down an insane desire to laugh. Never mind that. Get here fast, Gib. The flying lizards! He broke off, seeing for the first time the octopods that ring the outcrop just under the surface of the water, waiting with barbed tentacles spread and yellow eyes studying him glassily. He heard the unmistakable flapping of wings behind and above him then, and thought with shock-born lucidity, I wanted a backstage look at this show, and now I'm one of the cast. The scouter roared in from the west across the thorn forest, flashing so close above his head that he felt the wind of its passage. Almost instantly he heard the shrilling blast of its emergency bowjets as Gibson met the lizard swarm head on. Gibson's voice came tinnily from the audio comm. Scattered them for the moment, Arthur. Blinded the whole crew with the exhaust, I think. Stand fast now. I'm going to pick you up." The scouter settled on the outcrop beside Farrell, so close that the hot wash of its exhaust gases scorched his bare legs. Gibson put out thick brown arms and hauled him inside like a straw man, ignoring the native. The scouter darted for shore, with Farrell lying across Gibson's knees in the cockpit his head hanging half overside. Farrell had a last dizzy glimpse of the islet against the rush of green water below, and felt his shaky laugh of relief stick in his throat. Two of the octopods were swimming strongly for shore, 
holding the rigid Arzian native carefully above the water between them. Gib, Farrell croaked. Gib, can you risk a look back? I think I've gone mad. The scouter swerved briefly as Gibson looked back. You're all right, Arthur. Just hang on tight. I'll explain everything when we get you safe in the Marco. Farrell forced himself to relax, more relieved than alarmed by the painful pricking of returning sensation. I might have known it, damn you, he said. You found your lost city, didn't you? Gibson sounded a little disgusted, as if he were still angry with himself over some private stupidity. I'd have found it sooner, if I'd had any brains. It was under water, of course. In the Marco IV, Gibson routed Stryker out of his cubicle and mixed drinks around, leaving Farrell comfortably relaxed in the padded control chair. The paralysis was still wearing off slowly, easing Farrell's fear of being permanently disabled. We never saw the city from the scouter because we didn't go high enough, Gibson said. I realized that, finally, remembering how they used high-altitude blimps during the first wars to spot submarines, and when I took the scouter up far enough, there it was, at the ocean bottom, a city to compare with anything men ever built. Stryker stared. A marine city? What use would sea creatures have for buildings? None, Gibson said. I think the city must have been built ages ago, by men or by a man-like race, judging from the architecture, and was submerged later by a sinking of land masses that killed off the original builders, and left ours nothing but an oversized archipelago. The squids took over then, and from all appearances, they have developed a culture of their own. I don't see it, Stryker complained, shaking his head. The pink fishers. Are cattle or less, Gibson finished. The octopods are the dominant race, and they're so far above fifth order that we're completely out of bounds here. Under Terran regulations, we can't colonize ours. It would be an armed invasion. Invasion of a squid world? Farrell protested, baffled. Why should surface colonization conflict with an undersea culture, Gib? Why couldn't we share the planet? Because the octopods own the islands, too, and keep them policed, Gibson said patiently. They even own the pink fishers. It was one of the squid people making a dry land canvas of his preserve here to pick up a couple of victims for this morning's show that carried you off last night. Behold a familiar pattern shaping up, Stryker said. He laughed suddenly, a great irrepressible bellow of sound. Ours is a squid's world, Arthur, don't you see? And like most civilized peoples, they're sportsmen. The flying lizards are the game they hunt, and they raise the pink fishers for... Farrell swore in astonishment. Then those poor devils are put out there deliberately, like worms on a hook, angling in reverse. No wonder I couldn't spot their motivation. Gibson got up and sealed the port, shutting out the soft morning breeze. Colonization being out of the question, we may as well move on before the octopods get curious enough about us to make trouble. Do you feel up to the acceleration, Arthur? Farrell and Stryker looked at each other, grinning. Farrell said, You don't think I want to stick here and be used for bait again, do you? He and Stryker were still grinning over it when Gibson, unamused, blasted the Marco IV free of ours. The End of The Anglers of Ours by Roger D. Acock The Asses of Balaam by Gordon Randall Garrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson the Asses of Balaam. 
the remarkable characteristic of Balaam's ass was that it was more perceptive than its master. Sometimes a child is more perceptive, because more straightforward and logical than an adult. It is written in the Book of Numbers that Balaam, a wise man of the Moabites, having been ordered by the king of Moab to put a curse upon the invading Israelites, mounted himself upon an ass and rode forth toward the camp of the children of Israel. On the road he met an angel with drawn sword, barring the way. Balaam, not seeing or recognizing the angel, kept urging his ass forward, but the ass recognized the angel and turned aside. Balaam smote the beast and forced it to return to the path, and again the angel blocked the way with drawn sword. And again the ass turned aside, despite the beating from Balaam, who, in his blindness, was unable to see the angel. When the ass stopped for the third time and lay down, refusing to go further, Balaam waxed exceeding wrath and smote again the animal with a stick. Then the ass spoke and said, why dost thou beat me? I have always obeyed thee, and never have I failed thee. Have I ever been known to fail thee? And Balaam answered, No. And at that moment his eyes were opened, and he saw the angel before him. Studies in Scripture by Segawin of Eboracum With the careful precision of controlled anger, Dodeth Pell rippled a stomp along his right side. Clop, 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 clop. Each of his twelve right feet came down in turn while he glared across the business bench at Wygor Bittus. He started the ripple again while he waited for Wygor's answer. The ripple was a good deal more effective than just tapping one's fingers, and equally as satisfying. Wygor Bettis twitched his mouth and allowed his eyelids to slide up over his eyeballs in a slow blink before answering. Dodeth had simply asked, Why wasn't this reported to me before? But Wygor couldn't find the answer as simply as that. Not that he didn't have a good answer. It was just that he wanted to couch it in exactly the right terms. Dodeth had a way with raking sarcasm that made a person tend to cringe. Jodeth was perfectly well aware of that. He hadn't been in the executive office of Predator Council all these years for nothing. He knew how to handle people, when to praise them, when to flatter them, when to rebuke them, and when to drag them unmercifully over the shell-bed. He waited, his right legs marching out their steady rhythm. Well, said Wygor at last, it was just that I couldn't see any point in bothering you with it at that point. I mean, one specimen." "'Of an entirely new species!' snapped Dodeth in a sudden interruption. His legs stopped their rhythmic tramp. His voice rose from its usual eight-thousand-cycle rumble to a shrill squeak. "'Fry it, Wygor! If you weren't such a good field man, I'd have sacked you long ago. Your trouble is, that you have a penchant for bringing me problems that you ought to be able to solve by yourself, and then flipping right over on your back and holding off on some information that ought to be brought to my attention immediately." There wasn't much Wygor could say to that, so he didn't try. He simply waited for the raking to come, and sure enough it came. Dodeth's voice lowered itself to a soft purr. The next time you have to do anything as complicated as setting a snith trap, you just hump right down here and ask me, and I'll tell you all about it. On the other hand, if the lower levels all suddenly become infested with shelks at the same time, why, you just take care of that little detail yourself, eh? The only other alternative is to learn to think." Wygor winced a trifle and kept his mouth shut. Having delivered himself of his jet of acid, Dodeth Pell looked down at the data booklet that Wygor had handed him. Fortunately, he said, there doesn't seem to be much to worry about. Only the universal motivator knows how this thing could have spawned, but it doesn't appear to be very efficient. No, sir, it doesn't, said Wygor, taking heart from his superior's mild tone. The eating orifice is oddly placed and the teeth are obviously for grinding purposes. 
I was thinking more of the method of locomotion, Dodeth said. I believe this is a record, although I'll have to look in the files to make sure. I think that six locomotive limbs is the least I've ever heard of on an animal that size. I've checked the files, said Wygor. There was a four-limbed leaf-eater recorded seven hundred years ago. Four locomotive limbs, that is, and two grasping. But it was only as big as your hand. Dodith looked through the three pages of the booklet. There wasn't much there, really, but he knew Wygor well enough to know that all the data he had thus far was there. The only thing that rankled was that Wygor had delayed for three work periods before reporting the intrusion of the new beast, and now five of them had been spotted. He looked at the page which showed the three bathographs that had been taken of the new animals from a distance. There was something odd about them, and Dodeth couldn't, for the height of him, figure out what it was. It aroused an odd fear in him, and made him want to burrow deeper into the ground. "'I can't see what keeps them from falling over,' he said at last. "'Are they as slow-moving as they look?' "'They don't move very fast.' Wygor admitted. But we haven't seen any of them startled yet. I don't see how they could run very fast, though. It must take every bit of awareness they have to stay balanced on two legs." Dodeth sighed whistlingly and pushed the data booklet back across the business bench to Wygor. "'All right. I'll file the preliminary spotting report. Now get out there and get me some pertinent data on this queer beast. Scramble off. Right away, sir. And Wygor? Yes, sir? It's apparent that we have a totally new species here. It will be called a Wygorex, of course, but it would be better if we waited until we could make a full report to the keepers. So don't let any of this out, especially to the other septs. Certainly not, sir. Not a whistle. Anything else? Just keep me posted, that's all. Scramble off. After Wygor had obediently scrambled off, Dodeth relaxed all his knees and sank to his belly in thought. His job was not an easy one. He would like to have his office get full credit for discovering a new species, just as Wygor had, understandably enough, wanted to get his share of the credit. On the other hand, one had to be careful that holding back information did not constitute any danger to the balance. After all, the balance must be preserved. Even the Snith had its place in the ecological balance of the world, although one didn't like to think about Sniths as being particularly useful. After all, every animal, every planet had its place in the scheme. Each contributed its little bit to maintaining the balance. Each had its niche in the ecological architecture, as Dodeth liked to think of it. The trouble was that the balance was a shifting, swinging, ever-changing thing. Living tissues carried the genes of heredity in them, and living tissues are notoriously plastic under the influence of the proper radiation or particle bombardment. And animals would cross the poles. The world had been excellently designed by the universal motivator for the development and evolution of life. Again the concept of the balance showed in his mighty works. Suppose, for instance, that the world rotated more rapidly about its axis, thereby exposing the whole surface periodically to the deadly radiation of the blue sun, instead of having a rotation period that, combined with the eccentricity of the world's orbit, gave it just enough libration to expose only sixty-three per cent to the rays leaving the remaining thirty-seven per cent in twilight or darkness. Or suppose the orbit were so nearly circular that there were no perceptible libration at all. One side would burn eternally, and the other side would freeze, since there would be no seasonal winds blowing first east, then west, bringing the warmth of the blue sun from the other side. Or again, suppose there were no moon and no yellow sun to give light to the dark side. Who could live in an everlasting night? Or suppose that the magnetic field of the world were too weak to focus the majority of the blue sun's output of electrons and ions on the poles. How could life have evolved at all? 
balance. And the ultimate universal motivator had put part of the responsibility into the hands of his only intelligent species. And a part of that part had been put into the hands of Dodeth Pell as the head of predator control. Fry it! Something was niggling at the back of Dodeth's mind, and no amount of philosophizing would shake it. He reached into the drawer of the business bench and pulled out the duplicate of Wygor's data booklet. He flipped it open and looked at the bathographs again. There was no single thing about them that he could pinpoint. But the beasts just didn't look right. Dodeth Pell had seen many monstrous animals in his life, but none like this. Most people disliked and were disgusted by a snith because of the uncanny resemblance the stupid beast had to the appearance of Dodeth's own race. There could be no question of the genetic linkage between the two species. But, in spite of the physical similarities, their actions were controlled almost entirely by instinct instead of reason. They were like some sort of idiot parody of intelligent beings. But it was their similarity which made them loathsome. Why should Dodeth Pell feel a like emotion when he saw the bathographs of the two-legged thing? Certainly there was no similarity. Wait a minute. He looked carefully at the three-dimensional pictures again. Fry it, he couldn't be sure. After all, he wasn't a geneticist. Checking the files wouldn't be enough. He wouldn't know how to ask the proper cross-filing questions. He lolled his tongue out and absently rasped at a slight itch on the back of his hand while he thought. If his hunch were correct, then it was time to call in outside help now, instead of waiting for more information. Still, he needn't necessarily call in official expert help just yet. If he could just get a lead, enough to verify or disprove the possibility of his hunch being correct, that would be enough for a day or two, until Wygor got more data. There was always Yerdeth, an older para-brother on his prime father's side. Yerdeth had studied genetics, theoretical, not applied with the thought of going into control, and kept on dabbling in it even after he had discovered that his talents lay in the robot design field. Arden, he said sharply. At the other end of the office the robot assistant ceased his work for a moment. Yes, sir? Come here a minute. I want you to look at something. Yes, sir. The robot's segmented body was built very much like Dodeth's own except that instead of the twelve pairs of legs that supported Dodeth's body, the robot was equipped with wheels, each suspended separately and equipped with its own individual power source. Ardan rolled sedately across the floor, his metallic body gleaming in the light from the low ceiling. He came to a halt in front of Dodeth's business bench. Dodeth handed Ardan the thin data booklet. Scan through that. Ardan went through it rapidly, his eyes carefully scanning each page, his brain recording everything permanently. After a few seconds, he looked back up at Dodeth. A new species? Exactly. Did you notice anything odd about their appearance? Naturally, said Ardan. Since their like has never been seen before, it is axiomatic that they would appear odd. Fry it, Dodeth thought. He should have known better than to ask a question like that of Ardan. To ask it to determine what might be called second-order strangeness in a pattern that was strange in the first place was asking too much of a robot. Very well, then. Make an appointment for this evening with your death Pell. I would like to see him at his home, if it is convenient. Yes, sir, said the robot. Evening was four work periods away, and even after Yerdeth had granted the appointment, Dodeth found himself fidgeting in anticipation. Twice during the following work periods, Wygor came in with more information. He had gone above ground with a group of protection robots finally to take a look at the new animals himself. 
but he hadn't yet managed to obtain enough data to make a definitive report on the strange beasts. But the lack of data was, in itself, significant. Dodeth usually liked to walk through the broad tunnels of the main thoroughfares, since he didn't particularly care to ride Robot back for so short a distance. But this time he was in such a hurry to see Yerdeth that he decided to let Ardan take him. He climbed aboard, clamped his legs to the robot's sides, and said, To Yerdeth Pels. The robot said, Yes, sir, and rolled out to the side tunnel that led toward one of the main robot tunnels. When they finally came to a tunnel labeled Robots and Passengers Only, Ardan rolled into it and revved his wheels up to high speed, shooting down the tunnelway at a much higher velocity than Dodeth could possibly have run. The tunnelway was crowded with passenger-carrying robots and with robots alone, carrying out orders from their masters. But there was no danger. No robot could harm any of Dodeth's race nor could any robot stand idly by while someone was harmed. Even in the most crowded of conditions every robot in the area had one thing foremost in his mind, the safety of every human within sight or hearing. Dodeth ignored the traffic altogether. He had other things to think about, and he knew, without even bothering to consider it, that Ardan could be relied upon to take care of everything. Even if it cost him his own pseudo-life, Ardan would do everything in his power to preserve the safety and health of his passenger. Once in a while, in unusual circumstances, a robot would even disobey orders to save a life, for obedience was strictly secondary to the sanctity of human life, just as the robot's desire to preserve his own pseudo-living existence was outranked by the desire to obey. Dodeth thought about his job, but he carefully kept his mind off the new beasts. He knew that fussing in his mind over them wouldn't do him any good until he had more to work with, things which only his para-brother, Yerdeth, could supply him. Besides, there was the problem of what to do about the Herkel breeding sites, which were being encroached upon by the Quiggies. Some of the swamps on the surface, especially those that approach the hot belts, were being dried out and filled with dust, which decreased the area where the Herkel could lay its eggs, but increased the nesting sites for Quiggies. That, of course, was a yearly cycle in general. As the blue sun moved from one side to the other, and the winds shifted accordingly, the swamps near the twilight border would dry out or fill up accordingly. But this year the eastern swamps weren't filling up as they should and some precautionary measures would have to be taken to prevent too great a shift in the quirkle quiggy balance. Then there was the compensating migratory shift of the hotland beasts, those which lived in the areas where the slanting rays of the blue sun could actually touch them, and which could not stand the, to them, terrible cold of the darklands. Instead, they moved back and forth with the blue sun, and remained in their own area a hot, dry, fiery bright hinterland occupied only by Gnurs, Gapoles, and other horrendous beasts. Beyond those areas, according to the robot patrols which had reconnoitered there, nothing lived. Nothing could. No protoplasmic being could exist under the direct rays of the blue sun. Even the metal and translite bodies of a robot wouldn't long protect the sensitive mechanisms within from the furnace heat of the huge star. Each species had its niche in the world. Some, like the Herkel, lived in swamp water. Others lived in lakes and streams. Still others flew in the skies or roamed the surface or climbed the great trees. Some, like Dodeth's own people, lived beneath the surface. The one thing an intelligent species had to be most careful about was not to disturb the balance with their abilities, but to work to preserve it. In the past there had been those who had built cities on the surface, but the cities had removed the natural growth from large areas, which, in turn, had forced the city people to import their food from outside the cities, and that had meant an enforced increase in the cultivation of the remaining soil which destroyed the habits of other animals, 
besides depleting the soil itself. The only sensible way was to live under the farmlands, so that no man was ever more than a few hundred feet from the food supply. The universal motivator had chosen that their species would evolve in burrows beneath the surface, and if that was the niche chosen for Dodeth's people, then that was obviously where they should remain to keep the balance. Of course, the Snith too was an underground animal, though the tunnels were unlined. The Snith's tunnels ran between and around the armored tunnels of Dodeth's people, so that each city surrounded the other without contact, if the burrows of the Snith could properly be called a city. Your death Pell's residence, said Ardan. Ah, yes. Dodeth, his thoughts interrupted, slid off the back of the robot and flexed his legs. Wait here, Ardan. I'll be back in an hour or so. Then he scrambled over to the door which led to Yurdeth's apartment. Twenty minutes later, Yurdeth Pell looked up from the data book facsimiles and scanned Dodeth's face with appraising eyes. Very cute, he said at last with a slight chuckle. Now, what I want to know is, is someone playing a joke on you, or are you playing a joke on me? Dodeth's eyelids slid upwards in a fast blink of surprise. What do you mean? Why, these bathographs! Yurdith wrapped the bathographs with a wrinkled horny hand. He was a good deal older than Dodeth, and his voice had a tendency to rasp a little when the frequency went above twenty thousand cycles. They're very good, of course, very good. The models have very fine detail to them. The eyes, especially, are good. They look as if they really ought to be built that way. He smiled and looked up at Dodeth. Dodeth resisted an urge to ripple a stomp. Well? he said impatiently. Well, they can't be real, you know, Yurdeth replied mildly. Why not? Oh, come now, Dodeth. What did it evolve from? An animal doesn't just spring out of nowhere, you know. New species are discovered occasionally, Dodeth said. And there are plenty of mutants and just plain freaks. Certainly, certainly. But you don't hatch a snith out of a hercule egg. Where are your intermediate stages? Is it possible that we might have missed the intermediate stage? I said stages, plural. Pick any known animal, any one, and tell me how many genetic changes would have to take place before you'd come up with an animal anything like this one. Again he tapped the bathograph. Take that eye, for instance. The lid goes down instead of up, but you notice that there's a smaller lid at the bottom that does go up, a little ways. The closest thing to an eye like that is on the huggle, which has eyelids on top that lower a little. But the huggle has eighteen segments, sixteen pairs of legs and two pairs of feeding claws. Besides, it's only the size of your thumb joint. What kind of gene mutation would it take to change that into an animal like the one in this picture? And look at the size of the thing. If it weren't in that awkward vertical position, if it were stretched out on the ground, it'd be as long as a human. Look at the size of those legs. Or take another thing. In order to walk on those two legs, the changes in skeletal and visceral structure would have to be tremendous. Couldn't we have missed the intermediate stages then? Dodith asked stubbornly. We've missed the intermediates before, I dare say. Perhaps we have, Yurdeth admitted. But if you boys in the Ecological Corps have been on your toes for the past thousand years, we haven't missed many. And it would take at least that long for something like this to evolve from anything we know. Even under direct polar bombardment? Even under direct polar bombardment. The radiation up here is strong enough to sterilize a race within a very few generations. And what would they eat? Not many plants survive there, you know. Oh, I don't say it's flatly impossible, you understand. If a female of some animal or other, 
carrying a freshly fertilized zygote, and her species happened to have all the necessary potential characteristics, and a flood of ionizing radiation went through the zygote at exactly the right time, and it managed to hit just the right genes in just the right way, well, I'm sure you can see the odds against it are tremendous. I wouldn't even want to guess at the order of magnitude of the exponent. I'd have to put on a ten in order to give you the odds against it." Dodith didn't quite get that last statement, but he let it pass. I am going to pull somebody's legs off, one by one, come next work period, he said coldly. One by one. He didn't, though. Rather than accuse Wygor, it would be better if Wygor were allowed to accuse himself. Dodeth merely wanted to wait for the opportunity to present itself. And then, ah, uh, then there would be a roasting. The opportunity came in the latter part of the next work period. Wygor, who had purportedly been up on the surface for another field trip, scuttled excitedly into Dodeth's office, wildly waving some bathograph sheets. Dodeth, sir, look! I came down as soon as I saw it. I've got the graphs right here. Horrible!" Before Dodeth could say anything, Wygor had spread the sheets out fanwise on the business bench. Dodeth looked at them and experienced a moment of horror himself, before he realized that these were, these must be, doctored bathographs. Even so, he gave an involuntary gasp. The first graphs had been taken from an aerial reconnaissance robot winging in low over the treetops. The others were taken from a higher altitude. They all showed the same carnage. An area of several thousand square feet, tens of thousands, had been cleared of trees. They had been ruthlessly cut down and stacked. Bushes and vines had gone with them, and the grass had been crushed and plowed up by the dragging of the great fallen trees. And there were obvious signs that the work was still going on. In the close-ups, he could see the bipedal beasts wielding cutting instruments. Dodeth forced himself to calmness and glared at the bathographs. Fry it, they had to be fakes. A new species might appear only once in a hundred years, but according to Yerdeth, this couldn't possibly be a new species. What was Wygor's purpose in lying, though? Why should he falsify data? And it must be he. He had said that he had seen the beasts himself. Well, Dodeth would have to find out. "'Tool users, eh?' he said, amazed at the calmness of his voice. Such animals weren't unusual. The Sniths used tools for digging and even for fighting each other, and the Herkles dammed up small streams with logs to increase their marshland. It wasn't immediately apparent what these beasts were up to, but it was far too destructive to allow it to go on. But, fry it all, it couldn't be going on. There were only two alternatives. Either Wygor was a liar, or Yurdeth didn't know what he was talking about. And there was only one way of finding out which was which. Ardan, get my equipment ready. We're going on a field trip. Wygor, you get the rest of the expedition ready. You and I are going up to see what all this is about." He jabbed at the communicator button. Fry it! Why should this have to happen in my sector? Hello! Give me an intercity connection. I want to talk to Batham Venz, coordinator of ecological control in Faisala. He looked up at Wygor. Scatter off, fry it! I want to— Oh, hello, Batham, sir. Dodeth. Have you had any reports on a new species, a bipedal one? What? No, sir, I'm not kidding. One of my men has brought in graphs of the thing. Frankly, I'm inclined to think it's a hoax of some kind, but I'd like to ask you to check to see if it's been reported in any of the other areas. We're located a little out of the way here, and I thought, perhaps, some of the stations farther north or south had seen it. Yes. That's right. Two locomotive limbs, two handling limbs. 
big as a human, and they hold their bodies perpendicular to the ground. Yes, sir, I know it sounds silly, and I'm going to check out the story now. But you ought to see these bathographs. If it's a hoax, there's an expert behind it. Very well, sir, I'll wait. Dodith scowled. Batham had sounded as if he, Dodith, had lost his senses. Maybe I have, he thought. Maybe I'll start running around mindlessly and get shot down by some patrol robot who thinks I'm a sniff. Maybe he should have investigated first and then called, when he was sure, one way or another. Maybe he should have told Batham he was certain it was a hoax, instead of hedging his bets. Maybe a lot of things, but it was too. Hello? Yes, sir. None, eh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll give you a call as soon as I've checked. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir." Dodeth felt like an absolute fool. Individually and collectively, he consigned to the frying-pan Batham, Wygor, Yerdeth, the new beast, if it existed, and finally himself. By the time he had finished his all-encompassing curse, his two dozen pistoning legs had nearly brought him to the equipment room, where Arden and Wygar were waiting. Four hours and more of steady traveling did very little to sweeten Dodeth Pell's temper. The armored car was uncomfortable, and the silence within it was even more uncomfortable. He did not feel at all like making small talk with Wygar, and he had nothing as yet to say to Ardan or the patrol robots who were rolling along with the armored car. One thing he had to admit. Wygor certainly didn't act like a man who was being carried to his own doom, which he certainly was if this was a hoax. Wygor would lose all position and be reduced to living off his civil insurance. He would be pitied by all and respected by none. But he didn't look as though that worried him at all. Dodeth contented himself with looking at the scenery. The car was not yet into the forest country. This was all rolling grassland. Off to one side, a small herd of grazing grancos lifted their graceful heads to watch the passage of the expedition, then lowered them again to feed. A fanged zitabenth, disturbed in the act of stalking the grancos, stiffened all his legs and froze for a moment, looking balefully at the car and the robots, then went on about his business. When they came to the forest, the going became somewhat harder. Centuries ago, those who had tried to build cities on the surface had also built paved strips to make travel by car easier and smoother, and Dodeth almost wished there were one leading to the target area. Fry it, he hated traveling, especially in a lurching armored car. He wished he were bored enough or tired enough to go to sleep. At last, at long last, Wygor ordered the car to stop. "'We're within two miles of the clearing, sir,' he told Dodeth. "'All right,' Dodeth said morosely. "'We'll go the rest of the way on foot. I don't want to startle them at this stage of the game, so keep it quiet and stay hidden. Tell the patrol robots to spread out, and tell them I want all the movie shots we can get.' I want all the keepers to see these things in action. Got that? Then let's get moving." They crept forward through the forest, Dodeth and Arden taking the right, while Wygor and his own robot, Arsam, stayed a few yards away to the left. They were all expert woodsmen, Dodeth and Wygor by training and experience, and the robots by indoctrination. Even so, Dodeth never felt completely comfortable above ground, with nothing over his head but the clouded sky. The team had purposely chosen to approach from a small rise, where they could look down on the clearing without being seen. And when they reached the incline that led up to the ridge, one of the armed patrol robots who had been in the lead took a look over the ridge and then scuttled back to Dodeth. They're there, sir. What are they doing? Dodeth asked, scarcely daring to believe. Feeding, I believe, sir. They aren't cutting down any trees now. They're just sitting on one of the logs, feeding themselves with their handling limbs. How many are there? Twenty, sir. 
I'll take a look. He scrambled up the ridge and peeked over. And there they were, less than a quarter of a mile away. Dazedly, Dodith took a pair of field glasses from Arden and focused them on the group. Oh, they were real, all right. No doubt of that. None whatever. Mechanically, he counted them. Twenty. Most of them were feeding. But four of them seemed to be standing a little apart from the others, watching the forest, acting as lookouts. Typical herd action, Dota thought. He wished Yerdeth was here. He'd show that fool what good his ten to the billionth odds were. And yet, in another way, Dodith had the feeling that his para-brother was right. How could the life of the world have suddenly evolved such creatures? For they looked even more impossible when seen in the flesh. Their locomotive limbs ended in lumpy protuberances that showed no sign of toes. And they were covered all over with a dull gray hide, except for the hands at the ends of their handling limbs and the necks and the faces of their oddly shaped heads, where the skin ranged in color from a pinkish to a definitive brown, depending on the individual. There was no hair anywhere on their bodies, except on the top and back of their heads. No wait, there were two long tufts above each eye. They— Do you see what they're eating? Wygor's voice whispered. Dodith hadn't. He'd been too busy looking at the things themselves. But when he did notice, he made a noise like a throttled GEEP! Hercules. There were few enough of the animals, only a few small population was needed to keep the balance, but they were important, and the swamps were drying up, and the quiggies were moving in on them, and now— Dodith made a hasty count. Twenty. By the universal motivator, these predators had eaten a hercule apiece. Overhead, the yellow sun, a distant dot of intensely bright light, shed its wan glow over the ghastly scene. Dodith wished the moon were out. Its much brighter light would have shown him more detail. But he could see well enough to count the gnawed skeletons of the little, harmless hercules. Even the moon, which wouldn't bring morning for another fifteen work periods yet, couldn't have made it any plainer that these beasts were deadly dangerous to the balance. "'How often do they eat?' he asked in a strained voice. It was Wygor's robot, Arsam, who answered. "'About three times every work period. They sleep, then. Their metabolic cycle seems to be timed about the same as yours, sir.' "'Gah!' said Dodeth. Sixty hercules per sleep period. Why, they'll have the whole hercule population eaten before long. Wygor, as soon as we can get shots of all this, we're going back. There's not a moment to lose. This is the most deadly dangerous thing that has ever happened to the world. Fry me, yes, Wygor said in an awed voice. Three hercules in one period. Allow me to correct you, sir said the patrol robot. They do not eat that many hercules. They eat other things besides. Like what, for instance? Dodeth asked in a choked voice. The robot told him, and Dodeth groaned. Omnivores! That's even worse! Arden, pass the word to the scouts to get their pictures and meet at that tree down there behind us in ten minutes. We've got to get back to the city. Dodeth Pell laid his palms flat on the speaker's bench and looked around at the assembled keepers of the balance, wise and prudent thinkers, who had spent lifetimes in ecological service and had shown their capabilities many times over. "'And that's the situation, sirs,' he said, after a significant pause. "'The moving and still bathographs, the data sheets, and the samplings of the area all tell the same story. I do not feel that I alone can make the decision. Emotionally, I must admit, I am tempted to destroy all twenty of the monsters. Intellectually, I realize that we should attempt to capture at least one family group, 
if we can discover what constitutes a family group in this species. Unfortunately, we cannot tell the sexes apart by visual inspection. The sex organs themselves must be hidden in the folds of that gray hide. And this is evidently not their breeding season, for we have seen no sign of sexual activity. We have very little time, sirs, it seems to me. The damage they have already done will take years to repair, and the danger of upsetting the balance irreparably grows exponentially greater with every passing work period. Sirs, I ask your advice and your decision." There was a murmur of approval for his presentation as he came down from the speaker's bench. Then the keepers went into their respective committee meetings to discuss the various problems of detail that had arisen out of the one great problem. Dodeth went into an anteroom and tried to relax and get a little sleep, though he doubted he'd get any. His nerves were too much on edge. Arden woke him gently. "'Your breakfast, sir.' Dodeth blinked and jerked his head up. "'Oh, ahem. Arden. Have the keepers reached any decision yet? No, sir, not yet. The data are still coming in." It was three more work periods before the keepers called Dodeth Pell before them again. Dodeth could almost read the decision on their faces. There was both sadness and determination there. It was an uncomfortable decision, Dodeth Pell, said the eldest keeper without preliminary but a necessary one. We can find no place in the ecological balance for this species. We have already ordered a patrol column of two hundred fully armed pesticide robots to destroy the animals. Two are to be captured alive if possible, but if not, the bodies will be brought to the biological laboratories for study. Within a few hours the species will be nearly or completely extinct. By the way, you may tell your assistant, Wygor, that the animal will go down in the files as Wygorex, a unique distinction for him in many ways, but not, I fear, a happy one." Dodeth nodded silently. Now that the decision had been made, he felt rather bad about it. Something in him rebelled at the thought of a species becoming extinct, no matter how great the need. He wondered if it would be possible for the biologists and the geneticists to trace the evolution of the animal. He hoped so. At least they deserved that much. Dodeth Pell delayed returning to his own city. He wanted to wait until the final results had been brought in before he returned to his duties. The delay turned out to be a little longer than he expected. Much longer, in fact. The communicator in his temporary room buzzed and when he answered, Wygor's voice came to him, a rush of excited words that didn't make any sense at all at first. And when it did make sense, he didn't believe it. "'What?' he squealed. "'What?' "'I said,' Wygor repeated, "'that the report has come back from the pesticide column. They found no trace of any such animal as we've described. They're nowhere to be found, in or near the clearing.' I think," said Dodeth very calmly, that I'll take a little trip over to the bright side and take up permanent residence there. It's going to be pretty hot for me around here before long." And he cut the connection without waiting for Wygor's answer. The armored car jounced across the grassland at high speed. Behind it two more cars followed, each taking care not to run exactly in the tracks of the one ahead so that there would be as little damage as possible done to the grass. In the lead car, Dodeth Pell watched the forest loom nearer, wondering what sort of madness he would find there this time. Beside him, the eldest keeper dozed gently, in the way that only the very young or the very old can doze. It was just as well, Dodeth didn't feel much like talking. This time, as they approached the clearing, he didn't bother to tell the car to stop two miles away. If the animals were gone, there was no point in being cautious. All through the wooded area he could see occasional members of the pesticide robots. He told the car to stop at the base of the little rise that he used before as a vantage point. 
Then, without further preliminaries, he got out of the car and marched up the slope to take a look at the clearing. Overhead, the burning spark of the yellow sun cast its pale radiance over the landscape. At the ridge, he stopped suddenly and ducked his head. Then he grabbed his field glasses and took a good look. The animals had built themselves a few crude-looking shelters out of the logs, but he hardly noticed that. There were four of the animals in plain sight, standing guard. The others were obviously inside the rude huts asleep. Great galloping fungus blight! Was he out of his mind? What was going on around here? Couldn't the robots see the beasts? That's very odd, said the voice of the eldest keeper in puzzled tones. I thought the robots said they'd gone away. Lend me your field glasses. As he handed the powerful glasses over to the keeper, who had followed him up the hill, Dodith said, I'm glad you can see them. I thought maybe my brain had been short-circuited. I can see them, said the eldest keeper, peering through the glasses. Then he handed them back to Dodith. Let's get back to the car. I want to find out what's going on around here. At the car, the eldest keeper just scowled for a moment, looking very worried. By this time, the other two cars had pulled up nearby, discharging their cargo of two more keepers apiece. While the eldest keeper talked in low tones with his colleagues, Dodith stalked over to one of the pesticide robots who was prowling nearby. Found anything useful? he asked sarcastically, knowing that sarcasm was useless on a robot. I'm not looking for anything useful, sir. I'm looking for the animals we are supposed to destroy. You come over and tell the eldest keeper that, Dodith said. Yes, sir, the robot agreed promptly, rolling along beside Dodith as he returned to where the keepers were waiting. What's going on here? the eldest demanded curtly of the robot. Why haven't you destroyed the animals? Because we can't find them, sir. What's your name? the eldest snapped. A Reich, sir. All right, a Reich, said the eldest, somewhat angrily. Stand by for orders. You'll repeat them to the other robots, understand? Yes, sir, said the robot. All right, then, said the eldest. First, you take a run up that hill and look into that clearing. You'll see those creatures in there all right. Yes, sir, I've seen those creatures in there. The eldest keeper exploded. Then get in there and obey your orders. Don't you realize that their very existence threatens the life of all of us? They must be eliminated before our whole culture is destroyed. Do you understand? Obey. Yes, sir," said the robot. His voice sounded odd, but he spun around and went to pass the word on to the other robots. Within minutes, more and more of the pesticide robots were swarming towards and into the clearing. They could hear rumbling noises from the clearing, low grunts that were evidently made by animals who were trapped by the encircling robots. And then there was a vast silence. Dodeth and the keepers waited. Not a shot was fired. It was as though a great soundproof blanket had been flung over the whole area. What in the unknown name of the universal motivator is going on around here? said Dodeth in a hushed tone. He wondered how many times he had asked himself that. We may as well take a look, said the eldest keeper. Two hundred pesticide robots were ranged around the perimeter of the clearing, their weapons facing inward. Not a one of them moved. Inside the circle of machines, the twenty Wigorex stood motionless, watching the ring of robots. Now and then, one of them gave a deep, coughing rumble, but otherwise they made no noise. Dodeth Pell could stand it no longer. Robots! he shouted as loudly as he could his voice shrill with urgency. I order you to fire! It was as though he hadn't said a word. Both robots and Wigorex ignored him completely. 
Dodeth turned and yelled to one of the patrol robots that was standing nearby. You! What's your name? Arvam, sir. Arvam, can you tell what it is those things have done to the robots? They haven't done anything, sir. Then why don't the robots fire as they've been told to? Dodeth didn't want to admit it, even to himself, but he was badly frightened. He had never heard of a robot behaving this way before. They can't, sir. They can't? Don't they realize that if those things aren't killed, we may all die? I didn't know that, said the patrol robot. If we do not kill them, then you may be killed, and you have ordered us to kill them. But if we obey your orders, then we will kill them, and that will mean that you won't be killed. But they will, so we can't do that. But if we don't, then you will be killed, and we must obey. And that means we must, but we can't. But if we don't, we will. And we can't, so we must, but we can't, but if we don't, you will, so we must, but we can't, but we... He kept repeating it over and over again, on and on and on. Stop that! snapped Odeth. But the robot didn't even seem to hear. Dodeth was really frightened now. He looked back at the five keepers and scuttled toward them. What's wrong with the robots? he asked shrilly. They've never failed us before. The elder keeper looked at him. What makes you think they've failed us now? he asked softly. Dodeth gaped speechlessly. The eldest didn't seem to be making any more sense than the patrol robot had. No, the keeper went on, they haven't failed us. They have served us well. They have pointed out to us something which we have failed to see, and in doing so have saved us from making a catastrophic error. I don't understand, said Odeth. I'll explain, the elder keeper said, but first go over to that patrol robot and tell him quietly that the situation has changed. Tell him that we are no longer in any danger from the Wigorex. Then bring him over here." Dodeth did as he was told, without understanding at all. "'I still don't understand, sir,' he said bewilderedly. "'Dodeth, what would happen if I told Arvam here to fire on you?' "'Why, why, he'd refuse.' Why should he? Because I'm human. That's the most basic robot command." "'I don't know,' the eldest said, eyeing Dodeth shrewdly. "'You might not be a human. You might be a snith. You look like a snith.' Dodeth swallowed the insult, wondering what the eldest meant. "'Arvam,' the eldest keeper said to the robot, doesn't he look like a snith to you?" Yes, sir, Arvem agreed. Dodeth swallowed that one, too. Then how do you know he isn't a snith, Arvem? Because he behaves like a human, sir. A snith does not behave like a human. And if something does behave like a human, what then? Anything that behaves like a human is human, sir. Dodeth suddenly felt as though his eyes had suddenly focused after being unfocused for a long time. He gestured toward the clearing. You mean those... those things... are human? Yes, sir, said Arvam solidly. But they don't even talk! Pardon me for correcting you, sir, but they do. I cannot understand their speech but the pattern is clearly recognizable as speech. Most of their conversation is carried on in tones of subsonic frequency, so your ears cannot hear it. Apparently your voices are supersonic to them." "'Well, I'll be fried,' said Dodeth. He looked at the Elder Keeper. "'That's why the robots reported they couldn't find any animal of that description in the vicinity.' "'Certainly.' there weren't any. And we were so fooled by their monstrous appearance that we didn't pay any attention to their actions," said Dodeth. Exactly. But this makes the puzzle even worse, 
said Dodeth. How could such a creature evolve? Look, interrupted one of the other keepers, pointing. Up there, in the sky. All eyes turned toward the direction the finger pointed. It was a silvery speck in the sky that moved and became larger. I don't think they're from our world at all, said the eldest keeper. He turned to the patrol robot. Arvam, go down and tell the pesticide robots that there is no danger to us. They're still confused, and I have a feeling that the humans in that ship up there might not like it if we are caught pointing guns at their friends. As Arvam rolled off, Dodith said, Another world? Why not? asked the eldest. The moon, after all, is another world, smaller than ours, to be sure, and airless, but still another world. We haven't thought too much about other worlds, because we have our own world to take care of. But there was a time, back in the days of the builders of the surface cities, when our people dreamed such things. But our moon was the only one close enough, and there was no point in going to a place which is even more hellish than our bright side. But suppose the yellow sun also has a planet, or maybe even one of the more distant suns, which are hardly more than glimmers of light. They came, and they landed a few of their party to make a small clearing. Then the ship went somewhere else, to the dark side of our moon, maybe, I don't know. But they were within calling range, for the ship was called as soon as trouble appeared. We don't know anything about them yet, but we will, and we've got to show them that we too are human. We have a job ahead of us, a job of communication. But we also have a great future if we handle things right." Dodeth watched the ship, now grown to a silvery globe of tremendous size, drift slowly downward toward the clearing. He felt an inward glow of intense anticipation, and he fidgeted impatiently as he waited to see what would happen next. He rippled a stomp. The End of The Asses of Balaam by Gordon Randall Garrett Cat and Mouse by Ralph Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. Cat and Mouse by Ralph Williams. The warden needed to have a certain very obnoxious pest eliminated, and he knew just the pest eradicator he needed. The Harn first came to the warden's attention through its effect on the game population of an area in World Seven of the warden sector. A natural ecology was being maintained on World Seven as a control for experimental seedlings of intelligent life forms in other similar worlds. How the Harn got there, the warden never knew. In its free-moving larval state, the Harn was a tick-like creature which might have sifted through a natural interdimensional rift or it might have come through as a hitchhiker on some legitimate traveler, possibly even the warden himself. In any event, it was there now. Free of natural enemies and competition, it had expanded enormously. So far the effect in the control world was localized, but this would not be the case when the Harn seated. Prompt action was indicated. The warden's inclination and training was in the direction of avoiding direct intervention in the ecology of the worlds under his jurisdiction, even in the field of predator control. He considered introduction of natural enemies of the Harn from its own world and decided against it. That cure was as bad, if not worse, than the disease itself. There was, however, in one adjacent world a life-form not normally associated with the Harn, but which analysis indicated would be inimical to it and reasonably amenable to control. It was worth trying, anyway. October 3rd. Ed Brown got up to the base cabin of his trap line with his winter's outfit. He hung an N.C. Company calendar on the wall and started marking off the days. October 8th. The hole in the other world opened. In the meantime, of course, 
Ed had not been idle. All summer the cabin had stood empty. He got his bedding, stove, and other cabin gear down from the cache and made the place livable. The mice were thick, a good fur sign, but a nuisance otherwise. Down in the cellar hole, when he went to clear it out for the new spud crop, he found burrowings everywhere. Well, old Tom would take care of that in short order. Tom was a big, black, bobtailed cat, eleven years old, who had lived with Ed since he was a kitten. Not having any feline companionship to distract him, his only interest was hunting mice. Generally he killed a lot more than he could eat, racking the surplus in neat piles beside the trail, on the doorstep, or on a slab in the cellar. He was the best mauser in interior Alaska. Ed propped the cellar latch with a stick so old Tom could come and go as he pleased, and went on about his chores, working with a methodical efficiency that matched Tom's, and went with his thinning gray hair and forty years in the woods. He dug the spuds he had planted that spring. He made a swing around his beaver lakes, tallying the blankets in each house. He took the canoe and moved supplies to his upper cabin. He harvested some fat mallard that had moved down on the river with the coming of skim ice on the lakes. He bucked up firewood and stacked it to move into camp with the first snow. On the fifth morning, as he was going down to the boat landing with a pail for water, he found the hole in the other world. Ed had never seen a hole into another world, of course, nor even heard of such a thing. He was as surprised as anyone would naturally be to find one not fifty feet from their front door. Still, his experience had been all in the direction of believing what his eyes told him. He had seen a lot of strange things in his life, and one more didn't strain him too much. He stood stock still where he had first noticed the hole, and studied it warily. It was two steps off the trail to the left, right beside the old leaning birch, a rectangular piece of scenery that did not fit. It looked to be, as nearly as he could judge, about man-size, six by three. At the bottom it was easy enough to see where this world left off, and that one began. On the left side the two worlds matched pretty well, but on the right side there was a niggerhead in this world, the moss-covered relic of a centuries-old stump, while that world continued level, so that the niggerhead was neatly sliced in two. Also the vegetation was different, mossy on this side, grassy on that. On up around the hold, though, it was harder to tell. There was no clear-cut line, just the difference in what you could see through it. In the other world the ground seemed to fall away with low scrubby brush in the foreground. Then a mile or so away there were rising hills with hardwood forests of some kind, still green with summer, covering them. Ed stepped cautiously to one side. The view through the hole narrowed, as if it faced the trail squarely. He edged around the old birch to get behind it, and from that side there was no hole just the same old Alaskan scenery, birch and rose bushes and spruce. From the front, though, it was still there. He cut an alder shoot about eight feet long, trimmed it, and poked it through the hole. It went through easily enough. He prodded at the sod in the other world, digging up small tufts. When he pulled the stick back, some of the other world dirt was on the sharp end. It looked and smelled just about like any dirt. Old Tom came stretching out in the morning sun and stalked over to investigate. After a careful inspection of the hole, he settled down with his paws tucked under him to watch. Ed took a flat round can from his pocket, lined his lip frugally with snuff, and sat down on the upended bucket to watch too. At that moment that seemed like the likeliest thing to do. It was nearly swarming time. The Harn had many things to preoccupy it but it spared one unit to watch the hole into the other world. So far nothing much had happened. A large biped had found the opening from the other side. It had been joined by a smaller quadruped, but neither showed any indication of coming through. The sun was shining through the hole, a large yellow sun, and the air was crisp with sharp interesting orders. The biped ejected a thin squirt of brown liquid through the hole, venom of some sort apparently. The horn hastily drew back out of range. The hole into the other world stayed there, 
as unobtrusively fixed as if it had been there since the beginning of time. Nothing came through, and nothing moved in the other world, but leaves stirring now and then with a breeze, clouds drifting across the sky. Ed began to realize it was getting late in the morning, and he had not yet had breakfast. He left old Tom to watch the hole, got stiffly to his feet, and went on down the trail to get the pail of water he had started for. From the cabin door he could still see the hole into the other world. He kept one eye on it while he cooked breakfast. As he was finishing his second cup of coffee he noticed the view into the other world becoming duller, dimming in a peculiar fashion. He left the dirty dishes and went over to look more closely. What was happening, he found, was just that it was getting dark in the other world. The effect was strange much like looking out the door of a brightly lighted room at dusk. The edges of the hole cast a very clearly marked shadow now, and outside this shaft of sunlight the view faded, until a few yards away it was impossible to make out any detail. Presently the stars came out. Ed was not an astronomer, but he had a woodsman's knowledge of the sky. He could find nothing familiar in any of the stars he saw. In some way that was more unsettling than the hole itself had been. After he had finished the dishes he cut two G-pole spruce, trimmed them, and stuck one on each side of the hole. He got some thin thread he used to tie beaver snares, and wove it back and forth between the poles, rigging a tin can alarm. It seemed likely some one or some thing had put the hole there. It had not just happened. If anything came through, Ed wanted to know about it. Just to make extra sure, he got some number three traps and made a few blind sets in front of the hole. Then he went back to his chores. Whatever was going to happen with the hole would happen when it happened, and winter was still coming. He set some babiche to soak for mending his snowshoes. He ran the net he had set at the edge of the eddy for late silvers and took out two fish. Old Tom had pretty well cleaned up the mice in the cellar hole but they were still burrowing around the sills of the lean-to. Ed took a shovel and opened up a hole so Tom could get under the lean-to floor. He got out his needles, palm, thread, and wax, and mended his winter moccasins. Off and on he checked the hole into the other world. There was nothing but the slow progression of alien stars across the sky. Finally old Tom got bored and left to investigate the hole under the lean-to. Shortly there were scutterings and squeakings as evidence that he too had got back to business. Toward evening Ed got to wondering how a living creature would take transition into the other world. He had no intention of trying it himself until he knew a lot more about it, but he thought he might be able to scare off a surrogate. Out by the woodpile some live traps were piled under a spruce from the time when Ed had been catching Martin for the fish and wildlife to transplant one was still in pretty fair shape. He patched it up and set it among the cottonwoods at the head of the bar, where there were some rabbit trails. When he went to bed it was still dark in the other world. He left the cabin door ajar so he could see it from his bed and set his shotgun loaded with double-o buck ammo. Nearing sixty, Ed was not a sound sleeper, even when he had nothing on his mind. About ten it started to get light in the other world, and that woke him up. He padded out to look, but there was no change. It looked about the same as yesterday. He went back to bed. The next morning there was a rabbit in the live trap. With a pole Ed pushed the trap with the rabbit in it through into the other world and watched. Nothing happened. After a while the rabbit began nibbling at some spears of grass that pushed through the wire of the cage. Ed pulled it back and examined the rabbit carefully. It seemed healthy and about as happy as a rabbit could expect to be in a cage. It did not get dark in the other world till about noon that day, and about seven when it was dark in both worlds Ed heard the jangle of the tin can alarm followed by the snap of one of the sealed traps. He took a flashlight and found a small hoofed animal, hardly bigger than old Tom, rearing and bucking with a broken leg in the trap. It had sharp little spike horns, only a few inches long, but mean. Ed got several painful jabs before he got the animal tied up and out of the trap. He restrung the alarm, then took his catch into the cabin to examine. 
It was herbivorous and adult, from the looks of its teeth and hoofs, though it weighed only about fifteen pounds. As an approximation, Ed decided it was a female. When he killed it and opened it up, at first glance it looked reasonably familiar. On closer study, less so. The blood, anyway, was red, not blue or yellow or green, and the bones were bones, just odd-shaped. Ed cut off a slice of heart and tossed it to old Tom. The cat sniffed it dubiously and then decided he liked it. He meowed for more. Ed gave it to him and fried a small sliver of ham. It smelled and tasted fine, but Ed contented himself with a single delicate nibble, pending further developments. Anyway, it was beginning to look like a little exploration would be feasible. The Harn also was well satisfied with the way things were going. It had been a strain to pass up the juicy little quadruped in the cage, but the inhabitants of the other world seemed shy, and the Harn did not wish to frighten them. At least it knew now that life could come through the hole, and the small herbivore it had herded through confirmed that passage in the opposite direction was equally possible, plus a gratis demonstration of the other world's pitiful defenses. At swarming time the whole new world would be open to embryo Harn as well as this world it presently occupied. It looked like a really notable swarming. The Harn butted three more planters on the forcing stem to be ready to take full advantage of it. It got light in the other world at one in the morning that night. Ed had the days there pretty well pegged now. They were roughly twenty-seven hours, of which about thirteen hours were dark. Not too high a latitude, apparently, and probably late summer by the looks of the vegetation. He got up a little before daylight and looked at the rabbit and old Tom. Both seemed to be doing nicely. Old Tom was hungry for more other-world meat. Ed gave it to him and made up a light pack. After some thought, he took the four fifty bear gun he used for backup when guiding. Whatever he ran into over there, the four fifty, a Model 71 throwing a 400-grain slug at 2,100 feet per second, should handle it. The first step through into the other world was a queasy one, but it turned out to be much the same as any other step. The only difference was that now he was in the other world looking back. From this side the nigger head at the threshold was sliced sharply, but it had been kicked down a little when he came through, and what with shoving the cage through and pulling it back, so that some clods of moss and dirt were scattered in the other world. For some reason that made Ed feel better. It seemed to make the joining of the two worlds a little more permanent. Still it had come sudden, and it might go sudden. Ed went back into his own world and got an axe, a saw, more ammunition, salt, a heavy sleeping road, a few other possibles. He brought them through and piled them into the other world, covering them with a scrap of old tarp. He cut a couple of poles, peeled them, and stuck them in the ground to mark the hole from this side. Then he looked around. He stood on the shoulder of a hill, in a game trail that ran down toward a stream below, in what seemed to be a fairly recent burn. There were charred stumps, and the growth was small stuff, with some saplings pushing up through. There was timber in the valley below, though, and on the hills beyond, deciduous, somewhat like oak. South was where East had been in his own world, and the sun seemed smaller but brighter. The sky was a very dark blue. He seemed lighter in this world, there was a spring in his step he had not known for twenty years. He looked at his compass. It checked with the direction of the sun. He studied the trail. It had seen a lot of use, but less in recent weeks. There were sharp hoof-prints of the animal he had caught, larger hoof-prints, vague pad-marks of various sizes, but nothing that looked human. The trail went under a charred tree-trunk at a height that was not comfortable for a man, and the spacing of the steps around the gnarled root of an old stump did not fit a man's stride. He did not notice the harn creature at all, which was understandable. It was well camouflaged. He worked circumspectly down the trail, staying a little off of it, studying tracks and droppings, noticing evidences of browsing on the shrubs, mostly old, pausing to examine tufts of hair and an occasional feather. Halfway down the slope, 
he flushed a bird about ptarmigan size, grayish brown in color. The trail was more marked where it went into the timber. It wound through the trees for a few hundred yards and came out on a canoe-sized stream. Here it forked. One trail crossed the stream and went up the hill on the other side. The other followed the stream up the valley. The Harn followed Ed's movements, observing carefully. It needed a specimen from the other world, and this biped would serve nicely, but it might as well learn as much as possible about him first. It could always pick him up some time before he returned to his own world. Just to make sure, it sent a stinging unit to guard the entrance. All his life, except for the short period in France, Ed had been a hunter, never hunted. Still, you don't grow old in the woods by jumping without looking. Coming into a new situation, he was wary as an old wolf. There was a little shoulder right above the fork in the trail. He stood there for several minutes, looking things over, and then went down and crossed the stream at the next ripple above the ford. By doing so, although he did not know it, he missed the trap the Harn maintained at the ford for chance passers-by. On the other side of the creek the trail ran angling off downstream, skirted a small lake hidden in the trees, climbed over another low shoulder, and dropped into a second valley. As Ed followed along it he began to notice a few more signs of life. Birds, small scurriers on the ground and in the treetops, and this sent him thinking. The country had a picked-over feel to it, a hunted and trapped-out feel, worse where he had first come through, but still noticeable here. The Harn did not like to cross water. It could, but it did not like to. Ed looked at the sun. It was getting down in the sky. If there was any activity at all around here, the ford at dusk would be as likely a place as any to find it. He worked back along the ridge to a point above where he judged the ford to be. The breeze was drawing up the valley, but favoring the other side a little. He dropped down and crossed the stream a quarter mile above the ford, climbed well above the trail, and worked along the hillside until he was in a position where he could watch both the ford and the fork in the trail. He squatted down against a tree in a comfortable position, laid his gun across his knees, and rummaged in his pack for the cold flapjacks wrapped around slices of duck breast which he had packed for lunch. After he had finished eating he drank from his canteen. The water in this world might be good, it might not. There was no point in taking chances till he could try it on the cat and took an economical chew of snuff. He settled back to wait. The Harn had lost Ed after he crossed the creek. It used a fallen tree quite a way further up for its own crossing, and did not pick him up again just before he crossed back. Now, however, he had been immobile for several minutes. This looked like about as good a time as any to make the pickup. The Harn had a stinging unit just about position, and it had dispatched a carrier to stand by. After a while sitting there, Ed began to feel uneasy. The timber was big here and open underneath almost park-like. The nearest cover was fifty or sixty yards off to his left, a little tangle of brush where a tree had fallen and left a shaft of sunlight through. It looked possible, but it didn't feel quite right. Still, it was about the only place anything big enough to bother him could hide. The feeling was getting stronger. The back hairs on Ed's neck were starting to stand up now. Without visible movement, or even noticing himself that he was doing it, he let awareness run over his body, checking the position and stiffness of his legs. He had been sitting there quite a while, the balance of the gun across his knees, the nearness of his thumb to the hammer. Thoughtfully, still studying the patch of brush, he spat a thin stream over his left shoulder at a pile of leaves a few feet away. Thinking about it later, it could almost have sworn the tobacco juice sizzled as it hit. Actually, this was probably imaginary. The stinging unit was not that sensitive to tobacco, though it was sensitive enough. As the drops splattered it, the pile of leaves erupted with a snuffling hiss like an overloaded tea kettle into a tornado of bucking, twisting activity. Ed's reflexes were not quite as fast as they had been when he was young, but they were better educated. Also, 
he was already keyed up. Almost as it started, the flurry in the leaves stopped with the roar of his rifle. Fired like that, the heavy gun just about took his hand off, but he did not notice it at the moment. He came erect in a quick scramble, jacking in a fresh round as he did so. The scene took on that strange timeless aspect it often does in moments of emergency, with a man's whole being focused on the fleeting now. You know, in an academic sort of way, that things are moving fast, you are moving fast, but there seems plenty of time to make decisions, to look things over and decide what is to be done, to move precisely with minimum effort and maximum effect. Whatever the thing at his feet was, it was out of the picture now. It had not even twitched after the heavy bullet tore through it. There was a stomping rush in the little thicket he had been watching. Ed took two long quick steps to one side to clear a couple of trees, threw up the gun and fired as something flashed across a thin spot in the brush. He heard the whack of a bullet in the flesh and fired again. Ordinarily he did not like to shoot at things he could not see clearly, but this did not seem the time to be overly finicky. There was no further movement in the brush. He stood there several long moments, listening, and there was no further movement anywhere. He eased the hammer down, fed in three rounds to replace those he had used, and walked slowly back to the first thing he had shot. At that range the bullet had not opened up, but it had not needed to. It had practically exploded the creature anyway. The four fifty has two tons of striking energy at the muzzle. From what was left, Ed deduced a smallish, rabbit-sized thing, smooth-skinned, muscular, many-legged, flattish, mottled a camouflage perfectly in the leaves. There was a head at one end, mostly undamaged, since it had been at the end of a long muscular neck, with a pair of glazing beady eyes and a surprisingly small mouth. When Ed pressed on the muscles at the base of the skull, the mouth gaped roundly and a two-inch-long spine slid smoothly out of an inconspicuous slot just below it. At middling distances or better, Ed could still see as well as ever, but close up he needed help. He got out his pocket magnifier and studied the spine. It looked hollow, grooved back for a distance from the point. A drop of milky-looking substance trembled on its tip. Ed nodded thoughtfully to himself. This was what had made him uneasy, he was pretty sure. What was the thing in the brush, then? Innocent bystander? He got stiffly to his feet, conscious now of the ache in his wrist that had taken most of the recoil of the first shot, the torn web between his right thumb and forefinger where the hammer spur had bitten in, and walked over to the thicket. The thing in the brush was larger, quite a bit larger, and the bullets had not torn it up so badly. It lay sprawled with three of its eight legs doubled under it, a bear-sized animal with a gaping, cavernous, toothless mouth out of all proportion to the slender body which seemed designed mainly as a frame for its muscular legs. It was not quite dead. As Ed came up it struggled feebly to get up, but one of the heavy slugs had evidently hit the spine, or whatever carried communications to the hindquarters. It fell back, shuddering convulsively, and suddenly regurgitated a small furry animal. Ed stepped back quickly to bring his rifle to bear, but the newest arrival was obviously already dead. He turned his attention back to the larger animal. It, too, was dead now. There was an obvious family resemblance to the smaller one he had shot in the leaves. Both were smooth-skinned, many-legged, and now that he looked closely he could see this one had two mouths, a small one just under the nostrils, pursed-lipped and tiny in its huge face, but quite like that of the other creature. Neither looked even remotely like anything he had ever seen before. He laid down his rifle and took out his knife. Ten minutes later he knew quite a bit about the thing, but what he knew did not make much sense. In the first place its blood was green, a yellowish pussy green. In the second place the larger mouth, complete with jaws and impressive musculature, opened not into a digestive system but into a large closed pouch which comprised most of the animal's torso. There was no proper digestive system at all, only a rudimentary gut heavily laced with blood vessels, terminating at one end in the small second mouth, at the other in an even smaller anus. Otherwise the thing had no insides except a good pair of lungs and a stout heart. None at all. 
bone muscle lung heart plus the ridiculously inadequate gut that was it what about the small furry animal then the one the other had been carrying in its pouch there was nothing much out of the way about it a feline sort of carnivore something like a marten the fur looked interesting and he skinned it out casing the hide on the left hand the skin was punctured and there was a swollen bluish area about the sort of wound that would be made by the fang of the first thing he had shot ed squatted back on his heels studying it and putting two and two together what two and two made was pretty hard to believe but it fitted the evidence he wiped his knife carefully on the grass put it back in its sheath and got to his feet suddenly the feeling that he was not alone recurred he looked quickly around back where he had shot the first thing a man in forest green whipcord trousers and jacket was leaning over hands on knees looking at the remains the man looked up and met ed's eyes he nodded casually and walked over to the second thing prodded it with his toe after a long moment he nodded again to ed smiled briefly and winked out ed stared at the empty air where the other man had been mouth open it was just a little too much a lot of things had happened to him in the last few days he had been able to take most of them more or less as they came along but after all he wasn't a chicken any more he was pushing sixty and there is a limit to what a man should have to put up with at that age the thought of his snug cabin with a good fire going moose meat bubbling in the pot the gas lantern hissing and the bottle of hudson's bay rum he had tucked under the eaves against just such an occasion as this was suddenly very appealing besides that it was getting late and he didn't think he dared to be stumbling around this world in the dark he elbowed his pack up hooked the left shoulder strap and headed for home staying off the trail in ordinary caution and watching his footing but moving pretty fast just the same actually he need not have been so careful the harn had been surprised and shocked by the explosive violence of the man's reaction to a routine harvesting maneuver it was a relatively young harn but it retained memories of its own world where there were also nasty violent things which killed harn it was not pleasant to think that it might have evoked some such monster in this hitherto peaceful place then to top that there had been the sudden appearance of the warden the harn of course saw the warden not as a man but in its true aspect which was not at all friendly all in all this did not seem the moment to start any new adventures the harn pulled in all its mobile units including the stinger it had left at the hole into the other world it huddled protectively together in its nest considering new developments by ten that evening ed in conference with old tom and the bottle of hudson's bay had done considerable hard thinking pro and con of course he didn't have to go into the other world just because the hole was there he could block it off seal it up with timbers and forget it he sat there and thought about this absently smoothing the strange fur on his knee for an old-timer like himself things weren't too hot in this world fur didn't bring much of a price any more and he couldn't get it in as he had when he was younger his wants were simple but there was a certain rock-bottom minimum he had to have two the winters were starting to bother him a little the arthritis in his hands was getting worse every year times he hardly had the strength in his left hand which was the worst to hold an axe another five ten years and it would be the pioneer's home for him if he did not get stove up or sick sooner and die right here in the cabin too helpless to cut wood for the fire he had helped bury enough others bed and all when they didn't come down the river at break-up and somebody had to go up and look for them to know it was possible the other world was milder it had game and fur good fur too from the looks of it something new that could lick any mutation or synthetic on the market and the income tax had still left a few fellows who could pay through the nose to see their women look nice and the country was new he'd never thought he'd have a crack at a new country again a new good country often he thought how lucky people had been who were born a hundred and fifty years ago moving into an easy rich country like the ohio or kentucky when it was new instead of the bitter north 
the harn would be a nuisance. Ed did not think of it as the harn, of course, but just as they. But he supposed he could find a way to clean them out. A man generally could if varmints got troublesome enough. And the man at Forest Green Whipcord, well, he could have been just an hallucination. Ed did not really believe in hallucinations, but he had heard about them, and there was always a first sign. Ed sighed, looked at the clock, measured the bottle with his eye, still better than three-quarters full. All in all, he guessed, he'd leave the door into the other world open. He put old Tom out and went to bed. The first order of business seemed to be to get better acquainted with the Harn, and first thing in the morning he set about it. He took the rabbit out of the live box and tethered it in a spot in the other world close to the hole, where raw earth had been exposed by a big blowdown sweeping the ground afterward to clear it of tracks. Getting better acquainted with the Harn, though, did not mean he had to have it come in and crawl in bed with him. Before going to bed the night before, he had set half a can of snuff to steep in some water. He loaded a big gun with this and sprayed the ground around the hole in the other world. From the reaction yesterday, he judged the stinging unit did not like tobacco juice, and this should discourage them from coming through. He checked his bear snares and found three in good enough shape to satisfy him. The large harn beast he successed would be about like a grizzly to hold three would hardly be enough for a serious trapping program. Ed made his own snares from old aircraft control cable, using a lock of his own devising, which slid smoothly and cinched down tight and permanently. He got out his roll of wire and box of locks, and started making up some more, sitting where he could watch the rabbit he had staked out. By the middle of the afternoon the snares were done, but there had been no action with the rabbit, nor was there for the rest of the day. In the morning, though, it was gone. There were three new sets of tracks in the bare spot, two smaller ones, either of which would have fitted the stinging unit and what looked like a carrier's. The action was clear enough. The small things had prowled around the rabbit for some time, stopping frequently as if uncertain and suspicious. Finally one had moved in with a little flurry of action when it met the rabbit. Then it moved back and squatted again. The big tracks came directly to the rabbit and went right out again. They were heavy enough to be clear in the grass beyond the bare spot. Ed went back to the cabin and rummaged till he found a pair of snake-proof pants a stateside sport had once given him, heavy duck with an inner lining of woven wire. They were heavy and uncomfortable to wear, and about as useless as wings on a pig in Alaska, where there are no snakes but they had been brand new and expensive when given to him, and he had put them away thinking vaguely he might find a use for them some day. It looked like that day might be now. He slipped them on, took his rifle and hunting pack, and set out to follow the animal that had taken the rabbit. The trail showed well in the morning dew, going straight away along the hillside as if the thing were headed for some place definite. Ed followed along for a quarter mile or so, then found himself on a fairly well-beaten path, which presently joined another and then another till it was a definitely well-used trail. It began to look to him like the thing might have a den of some sort, and he might be getting pretty close to it. He left the trail and climbed up into a lone tall tree, fire-scorched but still struggling for life. From there he could follow the trail pretty well with his glasses for a couple of hundred yards before he lost it. Finally he settled on a spot under an old burnt stump as a likely spot for the den. He focused the glasses carefully, and after a few minutes saw a flash of movement there, as if something had slipped in or out. Nothing else happened for about an hour. Then the grass along one of the trails began to wave, and a large beast, similar to the one he had shot, trotted into sight. It slipped in under the stump and disappeared. For the rest of the morning, nothing went in or out. There was a very good reason for this, and Ed was it. All night and day after he shot the stinging unit and the carrier unit, the harn had stayed in its nest. By the second evening it was getting hungry. It ventured out and found a few morsels, but the organized hunting network it ordinarily maintained had been disrupted, it had lost track of things, and the pickings were poor. 
Then it stumbled on the rabbit Ed had staked out. Its first impulse was to leave the rabbit strictly alone. In spite of its early promise, the other world had so far given nothing but trouble. On the other hand, the rabbit was meat, and very good meat by the smell and looks of it. The Harn kept its observation unit prowling irresolutely around the target for half the night before it finally gave in to appetite and sent in a stinger to finish the rabbit off, a carrier to pick it up. It was still uneasy about this when it noticed Ed near the nest the next morning, confirming its fears. It promptly broke up the net it had been re-establishing and pulled all units back in. Maybe if it left him strictly alone he might still go on about his business, whatever that was, and let the Harn get back to its harvesting. By noon Ed was getting pretty stiff sitting in the tree. He climbed down and eased over toward the stump, watching where he set his feet. He was pretty sure the snake-proof pants would stop the stingers, but he saw no point in putting them to the test until he had to. About fifty yards away he got a good view, and it did look like there might be a sizable hole under the stump. He studied it carefully with the glasses. There was a smooth beaten mound in front, and exposed roots were worn slick. As he got closer he noticed an unpleasant smell, and near the mouth of the den he got a sudden whiff that almost gagged him a sour acid carrion stink like a buzzard's nest. He moved back a little. The hole was wide and fairly high, two or three feet, but too dark to see back into. Still he had a sense of something stirring there, not too far back. Ed had considerable respect for caves and dens with unseen occupants. He had once helped carry in the bodies of two men who had poked a stick into a spring grizzly's den. At the same time he wanted pretty badly to know what was in there. He suspected there was a good deal more than what he had already seen. The bug gun, loaded with tobacco juice, was in his pack, and a flashlight, a small light one designed for a lady's purse, which he always carried when away from camp. He got them out and leaned his rifle against a root sticking out just to the left of the den. Taking the bug gun in his left hand and the flashlight in his right, he stooped over to shine the light in, keeping as well clear of the entrance as possible. All in all, he must have got about a five-second look, which is a lot longer than it sounds when things are happening. His first impression was a jumble, eyes, scurrying movement, and bulk. Then things started to shape up. About ten feet back from the entrance was a huge, flattish, naked, scabrous bulk pimpled with finger-sized teeth. Clustered around and behind this were a tangle of slinging units, carrier units, observation units. Some had their mouths fixed to teeth. For a long second or two the scene stayed frozen. Then the front edge of the bulk split and began to gape. Ed found himself looking down a manhole-sized gullet into a shallow pool of slime with bits of bone sticking up here and there. Toward the near end a soggy mass of fur that might have been the rabbit seemed to be visibly melting down. At the same moment the tangle of lesser monsters sorted themselves out, and a wave of stingers came boiling out at him. Ed dropped the flashlight, gave two mighty pumps of the bug gun, and jumped clear of the entrance. For a moment the den mouth boiled with stingers, hissing and bucking in agony. Ed sprayed them heavily again, snatched up his rifle, and ran, looking back over his shoulder. The stinger showed no inclination to follow, though the tobacco juice seemed to be keeping them well occupied for the moment. Halfway home Ed had to stop and rest for a moment while he took a spell of shuddering and gagging as a sudden picture of the slimy gullet came into his mind with Ed Brown laying where the rabbit had been, melting down into a stinky soup of bones and gobbets of flesh. When he got to the hole his arrangement of tin cans, traps, and tobacco juice no longer looked nearly as secure as it had. He got his axe and cut two stout posts, framing the hole, built a stout slab door, and hung it from them. Then he drove stakes close together at the threshold to foil any attempts to dig under, and trimmed a sill tight to the door. His feeling in this matter, as it happened, was sound. The Harn were beginning to develop a pretty strong dislike for Ed Brown. Three of its stinging units were dead, and most of the rest were in poor shape thanks to the tobacco spray. It had got a little whiff of the stuff itself, 
not enough to do any serious damage ordinarily, but right now, so close to swarming time. Ed was going to have to go. So far in this world the Harn had needed only the three basic types of mobile units. There were other standard types, however, for dealing with more complicated situations. As it happened, a couple of carrier embryos were at just about the right stage. With a little forcing they could be brought on in not too long a time. Meanwhile the Harn would do what it could with the material available. When Ed came through the next day to set his snares, the Harn was prepared to test his snake-proof pants. They held, which was disconcerting to the Harn, but it was a hard creature to convince once thoroughly aroused. Ed was not too sure of how well the pants would stand up to persist in assault himself. After the third ambush he took to spraying suspicious-looking spots with tobacco juice. He shot two more stingers in this way, but it slowed him up quite a bit. It took him all day to make four sets. In the next three days he made a dozen sets and caught two carriers. Then the fourth day, as he adjusted a snare, a seeming root suddenly came to life and slashed at his hand. He was wearing gloves to keep the scent from the snares, and the fang caught the glove and just grazed the ball of his left thumb. The hatchet he had been using to cut a toggle was lying by his knee. He snatched it up and chopped the stinger before it could strike again, then yanked off the glove and looked at his hand. A thin scratch beaded with drops of blood showed on the flesh. Unhesitatingly he drew the razor edge of the hatchet across it, sucked and spat, sucked and spat again and again. Then he started for home. He barely made it. By the time he got to the hole he was a very sick man. He latched the door, stumbled into the cabin, and fell on the bed. It was several days before he was able to be about again, his hands still partly paralyzed. During that time the situation changed. The Harn took the offensive. Ed's first notice of this was a rhythmic crashing outside the cabin. He managed to crawl to where he could see the gate he had built to block a hole into the other world. It was shaking from repeated batterings from the other side. Dragging his rifle with his good hand, he scrambled down to where he could see through the chinks in the slab door. Two of the carrier units were there, taking turns slamming their full weight against it. He had built that gate skookum, but not to take something like that. He noted carefully when they were hitting it, then backed off twenty feet and laid the four fifty across a log. He let them hit the door twice more to get the timing before he loosed off a shot at the moment of impact. The battering stopped abruptly, and through the chinks he could see a bulk piled against the gate. For a while there was no more action. Then, after a few tentative butts at the door, the battering started again. This time Ed wasn't so lucky. The battering stopped when he fired, but he got an impression that the carrier ran off. He thought he might have hit it, but not mortally. In an hour or so the Harn was back, and it kept coming back. Ed began to worry about his ammunition, which was not unlimited. Ordinarily two or three boxes lasted him through the winter. He got his thirty o six, for which he had a sugar sack full of military ammunition. The light full patch stuff did not have the discouraging effect of the four fifty, though, and he had to shoot a lot oftener. Another thing, he wasn't getting any rest which was bad in his already weakened condition. Every time he dozed off the battering would start again, and he would have to wake up and snap a few shots through the door. He held pretty much on one spot, not wanting to shoot the door to pieces, but the Harn noticed this and started hitting the door in other places. The second day of the attack the door came down. It had been pretty shaky for some time, and Ed had got the cabin ready for a siege, filling butter kegs with water and nailing up the windows. As the Harn poured through he shot several and then broke for the cabin. A carrier ran at him full tilt, bent on bowling him over. Once off his feet he would have been easy meat for one of the stingers. He sidestepped, swung his shotgun up in one hand, he had kept it handy for the close fighting, and blew the carrier's spine in half. He had to kick it aside to slam the cabin door. For a few minutes, then, things were pretty hectic. Ed went from one to another of the loopholes he had cut, 
blasting first with a shotgun as the Harn crowded around, then using the thirty as they grew more cautious. After the first rush it was obvious to the Harn that the cabin was going to be a tough nut to crack. On the other hand, there was no rush about it either. Necessarily it had let its hunting go the past several days while it concentrated on Ed. It was pretty hungry, and it was in rich pickings now. Ed had always kept from disturbing game close to the cabin, partly because he liked to see it around, and partly because he had an idea that some day he might be in a fix where he couldn't travel very well and would want meat close to hand. The Harn felt no such compunctions. The stinging units spread through the woods, and shortly a steady procession of loaded carriers began to stream back through the hole. Ed picked off the first few, but then the Harn found it could route them up the river trail in such a way that he got only a glimpse as they flashed through the hole. After that he did not hit very many. Ed stopped shooting. He was getting short on ammunition for the thirty now, too. He counted up. There were eighteen rounds for the four fifty, half a box of two twenty grain soft point for the thirty, plus about the same amount of military stuff, and a handful of shotgun shells. Of course, there was still the thirty Luger with a couple of boxes, and the twenty two, but they were not much account for this kind of work. He looked at the cabin door. It was stout, built of hewed three inch slabs, but it would last forever against the kind of beating the gate had got. Even if it did, he was going to run out of water eventually. Ed thought about that for a while, sitting at the table staring at the little pile of cartridges. He was going to be run out of here sooner or later. He might as well pick his own time, and now seemed about as good as any, while the Harn was busy exploring and hunting. He sighed and got up to rummage around the cabin. The snake-proof pants had done real good, but he did not trust them entirely. There was some sheet-iron laid over the ceiling joist which he had brought up to make new stoves for his lying camps. He got this down and cut it into small pieces. Around the edges he drilled a number of small holes. Then he got out his mending gear and began sewing the plates in an overlapping pattern to the legs of the snake-proof pants and to an old pair of moccasins. When he finished he was pretty well armored as far as his crotch. It was an awkward outfit to move around in but as long as he was able to stay on his feet he figured he would be reasonably secure from the stingers. As for the bigger ones, he would just have to depend on seeing them first, and the four-fifty. Next he needed some gasoline. The fuel cache was under a big spruce about twenty yards from the door. He made the round of his loopholes. There were no harn in sight. They were apparently ignoring him for now. He slipped out the door, closing it securely behind him, and started for the catch. As he stepped out, a stinger came from under the sill log and lashed at his foot. He killed it with the axe beside the door, saving a cartridge, and went on, walking fairly fast, but planting his feet carefully, a little awkward in his armor. He picked up a five-gallon can of gas, a quart of motor oil, and the twenty feet of garden hose he used for siphoning gas down the bank to the boat. On the way back another stinger hit him. He kicked it aside, not wanting to set down his load, and it came at him again and again. Just outside the door he finally caught it under a heel and methodically trampled it to death. Then he snatched open the door, tossed the stuff inside, and pulled it quickly shut behind him. So far good enough. He lashed the gas can solidly to his packboard, slipped the end of the hose into the flexible spout, and wired it tight. Then he cut up an old wool undershirt and wrapped the pieces around miscellaneous junk, old nuts and bolts, chunks of lead line, anything to make up half a dozen packages of good throwing hemp. He soaked these in oil and stowed them in a musette bag which he snapped to the D-rings of the pack. One of the metal plates on his moccasin was hanging by a thread. Probably he had torn it loose in the scuffle at the door. They weren't going to take too much kicking and banging around, he could see and once he was on his way it wouldn't be a very good idea to be caught bending over with his bare hands at ground level to fix them. On the other hand, he couldn't be using all his cartridges on the stingers either. He had to save them for the carriers. He thought about this some while while mending the moccasin and decided to take the bug gun. It might not kill the stingers, 
but it ought to discourage them enough so they wouldn't keep pestering him. With his bad left arm he had trouble getting the pack on his back. He finally managed by swinging it up on the table first. It was not too much of a load, forty or fifty pounds, he guessed. Still, shaky as he was, it was about as much as he could manage. He had intended to just try it on for size, but after he got up he thought, well, why not now? He picked up the four fifty, stowed the extra cartridges in his pocket, checked to make sure he had matches, hung the bug gun on his belt, and opened the door. It was just getting dusk, but the other world was in broad daylight. The days and nights were almost completely reversed again. As he stepped through the hole, the first stinger struck. He gave it a good squirt of tobacco juice. It went bucking and twisting off, and he went on, stepping carefully and solidly. Luckily, most of the horn were foraging in the new world. Two more stingers ambushed him, but the tobacco juice got rid of them, and he had no serious trouble till he got close to the den. Two carriers came out and rushed him there. He shot them both and then killed the stinger that was pecking at his shins. He moved quickly now. He had an idea that in about a minute all hell would break loose. He swung the pack down on the uphill side of the den wet the musette bag with a quick spray of gas, tossed it over his shoulder, jammed the free end of the hose into the den mouth, and stabbed the can with his knife to bend it. As the gas poured into the den, he lit one of his oil and gas-soaked bombs and ran around in front, lighting one after another from the one in his hand and tossing them into the den. The musette bag caught fire, and he snatched it from his shoulder and tossed it after the bombs. A woof and a sheet of flame blew out. About fifty yards away there was a slender, popple-like tree. Ed had thought if he could make that he would be reasonably secure while the harn burned. He ran for it as hard as he could, beating at the flames that had spattered on him from the burning gas, but he never made it. Harn were erupting everywhere. A carrier suddenly came charging out of the brush to his left. While Ed dealt with that one the harn played its ace in the hole. The two special units it had been developing to deal with Ed were not quite done yet, but they were done enough to work for the few minutes the Harn needed them. Ed heard a coughing grunt behind him and spun around to see something new crawling out of the flame and smoke at the den entrance. This one was a roughly carrier-shaped creature, but half again as large, built for killing. It had powerful fanged jaws, and its eight feet were armed with knife-like, disemboweling claws. As it came at Ed in a lumbering rush, another came crawling out after it. Ed shot four times as fast as he could work the action. The heavy slugs did the job, but not quite well enough. With its dying lunge the thing got to him and tossed him ten feet like a rag doll. He lit on his bad hand and felt the wrist bones go. As he struggled to get up, digging his elbow in and using one hand, he saw a stinger darting in at him. He had lost both the bug gun and his rifle when the fighting unit swiped him. He swiveled on his hips and kicked the stinger away. Then he saw the second fighting unit coming. He forgot about the stinger. It still might get to him, but if it did, it would be too late to matter. He drew his knife, managed to get to one knee, and crouched there like an old gray rat, stubbly lips drawn back from worn teeth in a grin of pain and rage. This was one he wasn't going to win, he guessed. Ten feet away the fighting unit suddenly ran down like a clockwork toy. It toppled over, skidded past him under its own momentum, and lay there kicking spasmodically. Ed glared at it uncomprehendingly. It arched its neck back to almost touch its haunches, stiffened, and was still. Ed looked around. The stinger was dead too, three feet from his shoulder, and half a dozen more which had been making for him. A cloud of greasy, stinking smoke was rolling out of the den. The Harn was dead. Ed put his knife away and lay back. He did not quite pass out, but things got pretty dim. After a while he got hold of himself and sat up. He was not too surprised to see the man in forest green prodding at the bodies of the fighting units. The stranger looked at the smoke still oozing from the den and nodded approvingly. Then he came over and looked at Ed. He clacked his tongue in concern and bent over, touching Ed's wrist. 
Ed noticed there was now a cast on it, and it didn't hurt so much. There was also a plastic binding around his ribs and shoulder, where the claws of the first fighter had raked as it tossed him. That was a mighty neat trick, because the rags of his shirt were still buttoned around him, and he was pretty sure it had not been off at any time. The stranger smiled at Ed, patted him on the shoulder, and disappeared. He seemed to be a busy sort of fellow, Ed thought, with not much time for visiting. Ed felt quite a bit better now, enough better to gather up what was left of his gear and start home. He was glad to find old Tom waiting for him there. The cat had taken to the woods when the attack on the gate first started. He didn't like shooting, and Ed had worried that the harn might have got him. Ed slept till noon the next day, got up, and cooked a dozen flapjacks and a pound of bacon. After breakfast he sat around for an hour or so drinking coffee. Then he spent the rest of the afternoon puttering around the cabin. He packed away the snake-proof pants, disassembled the flamethrower, picked up the traps by the hole. Old Tom seemed to have pretty well cleaned up the mice under the lean-to. Ed took a shovel and filled in the hole he had dug for the cat to get at them. He went to bed early. Tomorrow he would take a long hike around the new world, scout out the fur and game, plan his trap line, and pick cabin sites. The next morning, though, the hole into the other world was gone. The posts which had marked it were sheared neatly in half. The remains of the door still hung there, battered and sagging, but it swung open on nothing but Alaska. When Ed stepped through he found himself standing beside the old leaning birch. He tried it several times before he convinced himself. He walked slowly back toward the cabin, feeling old and uncertain, not quite knowing what to do with himself. Old Tom was over by the lean-to, sniffing and pawing tentatively at the fresh earth where Ed had filled in the hole. As Ed came up, he came over to rub against Ed's leg. They went into the cabin, and Ed started fixing breakfast. This is the end of Cat and Mouse by Ralph Williams. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks, dot com. Do Unto Others by Mark Clifton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames Do Unto Others by Mark Clifton Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and the natives of Capella Four, philosophers at heart, were not ones to ignore the golden rule. My Aunt Mattie, Mathewa H. Toombs, is president of the Daughters of Terror. I am her nephew, the one who didn't turn out well. Christened Hapland Graves after Earth President Hapland, a cousin by marriage, the fellows at school naturally called me Happy Graves. Haphazard Graves it should be, Aunt Mattie commented acidly the first time she heard it. It was her not very subtle way of reminding me of the way I lived my life and did things, or didn't do them. She shuddered at anything disorderly, which of course included me, and it was her beholden duty to write anything which to her appeared wrong. There won't be any evil to march on after you get through, Aunt Mattie, I once said when I was a child. I like now to think that even at the age of six I must have mastered the straight face but I'm afraid I was so awed by her that I was sincere. That will do, Hapland, she said sternly, but I think she knew I meant it then, and I think that was the day I became her favourite nephew. For some reason, never quite clear to me, she was my favourite aunt. I think she liked me most because I was the cross she had to bear. I liked her most, I'm sure, because it was such a comfortable ride. A few billions spent around the house can make things quite comfortable. She had need of her billions to carry out her hobbies, or, as she called it, her life's work. Aunt Mattie always spoke in clichés, because people could understand what you meant. One of these hobbies was her collection of flora of the universe. It was begun by her maternal grandfather, 
one of the wealthier plots, and increased as the family fortunes were increased by her father, one of the more ruthless tombs. But it was under Aunt Mattie's supervision that it came, so to speak, into full flower. Love, she would say, means more to a flower than all the scientific knowledge in the world. Apparently she felt that the small army of gardeners, each a graduate specialist in duplicating the right planetary conditions, hardly mattered. The collection covered some two hundred acres in our grounds at the west side of the house, small perhaps as some of the more vulgar displays by others go, but very, very choice. The other hobby which she combines with the first is equally expensive. She and her club members, the Daughters of Terror, DTs for short, often find it necessary to take junkets on the family space yacht out to some distant planet, to straighten out reprehensible conditions which have come to her attention. I usually went along to take care of, symbolically at least, the bags and their baggage. My psychiatrist would say that expressing it in this way shows I have never outgrown my juvenile attitudes. He says I am simply a case of arrested development, mental, caused through too much overshadowing by the rest of the family. He says that, like the rest of them, I have inherited the family compulsion to make the universe over to my own liking, so I can pass it on to posterity with a clear conscience and my negative attitude towards this is simply a defensive mechanism, because I haven't had the chance to do it. He says, I really hate my aunt's flora collection, because I see it as a rival for her affection. I tell him, if I have any resentments towards it at all, it is for the long hours spent in getting the Latinized names of things drilled into me. I ask him why gardeners always insist on forcing long, meaningless names upon non-gardeners who simply don't care. He ignores that, and says that subconsciously I hate my Aunt Mattie, because I secretly recognize that she is a challenge too great for me to overcome. I ask him why, if I subconsciously hate Aunt Mattie, why I would care about how much affection she gives to her flora collection. He says, aha, we are making progress. He says he can't cure me, of what, I'm never clear, until I find the means to cut down and destroy my Aunt Mattie. This is all patent nonsense, because Aunt Mattie is the rock, the firm foundation in a universe of shifting values. Even her clichés are precious to me, because they are unchanging. On her, I can depend. He tells Aunt Mattie his diagnoses and conclusions, too. Unethical? Well, now, between a mere psychiatrist and my Aunt Mattie, is there any doubt about who shall say what is ethical? After one of their long conferences about me, she calls me into her study, looks at me wordlessly, sadly shakes her head, sighs, then squares her shoulders until the shelf of her broad, although maiden, bosom becomes huge enough to carry any burden, even the burden of my alleged hate. This she bears bravely, even gratefully. I might resent this needless pain a psychiatrist gives her, except that it really seems to make her happier in some obscure way. Perhaps she has some kind of guilt complex, and I am her deserved punishment. Aunt Mattie with a guilt complex? Never. Aunt Mattie knows she is right, and goes ahead. So all his nonsense is completely ridiculous. I love my Aunt Mattie. I adore my Aunt Mattie. I would never do anything to hurt my Aunt Mattie. Or, well, I didn't mean to hurt her anyway. All I did was wink. I only meant... We were met at the spaceport of Capella IV by the planet administrator himself, one John J. McCabe. It was no particular coincidence that I knew him. My school was progressive. It admitted not only the scions of the established families, but those of the ambitious families as well. Its graduates naturally went into the significant careers. Johnny McCabe was one of the ambitious ones. We hadn't been anything like bosom pals at school, but he'd been tolerant of me, and I'd admired him, and fitfully told myself I should be more like him. 
Perhaps this was the reason Aunt Mattie had insisted on this particular school, the hope that some of the ambition would rub off on me. Capella Four wasn't much of a post, not even for the early stages in a young man's career, although, socially, it was perhaps the best beginning Johnny's family could have expected. It was a small planet entirely covered by salt. Even inside the port bubble with its duplication of Earth atmosphere, the salt lay like a permanent snow scene. Actually, it was little more than a way station along the space route out in that direction, and Johnny's problems were little more than the problems of a professional host at some obscure resort. But no doubt his dad spoke pridefully of my son, a planet administrator. And when I called on the family to tell them I'd visited their son, I wouldn't be one to snitch. There was doubt in my mind that even Johnny's ambition could make the planet into anything more than it was already. It had nothing we wanted, or at least was worth the space freight it would cost to ship it. The natives had never given us any trouble, and up until now we hadn't given them any so Earth's brand upon it was simply a small bubble enclosing a landing field, a hangar for check-up and repair of ships requiring an emergency landing, some barracks for the men and women of the port personnel, a small hotel to house stranded space passengers while repairs were made to their ship, or stray VIPs. A small administration building flying Federated Earth flag and a warehouse to contain supplies which had to be shipped in, completed the installation. The planet furnished man nothing but water pumped from deep in the rock strata beneath the salt, and even that had to be treated to remove enough of the saline content to make it usable. At the time, I didn't know what the natives, outside our bubble, lived on. The decision to come had been a sudden one and I hadn't had more than enough time to call the State Department to find out who the planet administrator might be. I was first out of the yacht and down the landing steps to the salt-covered ground. Aunt Mattie was still busy giving her ship captain his instructions, and possibly inspecting the crew's teeth to see if they'd brush them this morning. The two members of her special committee of the DTs who'd come along, a Miss Point and a Mrs. Waddle, naturally would be standing at her sides, and half a pace to the rear, to be of assistance should she need them in dealing with males. There was a certain stiff formality in the way McCabe, flanked by his own two selected subordinates, approached the ship, until I turned around at the foot of the steps and he recognized me. Hap! he yelled, then, Happy Graves, you old son of a gun! He broke into a run, dignity forgotten, and when he got to me he grabbed both my shoulders in his powerful hands to shake me, as if he were some sort of terrier and I a rat. His joy seemed all out of proportion, until I remembered he probably hadn't seen anybody from school for a long time, and until I further remembered that he would have been alerted by the State Department to Aunt Mattie's visit, and would have been looking forward to it with dread and misgivings. To realize he had a friend at court must really have overjoyed him. Johnny, I said. Long time. It had been. Five, six years anyway. I held out my hand in the old school gesture. He let loose my shoulders and grabbed it in the traditional manner. We went through the ritual, which my psychiatrist would have called juvenile, and then he looked at me pointedly. You remember what it means, he said, a little anxiously, I thought, and looked significantly at my hand. That we will always stand by each other, through thick and thin. His eyes were pulled upward to the open door of the yacht. You can expect it to be both thick and thin, I said dryly, if you know my Aunt Mattie. She's your aunt? he asked, his eyes widening. Mathewa H. Toombs is your aunt. I never knew. To think all those years at school and I never knew. Why, Hap! Happy! Oh, boy, this is wonderful! Man, have I been worried! Don't stop on my account, I said, maybe a little dolefully. Somebody reported to the Daughters of Terror that you let the natives run around out here stark naked and if Aunt Mattie says she's going to put Mother Hubbard's on them, 
then that's exactly what she's going to do. You can depend on that, old man. Mother Hub... He gasped and looked at me strangely. It's a joke, he said. Somebody's pulled a practical joke on the DTs. Have you ever seen our natives? Pictures of them? Didn't anybody check up on what they're like before you came out here? It's a joke. A practical joke on the DTs, it has to be. I wouldn't know, I said. But if they're naked, they won't be for long. I can tell you that. Aunt Matty... His eyes left my face and darted up to the door of the ship, which was no longer a black oval. The unexplained bewilderment of his expression was not diminished as Aunt Mattie came through the door, out on the landing platform, and started down the steps. He grew a little white around the mouth, licked his lips, and forgot all his joy at meeting an old schoolmate. His two subordinates, who had remained standing just out of earshot, as if recognizing a crisis now, stepped briskly up to his sides. Aunt Mattie's two committee women, as if to match phalanx with phalanx, came through the door and started down the steps behind her. I stepped to one side as the two forces met face to face on the crunching salt that covered the ground. It might look like a Christmas scene, but under Capella's rays it was blazing hot, and I found myself in sympathy with the men's open neck shirts and brief shorts. Still, they should have known better than to dress like that. Somebody in the State Department had goofed. Aunt Mattie and her two committee women were dressed conservatively in something that might have resembled an English colonel's wife's idea of the correct weeds to wear on a cold, foggy night. If they were already sweltering beneath these coverings, as I was beginning to in my lighter suit, they were too ladylike to show it. Their acid glance at the men's attire showed what they thought of the informality of dress in which they'd been received, but they were too ladylike to comment. After that first pointed look at bare knees, they had no need of it. This is the official attire prescribed for us by the State Department, Johnny said, a little anxiously, I thought. It was hardly the formal speech of welcome he, as a planet administrator, must have prepared. I have no doubt of it, Aunt Mattie said, and her tone told them what she thought of the State Department under the present administration. You would hardly have met ladies in such, ah, uh, otherwise. I could see that she was making a mental note to speak to the State Department about it. Make a note, she said, and turned to Miss Point. I will speak to the State Department. How can one expect natives to, if our representatives don't, etc., etc.? May I show you to your quarters, ma'am? Johnny asked humbly. No doubt you will wish to freshen up, or... Miss Point blushed furiously. We are already quite fresh, young man, Aunt Mattie said firmly. I happen to know that Aunt Mattie didn't like to browbeat people, not at all. It would all have been so much more pleasant, gracious, if they'd been brought up to know right from wrong. But what parents and schools had failed to do, she must correct as her duty. I thought it about time I tried to smooth things over. I stepped up into their focus. Aunt Matty, I said, this is Johnny McCabe. We were at school together. Her eyebrows shot upward. You were? she asked, and looked piercingly at Johnny. Then I realize, young man, that your attire is not your fault. You must have been acting under orders and against your personal knowledge of what would be correct. I understand. She turned again to Miss Point. Underscore that note to the State Department, she said. Mark it emergency. She turned back to Johnny. Very well, Mr. McCabe. We would appreciate it, after all, if you would show us to our quarters, so that we may, ah, uh, freshen up a bit. It is rather a warm day, isn't it? She was quite gracious now, reassured because Johnny was an old schoolmate of mine, and would therefore know right from wrong. If I sometimes didn't seem to, she knew me well enough to know it had not been the fault of the school. The three of us, Johnny on one side of Aunt Mattie and I on the other side, 
started toward the frame building on the other side of the bubble, which I assumed was the hotel. The four subordinates trailed along behind, silent, wary of one another. Behind them, the baggage truck, which had been piled high by the ship's crew, hissed into life and started moving along on its tractor treads. Johnny caught a glimpse of it without actually turning around, and his eyes opened wide. He misinterpreted, of course. From the mountain of baggage it looked like our intention to stay a long time. But then he wouldn't have been particularly reassured either, had he realized that our own supplies were quite scant, and these bags, boxes and crates contained sewing machines and many, many bolts of gaily colored cloth. I had hardly more than, ah, uh, freshened up a bit myself in my hotel room when I heard a discreet knock on my door. I opened it and saw Johnny McCabe. May I come in, Hap? he asked. As if against his will, he glanced quickly down the hall toward the suite where Aunt and her committee had been put. Sure, Johnny, I said, and opened the door wide. I pointed to an aluminium tube torture rack, government issues idea of a chair. You can have the chair, I said. I'll sit on the edge of the bed. I'm sorry about the furnishings, he said apologetically as he sat down and I closed the door. It's the best government will issue us in this hole. Aunt Mattie would be disappointed if it were better, I said, as I sat on the edge of the bed, which was little softer than the chair. She expects to rough it and find special virtue in doing her duty as uncomfortably as possible. He looked sharply at me, but I had merely stated an accepted fact, not an opinion, and was therefore emotionless about it. I'm in trouble, Hap he said desperately. He leaned forward with his clasped hands held between his knees. Well, old man, I answered, you know me. Yes, he said, but there isn't anybody else I can turn to. Then we understand each other, I agreed. He looked both resentful and puzzled. No, I never did understand you, he disagreed. I suppose it's all those billions that act as shock insulation for you. You never had to plan and scheme and stand alert indefinitely, like a terrier at a rat-hole, waiting for opportunity to stick out its nose so you could pounce on it. So I don't see how you can appreciate my problem now. I might try, I said humbly. This job, he said. It's not much, and I know it. But it was a start. The department doesn't expect anything from me but patience. It's not so much ability, you know, just a matter of who can hang on the longest without getting into trouble. I've been hanging on, and keeping out of trouble. But you're in trouble now. I will be when your aunt fails to put Mother Hubbards on the natives. She won't fail, I said confidently. And when she storms into the State Department with fire in her eye and starts turning things upside down, it'll be my fault. Somehow, he said miserably. So let her put some clothes on some natives, I said. She'll go away happy then. For all you care, they can take them off and burn them if they insist on going around naked. Just swing with the punch, man. Don't stand up there and let them knock your block off. Surely you have some influence with the natives. I don't hear any war drums, any tom-toms. I don't see them trying to tear holes in the sides of your bubble to let the air out. You must be at peace with them. You must have some kind of mutual cooperation. So just get a tribe or so to go along with the idea for a while. He looked at me and shook his head sadly. Sort of the way Aunt Mattie shook her head after a conference with my psychiatrist. But Johnny didn't seem somehow happier. He had a pretty good chest, but it didn't look enormous enough to carry any burden. I've been pretty proud of myself, he said. After five years of daily attempts, and after using everything I ever learned in school courses on extraterrestrial psychology, plus some things I've made up myself, I established a kind of communication with the natives, if you could call it communication. I'd go out in my spacesuit to their chlorinated atmosphere. I'd stand in front of one of them and talk a blue streak. Think a blue streak. After about five years of it, 
one of them slowly closed his eye and then opened it again. I invited one of them to come inside the bubble. I told him about the difference in atmosphere, that it might be dangerous. I got one of them to come in. It made no difference to him. Well, fine then, I said. Just get some of them to come in again. Let Aunt Mattie put some clothes on them, and everybody's happy. He stood up suddenly. Take a walk with me, Hap, he said. It was more of a command than an invitation. Over to the edge of the bubble. I want to show you some natives. I was willing. On the way around to the back of the building, over the crunching salt, I had a thought. If all he did was close an eye, I said, how did you learn their language so you could invite him inside, explain about the atmosphere? I don't even know they have a language, he said. Maybe he learned mine. I used to draw pictures in the salt the way they taught us at school and say words. Maybe it took him five years to put the thoughts together. Maybe they don't have any concept of language at all or need it. Maybe he was thinking about something else all those five years and just got around to noticing me. I don't know, Hap. We came around the edge of an outbuilding then to an unobstructed view of the bubble edge. Even through dark glasses he'd cautioned me to wear with a gesture, as he put on another pair for himself. The scene through the clear plastic was blinding white. Scattered here and there on the glistening salt were blobs of black. Why, I exclaimed, those are octopi. I suppose that's what the natives use for food. I wondered. Those are the natives, he answered dryly. By now we were up to the plastic barrier of our bubble and stood looking out at the scene. Well, I said after some long moments of staring, it will be a challenge to the DTs, won't it? He looked at me with disgust. What do they eat? I asked. Salt? I don't know if they eat, he said. Can't you get it through your thick skull, man, that these things are alien, completely alien? How do I know? Well, you must know some things after five years of study. You must have observed them. They must get food somehow. They must sleep and wake. They must procreate. You must have observed something. I've observed the process of procreation, he answered cautiously. Well, fine then, I said. That's what's going to concern Aunt Mattie the most. Here's something that may help you understand them, he said, and I felt a bit of the sardonic in his voice, a uh, grimness. When that one visited me inside here, he said, I took him into my office so I could photograph him better with all the equipment. I was explaining everything, not knowing how much he understood. I happened to pick up a cigarette and a lighter. Soon as I flipped the lighter on, he shot up a tentacle and took it out of my hand. I let him keep it, of course. Next day, when I went outside, every one of them, as far as I could see in the distance, had a lighter exactly like the one I'd given him. Furthermore, in a chlorinated atmosphere, without oxygen, those lighters burned normally. Does that help you to understand them better? he asked with no attempt to hide the heavy irony. I didn't have a chance to answer because we both heard a crunching in the salt behind us. We turned about and there was Aunt Mattie and her two committee women behind her, also now in dark glasses. I waited until the ladies had come up to us. Then I waved my arm grandly at the scene beyond the plastic. Behold the natives in all their nakedness, Aunt Mattie, I said. Then, to soften the blow it must have been, I'm afraid somebody was pulling your leg when they reported it to the DTs. Miss Point gasped audibly. Mrs. Waddle said, Shocking! I couldn't tell whether it was the sight of the natives or my remark which indicated I knew they had legs to pull. For the first time in my life I saw uncertainty in Aunt Mattie's eyes as she looked, startled at me, and then at Johnny. Then her chin squared, her back straightened still more, the shelf of her bosom firmed. 
It really won't be too much of a problem, girls, she said. Actually simpler than some we've solved. Take a square of cloth, cut a hole in the center for that head-like pouch to come through where its eye is, put in a drawstring to cinch it up tight above those, uh, those protuberances, and let it flow out over those, uh, legs. Simple and quite attractive, don't you think? The girls nodded happily, and Johnny just stood there gasping for breath. It was simpler than any of us had thought. Johnny looked at me desperately when Aunt Mattie told him to have one of the natives come in so she could fit a pattern on it, to see if any gussets would be needed for fullness, whatever gussets might be. One of them came inside before, I said in answer to Johnny's pleading look. Ask him again. If he refuses, Mohammed will go to the mountain. I'm sure you have extra spacesuits. I'm sure the ladies won't mind going out to the natives if the natives won't come to them. I don't know, Johnny said miserably. He may have had sufficient curiosity to come inside once, but not sufficient to bring him in again. You see, ladies, he turned to them desperately, they don't seem to care about us, one way or the other. The two committee women looked apprehensively at Aunt Mattie. Not care about her, one way or the other, this was beyond comprehension but Aunt Mattie was equal to it. Very well, she said crisply. We shall not ask them to come to us. We shall go to them. It is our duty to carry enlightenment to the ignorant, wherever they may be, so that they can be taught to care. In the performance of our duty, we have no room for pride. We shall go to them, humbly, happily. We did, too. By the time we'd got into spacesuits and threw the bubble lock out into the ordinary landscape of Capella IV, Capella, the sun, was sinking rapidly. We will just have time, Aunt Mattie said crisply through the intercom of our suits, to set the pattern and get some idea of the sizes needed. Then tomorrow we can begin our work. Through his faceplate I got a look at Johnny's wide, apprehensive eyes. Ladies, he said desperately, I must warn you again, I've never tried to touch one of them. I don't know what will happen. I can't be held responsible. You have been most remiss, young man, Aunt Mattie said sternly. But then, she added, as if remembering that he'd gone to a proper school, you're young, no doubt overburdened by nonsensical red tape in your administrative duties. And, if you had done this already, There'd be no reason for my being here. I am always willing to help wherever I'm needed. All five of us marched silently and bravely on after that. A hundred yards brought us to the first native. It lay there, spread-eagled in eight directions on the salt. In the centre of the tentacles there arose a column of black rubbery flesh, topped by a rounded dome in the centre of which was one huge liquid black eye. There was not a twitch of a tentacle as we came to a halt beside it. "'Is this the one you talked to, Johnny?' I asked. "'How should I know?' he asked bitterly. "'I never knew if I talked to the same one twice.' "'They're much bigger than I thought,' Miss Point said with a little dismay in her voice. "'Some of them are ten feet in diameter,' Johnny said, I thought with a bit of vindictiveness in his tone. Never mind, Aunt Mattie said. We'll simply sew three lengths of cloth together to get our square. I'm sure they won't mind a neatly done seam. She had a length of cloth in one arm of her spacesuit, and a pair of scissors in the mechanical claw of the other hand. With her eye she seemed to measure the diameter of the dome, and, manipulating the scissors with the claw like an expert space mechanic, entirely without fear or hesitation, she stepped into the triangle between two long black tentacles that lay on the salt and walked up to the erect column at the centre. Expertly she flipped the cloth so that the hole settled over the creature's head, or whatever it was. Fore and aft the cloth rippled out to cover the tentacles. The creature did not move. With an amazing speed she took some bundles of cloth from the arms of Mrs. Waddle and with even more amazing dexterity of the space claw, which showed she was no amateur, 
She basted a length of cloth on either side of the first strip. Then, with her scissors, careful not to gouge his hide, she cut off the corners so that the eight tentacles barely peeped out from underneath the cloth. Somehow it reminded me of a huge red flower with a black pistol laying there on the white salt. There, sir, my aunt said with satisfaction to the monster. This will hide your nakedness, instill in you a sense of true modesty. She turned to Johnny. They must not only know what, she instructed, they must also know why. She turned back and faced the monster again. It is not your fault, she said to it, that you have been living in a state of sin. On earth where I come from, we have a code which must be followed. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I'm sure that if I lived in a state of ignorant sin, I would humbly appreciate the kindness of someone letting me know. I'm sure that in time you will also come to appreciate it. It was quite a noble speech, and her two companions bowed their spacesuit helmets in acknowledgement. Johnny's mouth and eyes were wide and desperate. She stepped back then, and we all stood there, looking at the monster. The dome of its head began to tilt until the eye was fastened upon us. It swept over the three ladies, hesitated on Johnny as if recognizing him, but came to rest upon me. It stared at me for a full minute. I stared back. In some strange way I felt as if my psychiatrist were staring at me, as he often did. Then the great eye slowly closed and opened again. As slowly, and somewhat to my amazement, I felt one of my eyes close and open. I winked at it. That's all for this evening, Aunt Mattie said crisply. Let it have its clothes. Get used to them. I have the pattern in my mind. Tomorrow we will get out our sewing machines and really get busy, girls. All the way back to the entrance of the bubble, I felt that huge eye upon me, following me. Why me? The girls did not need to get busy the next morning. I was awakened by a shout. There was the sound of running feet in the hall and a pounding on my door. Sleepy-eyed, for I had dreamed of the monster's eye all night long, I opened the door as soon as I had found a robe to cover my own nakedness. It was Johnny, of course. Most amazing thing! He rushed in and collapsed into a sitting position on the side of my bed. Absolutely amazing! You should see them! What? I asked. The rumpus must have disturbed the ladies, too, for there came another knock on my door, and when I opened it all three of them stood there fully dressed. Apparently they had arisen at the crack of dawn to get busy with their sewing. Miss Point and Mrs. Waddle averted their eyes modestly from the v-neck of my robe and my bare legs. Aunt Mattie was used to my shameless ways. What is it? Aunt Mattie asked crisply. Johnny leapt to his feet again. Amazing, he said again. I'll have to show you. You'll never believe it. Young man, Aunt Mattie said sharply, no one has accused you of untruthfulness, and you are hardly a judge of what we are capable of believing. He stood looking at her with his mouth open. Now, ladies, I said, and started closing the door, if you'll excuse me for two minutes, I'll dress and we'll go see what Mr. McCabe wants to show us. The door clicked on my last words, and I hastily doffed the robe and slid into pants and a shirt. Oddly enough, I knew what he was going to show us. I just knew. I slipped on some shoes without bothering about socks. All right, I said. I'm ready. They had started down the hall, and we quickly overtook them. Johnny went ahead, led us out of the hotel, around its side, and when we came around the corner of the outbuilding which obscured the view, there before us, through the bubble wall, we saw what I had expected. As far as the eye could see, dotted here and there like poppies on the snow, the natives lay in the early sun, each dressed in a flaring cloth like that Aunt Mattie had designed the night before. You see? Johnny cried out. It's the same as with the lighter. One liked it, so they all have it. By now we were up against the plastic barrier. The two subordinates were gasping such words as Fantastic! Amazing! Astounding! Incredible! 
wondrous weird. Aunt Mattie took it all in, and her face lit into a beatific smile. You see, young man, she said to Johnny, they needed only to be shown right from wrong. Let this be a lesson to you. But how did they do it? Miss Waddle gasped. Give them some credit for diligence and ingenuity, Aunt Mattie almost snapped at her assistant. I always say we underrate the intelligence and ingenuity of the lesser orders, and that it saps their strengths if we are overprotective. I admire self-reliance, and these have shown they have it. So we will not have to do the sewing after all. Come, girls, we must pack and be on our way back to Earth. Our mission here is accomplished. The two ladies obeyed their leader without question. The three of them, in their sturdy walking shoes and their tweed suits, crunched off across the salt back to their rooms to start packing. Johnny and I walked along more slowly behind. The incredible Mathewa H. Tombs, he breathed. She's a legend, you know, Hap. But I never believed it before. Then, in a complete and sudden change of mood, he snickered. Or at least, it was the nearest thing to a small boy snicker I'd heard since prep school. The snicker turned into a roar of laughter, a grown man's laughter. <laughs> if only they knew! Apparently feeling secure because they'd turned the corner and gone out of sight. Knew what? I asked. Why? <laughs> he said, and doubled up with laughter again. They've covered up all the innocent parts and left the reprehensible part, which is right behind the eye, fully exposed. Johnny, my boy, I said with a chuckle, do you really believe there are innocent parts and reprehensible parts of any creature in the universe? He stood stock still and looked at me. It takes a nasty, salacious mind to make that kind of separation, I said. But your aunt... The daughters of... I know my aunt and the daughters of terror, I said. I've lived with them for years. I know their kind of mind. Who would know it better? But you... The human race, I said, is very young. It's only in the last few thousand years that it has discovered sex as a concept. So, like little kids in kindergarten, it goes around being embarrassed and snickering. But we'll grow up, give us time... But you, he said again, but they, that's the kind of organization that keeps us from growing up, Hap. Don't you see that? They've kept us mentally retarded for generations, centuries. How can we make progress when... What's the hurry, Johnny? We've got millions of years, billions, eternity. He looked at me again, sharply, shrewdly. I've underestimated you, Hap, he said. I'm afraid I always did. I had no idea you. I shrugged and passed it off. I'd had no idea either, not until this morning, last night, yesterday evening, when that eye had turned on me and I'd winked back. I didn't know how to tell him, or any reason why I should, that there couldn't be anything right or wrong, good or bad, that nothing could happen, nothing at all, excepting through the working of the law of nature. Could one say that water running downhill is good, and water being pumped uphill is bad? Both are operating within known physical laws. With millions of years to go, wasn't it likely we would go on discovering the laws governing how things worked, until one by one we had to give up all notion of good and bad happenings, understood them as only the operation of natural law? In all the universe, how could there be any such thing as unnatural happenings? Don't worry about it, Johnny, I said, as we started walking again. And don't worry about your career, either. Aunt Mattie likes you, and she's mighty pleased with the results of her work out here. Certain people in the State Department may consider her a bit of a meddlesome pest, but make no mistake about it. Every politician in the universe trembles in his boots at the mention of the DTs. And she likes you, Johnny. Thanks, Hap, he said, as we came to a stop before the doorway of the hotel. I'll see you before your ship takes off. Oh, er, uh, and you won't tell her she covered up the wrong, well, what she would think was the wrong part. I could have told her that last night, I said. 
He walked away with that startled, incredulous look he'd worn ever since our arrival. On Earth, Aunt Mattie had to rush off to a convention of DTs, where I had no doubt her latest exploit in combating ignorance and sin would be the main topic of conversation, and add to the triumph of her lionization. To give her credit, I think this lionization bothered her, embarrassed her a little, and she probably wondered at times if it were all sincere. But I also think she would have been lonely and disappointed without it. When one is doing all he can to make the universe we have inherited a better place for our posterity to inherit, one likes it to be appreciated. For two or three weeks after she came back home, she was immersed in administrative duties for the DT, setting wheels in motion to carry out all the promises she'd made at the convention. I spent the time in my own suite in the south wing of our house. Mostly, I just sat. No one bothered me except the servants necessary to eating, dressing, sleeping, and they were all but mute about it. My psychiatrist called once, but I sent word that I didn't need any today. I called none of my regular friends and did not answer their messages. I did send to the Library of Science in Washington for the original science survey report on Capella IV. It told me little, but allowed me to surmise some things. Apparently, the original scientists were singularly uncurious about the octopoids, perhaps because they didn't have five years to hang around and wait for one to blink an eye, as Johnny had. As always, they were overworked and understaffed. They did their quick survey and rushed on to some new planet job. If one hoped that some day somebody might go back and take another look at the octopoids, I found no burning yearning for it in the dry reports. As far as they went, their surmise was accurate. Some millions, many millions of years ago, the planet had lost the last of its ocean water. Apparently, as they failed to adapt to the increasing salinity of the little left, one by one the original life forms died out. Something in the octopoid metabolism or mentality allowed them to survive, to become land instead of water animals. Something in their metabolism or mentality allowed them to subsist on air and sunlight. Really now, did they even need these? That was as far as the reports went. They did not draw the picture of highly developed mentalities who lay there for millions of years and thought about the nature of being. Such things as how mental manipulation of force fields can provide each of them with a cigarette lighter that burns without any fluid in it, and any oxygen around its wick, or such things as Mother Hubbard's which had caught their fancy, or perhaps gave them some kind of sensual kick caused by heat filtering through red cloth. But mostly, I just sat. I went to see Aunt Matty when she came back from the convention, of course. She had the west wing where her sitting room looked out upon her flora collection, and the gardeners who were supposed to keep busy. Our greeting was fond but brief. She did look at me rather quizzically, rather shrewdly, but she made no comment. She did not return my visit. This was not unusual. She never visited my suite. When I was twenty-one she took me into the south wing and said, Choose your own suite, Hapland. You are a man now and I understand about young men. If she had in mind what I thought she had, it was a mighty big concession to reality, although of course she was five years late in coming around to it. This older generation, so wise, so naive, she probably resolutely refrained from imagining far worse things than really went on. About two weeks after she'd come back from the convention, a month since we'd returned from Capella Four there was an interruption, an excited one. For once in his life, the butler forgot to touch my door with feather fingertips and coughed discreetly. Instead, he knocked two sharp raps and opened the door without invitation. Come quickly, Master Hapland, he chittered urgently. There are creatures on our private landing field. There were, too. When I got there in my garden scooter and pushed my way through the crowd of gardeners who were clustered on the path around the gate to the landing field, I saw them. At least a dozen of the Capella Four octopoids were spread eagled, their tentacles out flat on the hot cement of the runway. Their eye stared unblinking into the sun. 
Over their spread of tentacles, like inverted hibiscus blossoms, they wore their mother hubbards. Behind them, over at the far edge of the field, was an exact duplicate of our own space yacht. I wondered rather hysterically, perhaps, if each of them on Capella Four now had one. I suspected the yacht was simply there for show, but they hadn't needed it, not any more than they needed the Mother Hubbards. There was the hiss of another scooter, and I turned around to see Aunt Mattie come to a stop. She stepped out and came over to me. Our social call on Capella Four is being returned, I said with a grin and a twinkle at her. She took in the sight with only one blink. Very well, she answered. I shall receive them, of course. Somebody once said that the most snobbish thing about the whole tribe of tombs was that they never learned the meaning of the word or had to. But I did wonder what the servants would think when the creatures started slithering into our drawing room. There was a gasp and a low rumble of protesting voices from the gardeners as Aunt Mattie opened the gate and walked through it. I followed, of course. We walked up to the nearest monster and came to stop at the edge of its skirt. I'm deeply honoured, Aunt Mattie said, with more cordiality than I'd seen her use on a Secretary of State. What can I do to make your visit to Earth more comfortable? There was no reply, not even the flicker of a tentacle. They were even more unusual than one might expect. Aunt Mattie resolutely went to each of the dozen and gave them the same greeting. She felt her duty as a hostess required it, although I knew that a greeting to one was a greeting to all. Not one of them responded. It seemed rather ridiculous. They'd come all this way to see us, then didn't bother to acknowledge that we were there. We spent more than an hour waiting for some kind of a response. None came. Aunt Mattie showed no sign of impatience, which I thought was rather praiseworthy, all things considered. But finally we left. She didn't show what she felt, perhaps felt, only that one had to be patient with the lack of manners in the lower orders. I was more interested in another kind of feeling, the one we left behind. What was it? I couldn't put my finger on it. Sadness? Regret? Distaste? Pity? Magnanimity? Give a basket of goodies to the poor at Christmas? Give them some clothes to cover their nakedness? Teach them a sense of shame? No, I couldn't put my finger on it. Hilarity? I found myself regretting that back there on Capella Four, when Aunt Mattie put clothes on him, and the monster had looked at me, I winked. I wondered why I should regret that. I didn't have long to wonder. Nothing happened during the rest of the day. We went back, together and separately, several times during the daylight hours and during the early hours of the night. For a wonder, nobody had leaked anything to the newspapers, and for what it was worth, we had the show to ourselves. Perhaps tomorrow, Aunt Mattie said around midnight, as we left the field for the last time. Perhaps they must rest. Oh, I could use some of that, I said with a yawn. Yes, Hapland, she agreed. We must conserve our strength. Heaven knows what may be required of us on the morrow. Did she feel something, too? It was so strong, how could she help it? And yet the monster had not looked into her eye. I didn't expect to sleep well, but I fooled myself. I was quite sure I hadn't more than closed my eyes when I was roused by another excited rapping on my bedroom door, and again the butler rushed in without ceremony. Look, Master Hapland, he shouted in a near falsetto. He pulled so hard on my drapes they swept back from my windows like a stage curtain, and I looked. To the very limit of our grounds in the distance, but not beyond, the trees, the shrubs, the drives and walkways, the lawns and ponds, all were covered with a two-foot-thick blanket of glistening salt. "'And the monsters are gone,' the butler was saying. "'And I must go to your aunt.' "'So must I,' I said, and grabbed up a robe. As I ran, overtook him, passed him, from all over the house I could hear excited outcries, wonder, amazement, anger, fear from the servants. 
I finished the length of my wing, sprinted through the main body of the house and down the hallway of her wing to the door of her suite. I didn't need to knock. Someone had left it open. Her personal maid, I saw, as I ran past the little alcove into her sitting room. The maid was standing beside Aunt Mattie, wringing her hands and crying. The drapes here, too, were swept full back, and through the windows I could see the collection, the highly prized, wondrous collection of flora, all covered in salt. Aunt Mattie stood there, without support, looking at it. When I came up to her there were tears in her eyes and glistening streaks on her wrinkled cheeks. Why? she asked. It was very quietly spoken. By now the butler had made the trip and came into the room. I turned to him. If we hurry, I said, a good deal of the collection is enclosed under plastic domes. If we don't wet the salt, and if we hurry and have it scraped away from the buildings, it won't poison the ground inside them. We can save most of the collection that way. No, Master Hapland, he said, and shook his head. The salt is inside the buildings just as much as here. A gardener shouted it at me as I passed. Aunt Mattie's closed fist came up to her lips, and then dropped again. That was all. Why, Hapland? she asked again. Evil for good. Why? I motioned the maid and butler to leave, and take with them the cluster of servants around the door in the hall. I took Aunt Mattie over to her favourite chair, the one where she would sit and look out at her collection. No point in pretending the salt wasn't there. I sat down at her feet the way I used to when I was ten years old. I looked out at the salt, too. It was everywhere. Every inch of our grounds was covered with it, to poison the earth so that nothing could grow in it. It would take years to restore the grounds, and many more years to restore the collection. Try to understand, Aunt Mattie, I said, not only what I say, but all the implications of it. They didn't return evil for good. Let's see it from what might have been their point of view. They live on a world of salt, an antiseptic world. We went there, and you intended good. You told them that our code was to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. They returned our visit, and what did they find? What kind of a pestilent horror did we live in? Bare ground, teeming with life, billions of life forms in every cubic foot of ground beneath our feet. Above the ground, too, raw, growing life all around us, towering over us. If they were doomed to live in such a world, they would want it covered in salt, to kill all the life, make it antiseptic. They owed nothing to the rest of Earth, but they owed this kindness to you. They did unto others as they would have others do unto them. I never realized. I was sure I couldn't be. I built my life around it, she said. I know, I said with a regretful sigh. So many people have. And yet I still wonder if it might not have happened at all, if I hadn't winked. I wonder if that pesty psychiatrist has been right all along. The End of Do Unto Others by Mark Clifton Recording by Andy Sames Egocentric Orbit by John Corey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eleanor Sakamoto Egocentric Orbit by John Corey Near the end of his fifteenth orbit, as Greenland slipped by noiselessly below, he made the routine measurements that tested the operation of his space capsule and checked the automatic instruments which would transmit their stored data to Earth on his next pass over control. Everything normal. All mechanical devices were operating perfectly. This information didn't surprise him. In fact, he really didn't even think about it. The previous orbits and the long simulated flights on Earth during training had made such checks routine and perfect results expected. 
The capsules were developed by exhaustive testing both on the ground and as empty satellites before entrusting them to carry animals and then the first human. He returned to contemplation of the panorama passing below and above, although, as he noted idly, above and below had lost some of their usual meaning, since his capsule, like all heavenly bodies, was stable in position with respect to the entire universe and, thanks to Sir Isaac Newton and his laws, never changed, the earth and the stars alternated over his head during each orbit. Up now meant whatever was in the direction of his head. He remembered that even during his initial orbit, when the earth first appeared overhead, he accepted the fact as normal. He wondered if the other two had accepted it as easily. For there had been two men hurled into orbit before he ventured into space, two others who had also passed the rigorous three-year training period and were selected on the basis of overall performance to precede him. He had known them both well and wondered again what had happened on their flights. Of course they had both returned, depending on what your definition of return was. The capsules in which they had ventured beyond Earth had returned them living, but this was to be expected for even the considerable hazards of descent through the atmosphere and the terrible heating which occurred were successfully surmounted by the capsule. Naturally, it had not been expected that the satellites would have to be brought down by command from the ground, but this too was part of the careful planning, radio control of the retro rockets that move the satellite out of orbit by reducing its velocity. Of course, ground control was to be used only if the astronaut failed to ignite the retro rockets himself. He remembered everyone's surprise and relief when the first capsule was recovered and its occupant found to be alive. They had assumed that in spite of all precautions he was dead because he had not fired the rockets on the fiftieth orbit, and it was necessary to bring him down on the sixty-fifth. Recovery alive only partially solved the mystery, for the rescuers, and all others, were met by a haughty, stony silence from the occupant. Batteries of tests confirmed an early diagnosis complete and utter withdrawal, absolute refusal to communicate. Therapy was unsuccessful. The second attempt was similar in most respects, except that the command return was made on the 31st orbit after the astronaut's failure to deorbit at the end of the 30th. His incoherent babble of moons, stars, and worlds was no more helpful than the first. Test after test confirmed that no obvious organic damage had been incurred by exposure outside of the Earth's protective atmosphere. Biopsy of even selected brain tissues seemed to show that microscopic cellular changes due to prolonged weightlessness or primary cosmic ray bombardment which had been suggested by some authorities were unimportant. Somewhat reluctantly, it was decided to repeat the experiment a third time. The launching was uneventful. He was sent into space with the precision he expected. The experience was exhilarating, and, although he had anticipated each event in advance, he could not possibly have foreseen the overpowering feeling that came over him. Weightlessness he had experienced for brief periods during training, but nothing could match the heady impression of continuous freedom from gravity. Earth passing overhead was also to be expected from the simple laws of celestial mechanics, but his feeling as he watched it now was inexpressible. It occurred to him that perhaps this was indeed why he was here, because he could appreciate such experiences best. He had been told the stars would be bright, unblinking, and an infinitude in extent, but could mere descriptions or photographs convey the true seeing? On his twenty-first orbit he completed his overseeing the entire surface of the planet in daylight. He had seen more of Earth than anyone able to tell about it, but only he had the true feeling of it. The continents were clearly visible, as were the oceans and both polar ice caps. The shapes were familiar, but only in a remote way. A vague indistinctness born of distance served to modify the outlines, and he alone was seeing and understanding. On the dark side of the planet, large cities were marked by indistinct light areas which paled to insignificance compared to the stars and his sun. He speculated about the others who had only briefly experienced these sights. Undoubtedly, they weren't as capable of fully grasping or appreciating any of these things as he was. It was quite clear that no one else but he could encompass the towering feeling of power and importance generated by being alone in the universe. At the end of the twenty-fifth orbit, he disabled the radio control of the retro rockets, 
and sat back with satisfaction to await the next circuit of his earth around him. End of Egocentric Orbit by John Corey Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown It is a tough decision to make, whether to give up your life so you can live it over again. For an instant, you think it is temporary blindness, the sudden dark that comes in the middle of a bright afternoon. It must be blindness, you think. Could the sun that was tanning you have gone out instantaneously, leaving you in utter blackness? Then the nerves of your body tell you that you are standing, whereas only a second ago you were sitting comfortably, almost reclining in a canvas chair in the patio of a friend's house in Beverly Hills, talking to Barbara, your fiancée, looking at Barbara, Barbara in a swimsuit, her skin golden tan in the brilliant sunshine, beautiful. You wore swimming trunks. Now you do not feel them on you. The slight pressure of the elastic waistband is no longer there against your waist. You touch your hands to your hips. You are naked and standing. Whatever has happened to you is more than a change of sudden darkness or to sudden blindness. You raise your hands gropingly before you. They touch a plain, smooth surface, a wall. You spread them apart and each hand reaches a corner. You pivot slowly, a second wall, then a third, then a door. You are in a closet about four feet square. Your hand finds the knob of the door. It turns, and you push the door open. There is light now. The door has opened to a lighted room, a room that you have never seen before. It is not large, but it is pleasantly furnished, although the furniture is of a style that is strange to you. Modesty makes you open the door cautiously the rest of the way, but the room is empty of people. You step into the room, turning to look behind you into the closet, which is now illuminated by light from the room. The closet is and is not a closet. It is the size and shape of one, but it contains nothing, not a single hook, no rod for hanging clothes, no shelf. It is an empty, blank-walled, four-by-four-foot space. You close the door to it and stand looking around the room, it is about 12 by 16 feet. There is one door, but it is closed. There are no windows. Five pieces of furniture. Four of them you recognize, more or less. One looks like a very functional desk. One is obviously a chair, a comfortable-looking one. There is a table, although its top is on several levels instead of only one. Another is a bed, or a couch. Something shimmering is lying across it, and you walk over and pick the shimmering something up and examine it. It is a garment. You are naked, so you put it on. Slippers are part way under the bed or couch, and you slide your feet into them. They fit, and they feel warm and comfortable as nothing you have ever worn on your feet has felt, like lamb's wool, but softer. You are dressed now. You look at the door, the only door of the room except that of the closet, the closet from which you entered it. You walk to the door, and before you try the knob, you see the small typewritten sign pasted just above it that reads, This door has a time lock, set to open in one hour. For reasons you will soon understand, it is better that you do not leave this room before then. There is a letter for you on the desk. Please read it. It is not signed. You look at the desk and see that there is an envelope lying on it. You do not yet go to take that envelope from the desk and read the letter that must be in it. 
Why not? Because you are frightened. You see other things about the room. The lighting has no source that you can discover. It comes from nowhere. It is not indirect lighting. The ceiling and the walls are not reflecting it at all. They didn't have lighting like that, back where you came from. What did you mean by back where you came from? You close your eyes. You tell yourself, I am Norman Hastings. I am an associate professor of mathematics at the University of Southern California. I am 25 years old, and this is the year 1900. And fifty four. You open your eyes and look again. They didn't use that style of furniture in Los Angeles or anywhere else that you know of in nineteen fifty four. The thing over in the corner, you can't even guess what it is. So might your grandfather, at your age, have looked at a television set. You look down at yourself, at the shimmering garment that you found waiting for you. With thumb and forefinger, you feel its texture. It's like nothing you've ever touched before. I am Norman Hastings. This is 1954. Suddenly, you must know, and at once. You go to the desk and pick up the envelope that lies upon it. Your name is typed on the outside, Norman Hastings. Your hands shake a little as you open it. Do you blame them? There are several pages typewritten. Dear Norman, it starts. You turn quickly to the end to look for the signature. It is unsigned. You turn back and start reading. Do not be afraid. There is nothing to fear, but much to explain. Much that you must understand before the time lock opens that door. Much that you must accept and obey. You have already guessed that you are in the future, in what, to you, seems to be the future. The clothes and the room must have told you that. I planned it that way so the shock would not be too sudden, so you would realize it over the course of several minutes, rather than read it here, and quite probably disbelieve what you saw. The closet from which you have just stepped is, as you have by now realized, a time machine. From it, you stepped into the world of 2004. The date is April 7th, just 50 years from the time you last remember. You cannot return. I did this to you, and you may hate me for it. I do not know. That is up to you to decide. But it does not matter. What does matter, and not to you alone, is another decision which you must make. I am incapable of making it. Who is writing this to you? I would rather not tell you just yet. By the time you have finished reading this, even though it is not signed, for I knew you would look first for a signature, I will not need to tell you who I am. You will know. I am 75 years of age. I have, in this year 2004, been studying time for thirty of those years, I have completed the first time machine ever built, and thus far its construction, even the fact that it has been constructed, is my own secret. You have just participated in the first major experiment. It will be your responsibility to decide whether there shall ever be any more experiments with it, whether it should be given to the world or whether it should be destroyed and never used again. End of the first page. You look up for a moment, hesitating to turn the next page. Already you suspect what is coming. You turn the page. I constructed the first time machine a week ago. My calculations had told me that it would work, but not how it would work. I had expected it to send an object back in time. It works backward in time only, not forward, physically unchanged and intact. My first experiment showed me my error. I placed a cube of metal in the machine. It was a miniature of the one you just walked out of, and set the machine to go backward ten years. I flicked the switch and opened the door, expecting to find the cube vanished. Instead, I found it had crumbled to powder. 
I put in another cube and sent it two years back. The second cube came back unchanged, except that it was newer, shinier. That gave me the answer. I had been expecting the cubes to go back in time, and they had done so, but not in the sense I had expected them to. Those metal cubes had been fabricated about three years previously. I had sent the first one back years before it had existed in its fabricated form. Two years ago, it had been ore. The machine returned it to that state. Do you see how our previous theories of time travel have been wrong? We expected to be able to step into a time machine in, say, 2004, set it for 50 years back, and then step out in the year 1954. But it does not work that way. The machine does not move in time. Only whatever is within the machine is affected, and then just with relation to itself, and not to the rest of the universe. I confirmed this with guinea pigs by sending one six weeks old, five weeks back, and it came out as a baby. I need not outline all of my experiments here. You will find a record of them in the desk, and you can study it later. Do you understand now what has happened to you, Norman? You begin to understand, and you begin to sweat. The eye who wrote that letter you are now reading, is you, yourself at the age of 75, in this year of 2004. You are that 75-year-old man, with your body returned to what it had been 50 years ago, with all the memories of 50 years of living wiped out. You invented the time machine. And before you used it on yourself, you made these arrangements to help you orient yourself. You wrote yourself the letter, which you are now reading. But if those fifty years are, to you, gone, what of all your friends, those you loved? What of your parents? What of the girl you are going, were going, to marry? You read on. Yes, you will want to know what has happened. Mom died in 1963, Dad in 1968. You married Barbara in 1956. I am sorry to tell you that she died only three years later, in a plane crash. You have one son. He is still living. His name is Walter. He is now 46 years old and is an accountant in Kansas City. Tears come into your eyes, and for a moment you can no longer read. Barbara, dead, dead for forty-five years, and only minutes ago, in subjective time, you were sitting next to her, sitting in the bright sun in a Beverly Hills patio. You force yourself to read again. But back to the discovery. You begin to see some of its implications. You will need time to think to see all of them. It does not permit time travel as we thought of time travel, but it gives us immortality of a sort. Immortality of the kind I have temporarily given us. Is it good? Is it worth while to lose the memory of fifty years of one's life in order to return one's body to relative youth? The only way I can find out is to try. As soon as I have finished writing this and made my other preparations, you will know the answer. But before you decide, remember that there is another problem, more important than the psychological one. I mean, overpopulation. If our discovery is given to the world, if all who are old or dying can make themselves young again, the population will almost double every generation. Nor would the world, not even our own relatively enlightened country, be willing to accept compulsory birth control as a solution. Give this to the world, as the world is today in 2004, and within a generation there will be famine, suffering, war, perhaps a complete collapse of civilization. Yes, we have reached other planets, but they are not suitable for colonizing. 
The stars may be our answer, but we are a long way from reaching them. When we do, some day, the billions of habitable planets that must be out there will be our answer, our living room. But until then, what is the answer? Destroy the machine? But think of the countless lives it can save, the suffering it can prevent. Think of what it would mean to a man dying of cancer. Think. You finish the letter and put it down. You think of Barbara, dead for 45 years, and of the fact that you were married to her for three years and that those years are lost to you. Fifty years lost. You damn the old man of 75 whom you became and who has done this to you, who has given you this decision to make. Bitterly, you know what the decision must be. You think that he knew, too, and realize that he could safely leave it in your hands. Damn him! He should have known. Too valuable to destroy, too dangerous to give. The other answer is painfully obvious. You must be custodian of this discovery, and keep it secret until it is safe to give, until mankind has expanded to the stars and has new worlds to populate or until even without that he has reached a state of stabilization where he can avoid overpopulation by rationing births to the number of accidental or voluntary deaths if neither of those things has happened in another fifty years and are they likely so soon then you at seventy-five will be writing another letter like this one. You will be undergoing another experience, similar to the one you're going through now, and making the same decision, of course. Why not? You'll be the same person again. Time and again, to preserve this secret until man is ready for it. How often will you again sit at a desk like this one, thinking the thoughts you are thinking now, feeling the grief you now feel there is a click at the door and you know that the time lock has opened that you are now free to leave this room free to start a new life for yourself in place of the one you have already lived and lost but you are in no hurry now to walk directly through that door you sit there staring straight ahead of you blindly seeing in your mind's eye the vista of a set of facing mirrors, like those in an old-fashioned barber shop, reflecting the same thing over and over again, diminishing into far distance. End of Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Costello. Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown. It is a tough decision to make whether to give up your life so you can live it over again. For an instant you think it is temporary blindness, the sudden dark that comes in the middle of a bright afternoon. It must be blindness, you think. Could the sun that was tanning you have gone out instantaneously, leaving you in utter blackness? Then the nerves of your body tell you that you are standing, whereas only a second ago you were sitting comfortably, almost reclining in a canvas chair, in the patio of a friend's house in Beverly Hills, talking to Barbara, your fiancée, looking at Barbara, Barbara in a swimsuit, her skin golden tan in the brilliant sunshine, beautiful. You wore swimming trunks. Now you do not feel them on you, the slight pressure of the elastic waistband is no longer there against your waist. You touch your hands to your hips, 
you are naked and standing. Whatever has happened to you is more than a change in sudden darkness or to sudden blindness. You raise your hands gropingly before you. They touch a plain, smooth surface, a wall. You spread them apart, and each hand reaches a corner. You pivot slowly. A second wall, then a third, then a door. You are in a closet about four feet square. Your hand finds the knob of the door. It turns, and you push the door open. There is light now. The door has opened to a lighted room, a room that you have never seen before. It is not large, but it is pleasantly furnished, although the furniture is of a style that is strange to you. Modesty makes you open the door cautiously the rest of the way, but the room is empty of people. You step into the room, turning to look behind you into the closet, which is now illuminated by light from the room. The closet is and is not a closet. It is the size and shape of one, but it contains nothing, not a single hook, no rod for hanging clothes, no shelf. It is an empty, blank-walled, four-by-four-foot space. You close the door to it and stand looking around the room. It is about 12 by 16 feet. There is one door, but it is closed. There are no windows. Five pieces of furniture. Four of them you recognize, more or less. One looks like a very functional desk. One is obviously a chair, a comfortable-looking one. There is a table, although its top is on several levels instead of only one. Another is a bed or couch. Something shimmering is lying across it, and you walk over and pick up the shimmering thing and examine it. It is a garment. You are naked, so you put it on. Slippers are part way under the bed, or couch, and you slide your feet into them. They fit, and they feel warm and comfortable, as nothing you have ever worn on your feet has felt, like lamb's wool, but softer. You are dressed now. You look at the door, the only door of the room except that of the closet. Closet? From which you entered it. You walk to the door, and before you try the knob, you see the small, typewritten sign pasted just above it that reads, This door has a time lock set to open in one hour. For reasons you will soon understand, it is better that you do not leave this room before then. There was a letter for you on the desk. Please read it. It is not signed. You look at the desk and see that there is an envelope lying on it. You do not yet go to take that envelope from the desk and read the letter that must be in it. Why not? Because you are frightened. You see other things about the room. The lighting has no source that you can discover. It comes from nowhere. It is not indirect lighting. The ceiling and the walls are not reflecting it at all. They didn't have lighting like that back where you came from. What did you mean by back where you came from? You close your eyes. You tell yourself, I am Norman Hastings. I am an associate professor of mathematics at the University of Southern California. I am 25 years old. And this is the year 1954. You open your eyes and look again. They didn't use that style of furniture in Los Angeles or anywhere else that you know of in 1954. That thing over in the corner, you can't even guess what it is. So might your grandfather at your age have looked at a television set. 
You look down at yourself, at the shimmering garment that you found waiting for you. With thumb and forefinger, you feel its texture. It's like nothing you've ever touched before. I am Norman Hastings. This is 1954. Suddenly, you must know and at once. You go to the desk and pick up the envelope that lies upon it. Your name is typed on the outside, Norman Hastings. Your hands shake a little as you open it. Do you blame them? There are several pages, typewritten. Dear Norman, it starts. You turn quickly to the end to look for the signature. It is unsigned. You turn back and start reading. Do not be afraid. There is nothing to fear but much to explain. Much that you must understand before the time lock opens that door. Much that you must accept and obey. You have already guessed that you are in the future. In what to you seems to be the future. The clothes in the room must have told you that. I planned it that way so the shock would not be too sudden so you would realize it over the course of several minutes rather than read it here and quite probably disbelieve what you read. The closet from which you have just stepped is, as you have by now realized, a time machine. From it you stepped into the world of 2004. The date is April 7th, just 50 years from the time you last remember. You cannot return. I did this to you, and you may hate me for it. I do not know. That is up to you to decide. But it does not matter. What does matter, and not to you alone, is another decision which you must make. I am incapable of making it. Who is writing this to you? I would rather not tell you just yet. By the time you have finished reading this, even though it is not signed, for I knew you would look first for a signature, I will not need to tell you who I am. You will know. I am 75 years of age. I have, in this year 2004, been studying time for 30 of those years. I have completed the first time machine ever built. And thus far, its construction, even the fact that it has been constructed, is my own secret. You have just participated in the first major experiment. It will be your responsibility to decide whether there shall ever be any more experiments with it, whether it should be given to the world, or whether it should be destroyed and never used again. End of the first page. You look up for a moment, hesitating to turn the next page. Already you suspect what is coming. You turn the page. I constructed the first time machine a week ago. My calculations had told me that it would work, but not how it would work. I had expected it to send an object back in time. It works backward in time only, not forward, physically unchanged and intact. My first experiment showed me my error. I placed a cube of metal in the machine. It was a miniature of the one you just walked out of, and set the machine to go backward ten years. I flicked the switch and opened the door, expecting to find the cube vanished. Instead, I found it had crumbled to powder. I put in another cube and sent it two years back. The second cube came back unchanged, except that it was newer, shinier. That gave me the answer. I had been expecting the cubes to go back in time, 
and they had done so, but not in the sense I had expected them to. Those metal cubes had been fabricated about three years previously. I had sent the first one back years before it had existed in its fabricated form. Ten years ago, it had been ore. The machine returned it to that state. Do you see how our previous theories of time travel have been wrong? We expected to be able to step into a time machine in, say, 2004, set it back 50 years, and then step out in the year 1954. But it does not work that way. The machine does not move in time. Only whatever is within the machine is affected, and then just with relation to itself and not to the rest of the universe. I confirmed this with guinea pigs by sending one six weeks old, five weeks back, and it came out a baby. I need not outline all my experiments here. You will find a record of them in the desk and you can study it later. Do you understand now what has happened to you, Norman? You begin to understand and you begin to sweat. The I who wrote that letter you are now reading is you, yourself at the age of 75 in this year of 2004. You are that 75-year-old man with your body returned to what it had been 50 years ago. With all the memories of 50 years of living wiped out, you invented the time machine. And before you used it on yourself, you made these arrangements to help you orient yourself. You wrote yourself the letter which you are now reading. But if those 50 years are, to you, gone, what of all your friends, those you loved? What of your parents? What of the girl you are going, were going, to marry? You read on. Yes, you will want to know what has happened. Mom died in 1963, Dad in 1968. You married Barbara in 1956. I am sorry to tell you that she has died only three years later in a plane crash. You have one son. He is still living. His name is Walter. He is now 46 years old and is an accountant in Kansas City. Tears come into your eyes, and for a moment you can no longer read. Barbara dead, dead for 45 years. And only minutes ago, in subjective time, you were sitting next to her, sitting in the bright sun in a Beverly Hills patio. You force yourself to read again. But back to the discovery you begin to see some of its implications. You will need time to think, to see all of them. It does not permit time travel as we have thought of time travel, but it gives us immortality of a sort. Immortality of the kind I have temporarily given us. Is it good? Is it worthwhile to lose the memory of 50 years of one's life in order to return one's body to relative youth? The only way I can find out is to try, as soon as I have finished writing this and made my other preparations. You will know the answer. But before you decide, remember that there is another problem. More important than the psychological one. I mean overpopulation. If our discovery is given to the world, if all who are old or dying can make themselves young again, 
the population will almost double every generation. Nor would the world, not even our own relatively enlightened country, be willing to accept compulsory birth control as a solution. Give this to the world as the world is today in 2004, and within a generation there will be famine, suffering, war, perhaps a complete collapse of civilization. Yes, we have reached other planets, but they are not suitable for colonizing. The stars may be our answer, but we are a long way from reaching them. When we do, someday, the billions of habitable planets that must be out there will be our answer, our living room. But until then, what is the answer? Destroy the machine? But think of the countless lives it can save, the suffering it can prevent. Think of what it would mean to a man dying of cancer. Think. Think. You finish the letter and put it down. You think of Barbara, dead for 45 years and of the fact that you were married to her for three years and that those years are lost to you. Fifty years lost. You damn the old man of 75, whom you became and who has done this to you, who has given you this decision to make. Bitterly, you know what the decision must be. You think that he knew, too, and realize that he could safely leave it in your hands. Damn him, he should have known. Too valuable to destroy, too dangerous to give. The other answer is painfully obvious. You must be custodian of this discovery and keep it secret until it is safe to give. Until mankind has expanded to the stars and has new worlds to populate. Or until, even without that, he has reached a state of civilization where he can avoid overpopulation by rationing births to the number of accidental or voluntary deaths. If neither of those things has happened in another 50 years... And are they likely so soon? Then you at 75 will be writing another letter like this one. You will be undergoing another experience similar to the one you're going through now and making the same decision, of course. Why not? You will be the same person again. Time and again, to preserve this secret until man is ready for it. How often will you again sit at a desk like this one, thinking the thoughts you are thinking now, feeling the grief you now feel? There's a click at the door, and you know that the time lock has opened, that you are now free to leave this room, free to start a new life for yourself in place of the one you have already lived and lost. But you are in no hurry now to walk directly through that door. You sit there, staring straight ahead of you blindly, seeing in your mind's eye the vista of a set of facing mirrors, like those in an old-fashioned barber shop reflecting the same thing over and over again, diminishing into far distance. End of Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown In the Abyss by H.G. Wells This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the Abyss by H. G. Wells 
The lieutenant stood in front of the steel sphere and gnawed a piece of pine splinter. What do you think of it, Stevens? he said. It's an idea, said Stevens, in the tone of one who keeps an open mind. I believe it will smash. Flat, said the lieutenant. He seems to have calculated it all out pretty well, said Stevens, still impartial. But think of the pressure, said the lieutenant. At the surface of the water, it's fourteen pounds to the inch. Thirty feet down, it's double that. Sixty, treble. Ninety-four times. Nine hundred, forty times. Five thousand, three hundred, that's a mile. It's two hundred and forty times fourteen pounds. That's, let's see, thirty hundred weight. A ton and a half, Stevens. A ton and a half to the square inch. And the ocean where he's going is five miles deep. That's seven and a half. Sounds a lot, said Stevens, but it's jolly thick steel. The lieutenant made no answer, but resumed this pine splinter. The object of their conversation was a huge ball of steel, having an exterior diameter of perhaps nine feet. It looked like some shot for some titanic piece of artillery. It was elaborately nested in a monstrous scaffolding built into the framework of the vessel, and the gigantic spars that were presently to sling it overboard gave the stern of the ship an appearance that had raised the curiosity of every decent sailor who had sighted it, from the Pool of London to the Tropic of Capricorn. In two places, one above the other, the steel gave place to a couple of circular windows of enormously thick glass, and one of these, set in steel frame of great solidity, was now partially unscrewed. Both the men had seen the interior of this globe for the first time that morning. It was elaborately padded with air cushions, with little studs sunk between bulging pillows to work the simple mechanism of the affair. Everything was elaborately padded. Even the Myers apparatus, which was to absorb carbolic acid and replace the oxygen inspired by its tenant, when he had crept in by the glass manhole and had been screwed in. It was so elaborately padded that a man might have been fired from a gun in it in perfect safety. And it had need to be, for presently a man was to crawl in through that glass manhole, to be screwed up tightly, and to be flung overboard and sink down, 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 for five miles, even as the lieutenant said. It had taken the strongest hold of his imagination. It made him a bore at mess, and he found Stevens, the new arrival aboard, a godsend to talk about it, over and over again. It's my opinion, said the lieutenant, that that glass will simply bend in and bulge and smash under a pressure of that sort. Daubry has made rocks run like water under big pressures, and you mark my words. If the glass did break in, said Stevens, what then? The water would shoot in like a jet of iron. Have you ever felt a straight jet of high-pressure water? It would hit as hard as a bullet. It would simply smash him and flatten him. It would tear down his throat and into his lungs. It would blow in his ears. What a detailed imagination you have, protested Stevens, who saw things vividly. It's a simple statement of the inevitable, said the lieutenant. And the globe would just give out a few little bubbles, and it would settle down comfortably against the day of judgment, among the oozes in the bottom clay, with poor Elstead spread over his own smashed cushions like butter over bread. He repeated the sentence, as though he liked it very much. Like butter over bread, he said. Having a look at the jigger, said a voice, and Elstead stood behind them, spick and span in white, with a cigarette between his teeth, and his eyes smiling out of the shadow of his ample hat brim. What's that about bread and butter, Weybridge? Grumbling as usual about the insufficient pay of naval officers? It won't be more than a day now before I start. We are to get the slings ready today. This clean sky and gentle swell is just the kind of thing for swinging off a dozen tons of lead and iron, isn't it? It won't affect you much, said Weybridge. No, seventy or eighty feet down, and I shall be there in a dozen seconds. There's not a particle moving, though the wind shriek itself hoarse up above, and the water lifts halfway to the clouds. No, down there. He moved to the side of the ship, and the other two followed him. All three leant forward on their elbows and stared down into the yellow-green water. Peace, said Elstead, finishing his thought aloud. Are you dead certain that clockwork will act? asked Weybridge presently. It has worked thirty-five times, said Elstead. It's bound to work. But if it doesn't, why shouldn't it? I wouldn't go down in that confounded thing, said Weybridge, for twenty thousand pounds. Cheerful chap you are, said Elstead, 
and spat sociably at a bubble below. "'I don't understand yet how you mean to work the thing,' said Stevens. "'In the first place I'm screwed into the sphere,' said Elstead. "'And when I've turned the electric light off on three times to show I'm cheerful, "'I'm swung out over the stern by that crane "'with all those big lead sinkers slung below me. "'The top lead weight has a roller carrying a hundred fathoms of strong cord rolled up, "'and that's all that joins the sinkers to the sphere, "'except the slings that will be cut when the affair is dropped. "'We use cord rather than wire rope because it's easier to cut and more buoyant, necessary points, as you will see. Through each of these lead weights you'll notice there's a hole, and an iron rod will be run through that, and will project six feet to the lower side. If that rod is rammed up from below, it knocks up a lever, and sets the clockwork in motion at the side of the cylinder on which the cord winds. Very well. The whole affair is lowered gently into the water, and the slings are cut. The sphere floats, with the air in it, it's lighter than water, but the lead weights go down straight and the cord runs out. When the cord is all paid out, the sphere will go down too, pulled down by the cord. But why the cord? asked Stevens. Why not fasten the weights directly to the sphere? Because of the smash down below. The whole affair will go rushing down, mile after mile, at a headlong pace at last. It would be knocked to pieces on the bottom if it wasn't for that cord. But the weights will hit the bottom and directly they do, the buoyancy of the sphere will come into play. It will go on sinking slower and slower, come to stop at last, and then begin to float upward again. That's where the clockwork comes in. Directly the weight smash against the sea bottom, the rod will be knocked through and will kick up the clockwork, and the cord will be rewound on the reel. I shall be lugged down to the sea bottom. There I shall stay for half an hour, with the electric light on, looking about me. Then the clockwork will release a spring knife, the cord will be cut, and up I shall rush again, like a soda water bubble. The cord itself will help the flotation. And if you should chance to hit a ship, said Weybridge. I should come up at such a pace I should go clean through it, said Elstead, like a cannonball. You needn't worry about that. And suppose some nimble crustacean should wriggle into your clockwork. It would be a pressing sort of imitation for me to stop, said Elstead turning his back on the water and staring at the sphere. They had swung Elstead overboard by eleven o'clock. The day was serenely bright and calm, with the horizon lost in haze. The electric glare in the little upper compartment beamed cheerfully three times. Then they led him down slowly to the surface of the water, and a sailor in the stern chains hung ready to cut the tackle that held the lead weights in the sphere together. The globe, which had looked so large on deck, looked the smallest thing conceivable under the stern of the ship. It rolled a little, and its two dark windows, which floated uppermost, seemed like eyes turned up in round wonderment at the people who crowded the rail. A voice wondered how Elstead liked the rolling. "'Are you ready?' sang out the commander. "'Aye, aye, sir. Then let her go.' The rope of the tackle tightened against the blade and was cut, and an eddy rolled over the globe in a grotesquely helpless fashion. Someone waved a handkerchief. Someone else tried an ineffectual cheer. A middy was counting slowly. Eight. Nine. Ten. Another roll. Then a jerk and a splash. The thing righted itself. It seemed to be stationary for a moment, to grow rapidly smaller, and then the water closed over it, and it became visible, enlarged by refraction and dimmer, below the surface. Before one could count three, it had disappeared. There was a flicker of white light far down in the water that diminished to a speck and vanished. Then there was nothing but a depth of water going down into blackness, through which a shark was swimming. Then suddenly the screw of the cruiser began to rotate. The water was crickled, the shark disappeared in a wrinkled confusion, and a torrent of foam rushed across the crystalline clearness that had swallowed up Elstead. "'What's the idea?' said one A.B. to another. "'We're going to lay off about a couple of miles. "'Fear he should hit us when he comes up,' said his mate. "'The ship steamed slowly to her new position. "'Aboard her, almost everyone who was unoccupied "'remained watching the breathing swell into which the sphere had sunk. "'For the next half hour, it is doubtful if a word was spoken "'that did not bear directly or indirectly on Elstead. "'The December sun was now high in the sky, "'and the heat very considerable.' "'You'll be cold enough down there,' said Weybridge. 
They say that below a certain depth seawater's always just above freezing. Where'll he come up? asked Stevens. I've lost my bearings. That's the spot, said the commander, who prided himself on his omniscience. He extended a precise finger southeastward. And this, I reckon, is pretty near the moment, he said. It's been thirty-five minutes. How long does it take to reach the bottom of the ocean? asked Stevens. For a depth of five miles, and reckoning, as we did, an acceleration of two feet per second, both ways, is just about three-quarters of a minute. Then he's overdue, said Weybridge. Pretty nearly, said the commander. I suppose it takes a few minutes for that cord of his to wind in. I forgot that, said Weybridge, evidently relieved. And then began the suspense. A minute slowly dragged itself out, and no sphere shot out of the water. Another followed, and nothing broke the low, oily swell. The sailors explained to one another that little point about the winding in of the cord. The rigging was dotted with expectant faces. Come up, Elstead, cried one hairy-chested salt impatiently, and the others caught it up, and shouted as though they were waiting for the curtain of a theater to rise. The commander glanced irritably at them. Of course, if the acceleration's less than two, he said, he'll be all the longer. We aren't absolutely certain that was the proper figure. I'm no slavish believer in calculations. Stevens agreed concisely. No one on the quarter-deck spoke for a couple of minutes. Then Stevenson's watch case clicked. When, twenty-one minutes after the sun reached the zenith, they were still waiting for the globe to reappear, and not a man aboard had dared to whisper that hope was dead. It was Weybridge who first gave expression to that realization. He spoke while the sound of eight bells still hung in the air. I always distrusted that window, he said quite suddenly to Stevens. Good God, said Stevens. You don't think. Well, said Weybridge, and left the rest to his imagination. I'm no great believer in calculations myself, said the commander dubiously, so that I'm not altogether hopeless yet. And at midnight the gunboat was steaming slowly in a spiral round the spot where the globe had sunk, and the white beam of the electric light fled and halted and swept discontentedly onward again over the waste of phosphorescent waters under the little stars. If his window hasn't burst out and smashed him, said Weybridge, then it's a cursed sight worse, for his clockwork has gone wrong, and he's alive now, five miles under our feet. Down there in the cold and dark, anchored in that little bubble of his, where never a ray of light has shone or a human being lived, since the waters were gathered together. He's there without food, feeling hungry and thirsty and scared, wondering whether he'll starve or stifle. Which will it be? The Myers apparatus is running out, I suppose. How long do they last? Good heavens, he exclaimed. What little things we are. What daring little devils. Down there, miles and miles of water. All water, and all this empty water about us in the sky. Gulfs. He threw his hands out, and as he did so, a little white streak swept noiselessly up the sky. Traveled more slowly. Stopped. Became a motionless dot, as though a new star had fallen up into the sky. Then it went sliding back again, and lost itself amidst the reflections of the stars, and the white haze of the sea's phosphorescence. At the sight he stopped, arm extended and mouth open. He shut his mouth, opened it again, and waved his arms with an impatient gesture. Then he turned, shouted, Elstead ahoy, to the first watch, and went at a run to Lindley, and the searchlight. I saw him, he said, starboard there. His light's on, and he's just shot out of the water. Bring the light round. We ought to see him drifting when he lifts on the swell. But they never picked up the explorer until dawn. Then they almost ran him down. The crane was swung out, and a boat's crew hooked the chain into the sphere. When they had shipped the sphere, they unscrewed the manhole and peered into the darkness of the interior, for the electric light chamber was intended to illuminate the water about the sphere, and was shut off entirely from its general cavity. The air was very hot within the cavity and the India rubber at the lip of the manhole was soft. There was no answer to their eager questions and no sound of movement within. Elstead seemed to be lying motionless, crumpled in the bottom of the globe. The ship's doctor crawled in and lifted him to the men outside. For a moment or so, they did not know whether Elstead was alive or dead. His face, in the yellow light of the ship's lamps, glistened with perspiration. They carried him down to his own cabin. 
He was not dead, they found, but in a state of absolute nervous collapse, and besides cruelly bruised. For some days he had to lie perfectly still. It was a week before he could tell his experiences. Almost his first words were that he was going down again. The sphere would have to be altered, he said, in order to allow him to throw off the cord if need be, and that was all. He had had the most marvelous experience. You thought I should find nothing but ooze, he said. You laughed at my explorations, and I discovered a new world. He told his story in disconnected fragments, and chiefly from the wrong end, so that it is impossible to retell it in his words. But what follows is the narrative of his experience. It began atrociously, he said. Before the cord ran out, the thing kept rolling over. He felt like a frog in a football. He could see nothing but the crane and the sky overhead, with an occasional glimpse of people on the ship's rail. He couldn't tell a bit which way the thing would roll next. Suddenly he would find his footing going up and try to step, and over he went rolling, head over heels, just anyhow on the padding. Any other shape would have been more comfortable, but no other shape was to be relied upon under the huge pressure of the nethermost abyss. Suddenly the swaying ceased, the globe righted, and when he had picked himself up, he saw the water all about him greeny-blue, with an attenuated light filtering down from above, and the shoal of little floating things went rushing up past him, as it seemed to him, towards the light. And even as he looked it grew darker and darker, until the water above was as dark as the midnight sky, albeit of greener shade, and the water below black, and little transparent things in the water developed a faint glint of luminosity, and shot past him in faint greenish streaks and the feeling of falling. It was just like the start of a lift, he said, only it kept on. One has to imagine what that means, that keeping on. It was then of all times that Elstead repented of his adventure. He saw the chances against him in altogether new light. He thought of the big cuttlefish people knew to exist in the middle waters, the kind of things they find half digested in whales at times, or floating dead and rotten and half eaten by fish. Suppose one caught hold and wouldn't let go, and had the clockwork really been sufficiently tested? But whether he wanted to go on or go back mattered not the slightest now. In fifty seconds everything was black as night outside, except where the beam from his light struck through the waters, and picked out every now and then some fish or scrap of sinking matter. They flashed by too fast for him to see what they were. Once he thinks, he passed a shark and then the sphere began to get hot by friction against the water. They had underestimated this, it seems. The first thing he noticed was that he was perspiring, and then he heard a hissing growing louder under his feet, and saw a lot of little bubbles, very little bubbles they were, rushing upward like a fan through the water outside. Steam. He felt the window, and it was hot. He turned on the minute glow lamp that lit his own cavity, looked at the padded watch by the studs, and saw he'd been traveling now for two minutes. It came into his head that the window would crack through the conflict of temperatures, for he knew the bottom water is very near freezing. Then suddenly the floor of the sphere seemed to press against his feet. The rush of bubbles outside grew slower and slower, and the hissing diminished. The sphere rolled a little. The window had not cracked, nothing had given, and he knew that the dangers of sinking at any rate were over. In another minute or so, he would be on the floor of the abyss. He thought, he said, of Stevens and Weybridge, and the rest of them five miles overhead, higher to him than the highest clouds that ever floated over land are to us, steaming slowly and staring down and wondering what had happened to him. He peered out of the window. There were no more bubbles now, and the hissing had stopped. Outside, there was a heavy blackness, a black as black velvet, except where the electric light pierced the empty water and showed the color of it, a yellow-green. Then three things like shapes of fire swam into sight, following each other through the water. Whether they were little and near, or big and far off, he could not tell. Each was outlined in a bluish light, almost as bright as the lights of a fishing smack, a light which seemed to be smoking greatly, and all along the sides of them were specks of this, like the lighter portholes of a ship. Their phosphorescence seemed to go out as they came into the radiance of his lamp, 
and he saw then that they were little fish of some strange sort, with huge heads, vast eyes, and dwindling bodies and tails. Their eyes were turned towards him, and he judged they were following him down. He supposed they were attracted by his glare. Presently others of the same sort joined them. As he went on down, he noticed that the water became of a pallid color, and that little specks twinkled in his ray like motes in a sunbeam. This was probably due to the clouds of ooze and mud that the impact of his leaden sinkers had disturbed. By the time he was drawn down to the lead weights he was in a dense fog of white that his electric light failed altogether to pierce for more than a few yards, and many minutes elapsed before the hanging sheets of sediment subsided to any extent. Then lit by his light and by the transient phosphorescence of a distant shoal of fishes, he was able to see under the huge blackness of the superincumbent water an undulating expanse of grayish-white ooze, broken here and there by tangled thickets of a growth of sea lilies, waving hungry tentacles in the air. Farther away were the graceful, translucent outlines of a group of gigantic sponges. About this floor there were scattered a number of bristling, flattish tufts of rich purple and black, which he decided must be some sort of sea urchin, and small, large-eyed or blind things having a curious resemblance, some to wood lice and others to lobsters crawled sluggishly across the track of the light, and vanished into the obscurity again, leaving furrowed trails behind them. Then suddenly the hovering swarm of little fishes veered about and came towards him as a flight of starlings might do. They passed over him like a phosphorescent snow, and then he saw behind them some larger creature advancing toward the sphere. At first he could see it only dimly, a faintly moving figure remotely suggestive of a walking man and then it came into the spray of light that the lamp shot out. As the glare struck it, it shut its eyes, dazzled. He stared in rigid astonishment. It was a strange vertebrated animal. Its dark purple head was dimly suggestive of a chameleon, but it had such a high forehead and such a brain case as no reptile ever displayed before. The vertical pitch of its face gave it a most extraordinary resemblance to a human being. Two large and protruding eyes projected from sockets in chameleon fashion, and it had a broad reptilian mouth with horny lips beneath its little nostrils. In the position of the ears were two huge gill covers, and out of these floated a branching tree of coralline filaments, almost like the tree-like gills that very young rays and sharks possess. But the humanity of the face was not the most extraordinary thing about the creature. It was a biped. Its almost globular body was poised on a tripod of two frog-like legs, and a long thick tail, and its forelimbs, which grotesquely caricatured the human hand, much as a frog's do, carried a long shaft of bone, tipped with copper. The color of the creature was variegated. Its head, hands, and legs were purple. But its skin, which hung loosely upon it, even as clothes might do, was a phosphorescent gray. And it stood there, blinded by the light. At last this unknown creature of the abyss blinked its eyes open, and shading them with its disengaged hand, opened its mouth, and gave vent to a shouting noise, articulate almost as speech might be, that penetrated even the steel case and padded jacket of the sphere. How a shouting may be accomplished without lungs, Elstead does not profess to explain. It then moved sideways, out of the glare, into the mystery of shadow that bordered it on either side and Elstead felt rather than saw that it was coming towards him. Fancying the light had attracted it, he turned the switch that cut off the current. In another moment something soft dabbed upon the steel, and the globe swayed. Then the shouting was repeated, and it seemed to him that a distant echo answered it. The dabbing recurred, and the whole globe swayed and ground against the spindle over which the wire was rolled. He stood in the blackness and peered out into the everlasting night of the abyss. And presently he saw, very faint and remote, other phosphorescent quasi-human forms hurrying towards him. Hardly knowing what he did, he felt about in his swaying prison for the stud of the exterior electric light, and came by accident against his own small glow lamp in its padded recess. The sphere twisted, and then threw him down. He heard shouts, like shouts of surprise and when he rose to his feet, he saw two pairs of stalked eyes peering into the lower window and reflecting his light. In another moment hands were dabbing vigorously at his steel casing, 
and there was a sound, horrible enough in his position, of the metal protection of the clockwork being vigorously hammered. That, indeed, sent his heart into his mouth, for if these strange creatures succeeded in stopping that, his release would never occur. Scarcely had he thought as much when he felt the sphere sway violently, and the floor of it press hard against his feet. He turned off the small glow lamp that lit the interior, and sent the ray of the large light in the separate compartment, out into the water. The seafloor and the man-like creatures had disappeared, and a couple of fish chasing each other dropped suddenly by the window. He thought at once that these strange denizens of the deep sea had broke the rope, and that he had escaped. He drove up faster and faster, and then stopped with a jerk that sent him flying against the padded roof of his prison. For half a minute, perhaps, he was too astonished to think. Then he felt that the sphere was spinning slowly, and rocking, and it seemed to him that it was also being drawn through the water. By crouching close to the window, he managed to make his weight effective, and roll that part of the sphere downward. But he could see nothing, save the pale ray of his light striking down ineffectively into the darkness. It occurred to him that he would see more if he turned the lamp off, and allowed his eyes to grow accustomed to the profound obscurity. In this he was wise. After some minutes, the velvety blackness became a translucent blackness. And then, far away, and as faint as zoatical light of an English summer evening, he saw shapes moving below. He judged these creatures had detached his cable, and were towing him along the sea bottom. And then he saw something, faint and remote across the undulations of the submarine plain. A broad horizon of pale luminosity, that extended this way and that way as far as the range of his little window permitted him to see. To this he was being towed, as a balloon might be towed by men out of the open country into a town. He approached it very slowly, and very slowly, the dim irradiation was gathered together into more definite shapes. It was nearly five o'clock before he came over this luminous area, and by that time he could make out an arrangement suggestive of streets, and houses grouped about a vast, roofless erection that was grotesquely suggestive of a ruined abbey. It was spread out like a map below him. The houses were all roofless enclosures of walls, and their substance being, as he afterwards saw, of phosphorescent bones, gave the place an appearance as if it were built of drowned moonshine. Among the inner caves of the place, waving trees of crinoids stretched their tentacles, and tall, slender, glassy sponges shot like shining minarets and lilies of filmy light out of the general glow of the city. In the open spaces of the place, he could see a stirring movement, as of crowds of people, but he was too many fathoms above them to distinguish the individuals in those crowds. Then slowly they pulled him down, and as they did so, the details of the place crept slowly upon his apprehension. He saw that the courses of the cloudy buildings were marked out with beaded lines of round objects, and then he perceived that at several points below him, in broad open spaces, were forms like the encrusted shapes of ships. Slowly and surely he was drawn down, and the forms below him became brighter, clearer, more distinct. He was being pulled down, he perceived, towards the large building in the center of the town, and he could catch a glimpse ever and again of the multitudinous forms that were lugging at his cord. He was astonished to see that the rigging of one of the ships, which formed such a prominent feature of the place, was crowded with a host of gesticulating figures regarding him, and then the walls of the great building rose about him silently, and hid the city from his eyes. And such walls they were, of waterlogged wood, and twisted wire rope, and iron spars and copper, and the bones and skulls of dead men. The skulls ran in zigzag lines, and spirals and fantastic curves over the building, and in and out of their eye sockets, and over the whole surface of the place, lurked and played a multitude of silvery little fishes. Suddenly his ears were filled with a low shouting, and a noise like the violent blowing of horns, and this gave place to a fantastic chant. Down the sphere sank, past the huge pointed windows, through which he saw vaguely a great number of these strange, ghost-like people regarding him, and at last he came to rest, as it seemed, on a kind of altar, that stood in the center of the place. And now he was at such a level that he could see these strange people of the abyss plainly once more. 
to his astonishment, he perceived that they were prostrating themselves before him, all save one, dressed as it seemed in a robe of placoid scales, and crowned with a luminous diadem, who stood with his reptilian mouth opening and shutting, as though he led the chanting of the worshippers. A curious impulse made Elstead turn on his small glow lamp again, so that he became visible to these creatures of the abyss, albeit the glare made them disappear forthwith into night. At this sudden sight of him, the chanting gave place to a tumult of exultant shouts, and Elstead, being anxious to watch them, turned his light off again, and vanished from before their eyes. But for a time he was too blind to make out what they were doing, and when at last he could distinguish them, they were kneeling again. And thus they continued worshipping him, without rest or intermission for a space of three hours. Most circumstantial was Elstead's account of this astounding city and its people, these people of perpetual night, who have never seen sun, or moon, or stars, green vegetation, nor any living, air-breathing creatures, who know nothing of fire, nor any light, but the phosphorescent light of living things. Startling as is his story, it is yet more startling to find that scientific men, of such eminence as Adams and Jenkins, find nothing incredible in it. They tell me they see no reason why intelligent, water-breathing vertebrated creatures, inured to a low temperature and enormous pressure, and of such a heavy structure, that neither alive nor dead would they float, might not live upon the bottom of the deep sea, and quite unsuspected by us, descendants like ourselves of the great theriomorpha of the new red sandstone age. We should be known to them, however, as strange meteoric creatures, want to fall catastrophically dead out of the mysterious blackness of their watery sky. And not only we ourselves, but our ships, our metals, our appliances would come raining down out of the night. Sometimes sinking things would smite down and crush them, as if it were the judgment of some unseen power above. And sometimes would come things of utmost rarity or utility, or shapes of inspiring suggestion. One can understand, perhaps, something of their behavior at the descent of a living man, if one thinks what a barbaric people might do, to whom an enhaloed shining creature came suddenly out of the sky. At one time or another Elstad probably told the officers of the ptarmigan every detail of his strange twelve hours in the abyss. That he also intended to write them down is certain, but he never did and so unhappily we have to piece together the discrepant fragments of his story from the reminiscences of Commander Simmons, Weybridge, Stevens, Lindley, and the others. We see the thing darkly, in fragmentary glimpses, the huge ghostly building, the bowing, chanting people, with their dark chameleon-like heads, and faintly luminous clothing. And Elstead, with his lights turned on again, vainly trying to convey to their minds that the cord by which the sphere was held was to be severed. Minute after minute slipped away, and Elstead, looking at his watch, was horrified to find that he had oxygen only for four hours more. But the chant in his honor kept on as remorselessly as if it were the marching song of his approaching death. The manner of his release he does not understand, but to judge by the end of the cord that hung from the sphere, it had been cut through by rubbing against the edge of the altar, Abruptly the sphere rolled over, and he swept up, out of their world, as an ethereal creature clothed in a vacuum would sweep through our own atmosphere back to his native ether again. He must have torn out of their sight as a hydrogen bubble hastens upwards from our air, a strange ascension it must have seemed to them. The sphere rushed up with even greater velocity than, when weighted with the lead sinkers, it had rushed down. It became exceedingly hot. It drove up with the windows uppermost, and he remembers the torrent of bubbles frothing against the glass. Every moment he expected this to fly. Then suddenly, something like a huge wheel seemed to be released in his head. The padded compartment began spinning about him, and he fainted. His next recollection was of his cabin, and of the doctor's voice. But that is a substance of the extraordinary story that Elstead related in fragments to the officers of the ptarmigan. He promised to write it all down at a later date. His mind was chiefly occupied with the improvements of his apparatus, which was effected at Rio. It remains only to tell that on February 2, 1896, he made his second descent into the ocean abyss, with the improvements his first experience suggested. What happened we shall probably never know. 
he never returned. The ptarmigan beat about over the point of his submersion, seeking him in vain for thirteen days. Then she returned to Rio, and the news was telegraphed to his friends. So the matter remains for the present. But it is hardly probable that no further attempt will be made to verify his strange story, of these hitherto unsuspected cities of the deep sea. End of In the Abyss By H. G. Wells Recording by James Christopher J. X. Christopher at yahoo.com Keep Out by Frederick Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eleanor Sakamoto. Keep Out by Frederick Brown. Dapting is the secret of it. Adapting, they called it first. Then it got shortened to dapting. It let us adapt. They explained it all to us when we were ten years old. I guess they thought we were too young to understand before then, although we knew a lot of it already. They told us just after we landed on Mars. You're home, children, the head teacher told us after we had gone into the glassite dome they'd built for us there, and he told us there'd be a special lecture for us that evening, an important one that we must all attend. And that evening he told us the whole story and the whys and wherefores. He stood up before us. He had to wear a heated spacesuit and helmet, of course, because the temperature in the dome was comfortable for us, but already freezing cold for him, and the air was already too thin for him to breathe. His voice came to us by radio from inside his helmet. Children, he said, you are home. This is Mars, the planet on which you will spend the rest of your lives. You are Martians, the first Martians. You have lived five years on Earth and another five in space. Now you will spend ten years, until you are adults, in this dome, although toward the end of that time you will be allowed to spend increasingly long periods outdoors. Then you will go forth and make your own homes, live your own lives as Martians. You will intermarry, and your children will breed true. They too will be Martians. It is time you were told the history of this great experiment of which each of you is a part. Then he told us. Man, he said, had first reached Mars in 1985. It had been uninhabited by intelligent life. There is plenty of plant life and a few varieties of non-flying insects, and he had found it by terrestrial standards uninhabitable. Man could survive on Mars only by living inside glassite domes and wearing spacesuits when he went outside of them. Except by day in the warmer seasons, it was too cold for him. The air was too thin for him to breathe, and long exposure to sunlight, less filtered of rays harmful to him than on Earth because of the lesser atmosphere, could kill him. The plants were chemically alien to him, and he could not eat them. He had to bring all his food from Earth, or grow it in hydroponic tanks. For fifty years he had tried to colonize Mars, and all his efforts had failed. Besides this dome, which had been built for us, there was only one other outpost, another glassite dome much smaller and less than a mile away. It had looked as though mankind could never spread to the other planets of the solar system besides Earth, for of all of them Mars was the least inhospitable. If he couldn't live here, there was no use even trying to colonize the others. And then, in 2034, thirty years ago, a brilliant biochemist named Weymouth had discovered daptine, a miracle drug that worked not on the animal or person to whom it was given, but on the progeny he conceived during the limited period of time after inoculation. It gave his progeny almost limitless adaptability to changing conditions, provided the changes were made gradually. Dr. Weymouth had inoculated and then mated a pair of guinea pigs. They had borne a litter of five, and by placing each member of the litter under different and gradually changing conditions, he had obtained amazing results. When they attained maturity, one of those guinea pigs was living comfortably at a temperature of 40 below zero Fahrenheit, another was quite happy at 150 above, a third was thriving on a diet that would have been deadly poison for an ordinary animal, 
and a fourth was contented under a constant X-ray bombardment that would have killed one of its parents within minutes. Subsequent experiments with many litters showed that animals who had been adapted to similar conditions bred true, and their progeny was conditioned from birth to live under those conditions. Ten years later, ten years ago, the head teacher told us, few children were born, born of parents carefully selected from those who volunteered for the experiment, and from birth you have been brought up under carefully controlled and gradually changing conditions. From the time you were born, the air you have breathed has been very gradually thinned, and its oxygen content reduced. Your lungs have compensated by becoming much greater in capacity, which is why your chests are so much larger than those of your teachers and attendants. When you are fully mature and are breathing air like that of Mars, the difference will be even greater. Your bodies are growing fur to enable you to stand the increasing cold. You are comfortable now under conditions which would kill ordinary people quickly. Since you were four years old, your nurses and teachers have had to wear special protection to survive conditions that seem normal to you. In another ten years, at maturity, you will be completely acclimated to Mars. Its air will be your air, its food plants your food, its extremes of temperature will be easy for you to endure, and its median temperatures pleasant to you. Already, because of the five years we spent in space under gradually decreased gravitational pull, the gravity of Mars seems normal to you. It will be your planet to live on and to populate. You are the children of Earth, but you are the first Martians. Of course, we had known a lot of those things already. The last year was the best. By then, the air inside the dome, except for the pressurized parts where our teachers and attendants live, was almost like that outside, and we were allowed out for increasingly long periods. It is good to be in the open. The last few months they relaxed segregation of the sexes, so we could begin choosing mates although they told us there is to be no marriage until after the final day, after our full clearance. Choosing was not difficult in my case. I had made my choice long since, and I'd felt sure that she felt the same way. I was right. Tomorrow is the day of our freedom. Tomorrow we will be Martians, the Martians. Tomorrow we shall take over the planet. Some among us are impatient, have been impatient for weeks now, but wiser counsel prevailed, and we are waiting. We have waited twenty years, and we can wait until the final day. And tomorrow is the final day. Tomorrow, at a signal, we will kill the teachers and the other earthmen among us before we go forth. They do not suspect, so it will be easy. We have dissimulated for years now, and they do not know how we hate them. They do not know how disgusting and hideous we find them, with their ugly, misshapen bodies, so narrow-shouldered and tiny-chested, their weak, sibilant voices that need amplification to carry in our Martian air, and above all, their white, pasty, hairless skins. We shall kill them, and then we shall go and smash the other dome, so all the Earthmen there will die too. If more Earthmen ever come to punish us, we can live and hide in the hills, where they'll never find us. And if they try to build more domes here, we'll smash them. We want no more to do with Earth. This is our planet, and we want no aliens. Keep off. End of Keep Out by Frederick Brown The Last Supper by T.D. Ham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Titus E. Garnett The Last Supper by T.D. Ham Hampered as she was by the child in her arms, the woman was running less fleetly now. A wave of exultation swept over Guldron, drowning out the uneasy feeling of guilt at disobeying orders. The instructions were mandatory and concise, no capture must be attempted individually. In the event of sighting any form of human life, the ship must be notified immediately. All small craft must be back at the landing space not later than one hour before takeoff. Anyone not so reporting will be presumed lost. 
Goldrin thought uneasily of the great seas of snow and ice sweeping inexorably toward each other since the earth had reversed on its axis in the great catastrophe a millennium ago. Now summer and winter alike brought paralyzing gales and blizzards, heralded by the sleety snow in which the woman's skin-clad feet had left the tracks which led to discovery. His trained anthropologist's mind speculated avidly over the little they had gotten from the younger of the two men found nearly a week before, nearly frozen and half-starved. The older man had succumbed almost at once. The other, in the most primitive sign language, had indicated that of several humans living in caves to the west. Only he and the other had survived to flee some mysterious terror. Goldrin felt a throb of pity for the woman and her child, left behind by the men, no doubt, as a hindrance. But what a stroke of fortune that there should be left a male and a female of the race to carry the seed of terror to another planet. And what a triumph if he, Goldrin, should be the one to return at the eleventh hour with the prize. No need of calling for help. This was no armed war party, but the most defenseless being in the universe a mother burdened with a child. Goldrin put on another burst of speed. His previous shouts had served only to spur the woman to greater efforts. Surely there was some magic word that had survived even the centuries of illiteracy, something equivalent to the bread and salt of all illiterate people. Cupping his hands to his mouth, he shouted, Food! Food! Ahead of him, the woman turned her head, leaping lightly in mid-stride and went on slowly a little, but still running doggedly. Goldrin's pulse leaped. He yelled again, Food! The instant that his foot touched the yielding surface of the trap, he knew that he had met defeat. As his body crashed down on the fire-sharpened stakes, he knew too the terror from which the last men of the human race had fled. Above him the woman looked down, her teeth gleaming wolfishly. She pointed down to the pit, spoke exultantly to the child. Food, said the last woman on earth. The End of the Last Supper by T.D. Ham Lighter Than You Think by Nelson Bond This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson Lighter Than You Think by Nelson Bond Some joker in the dear dead days, now virtually beyond recall, won two-bit immortality by declaring that what this country needs is a good five-cent cigar, which is, of course, Victorian malarkey. What this country really needs is a good five-cent nickel, or perhaps a good cigar-shaped spaceship. There's a fortune waiting somewhere out in space for the man who can get out there and claim it. A fortune! And if you think I'm just talking through my hat, lend an ear. Joyce started the whole thing. Or maybe I did, when for the umpteenth time I suggested she should marry me. She smiled in a way that showed she didn't disapprove of my persistence, but loosed a salvo of devastating negatives. No deal, she crisped decisively. No why? No dough. But sugar, I pleaded. Two can live as cheaply as one. This is true, replied Joyce, only of guppies. Understand, Don, I don't mind changing my name from Carter to Mallory. In fact, I'd rather like to but I have no desire whatever to be known to the neighbours as that poor little Mrs. Mallory in the last year's coat. I'll marry you, she continued firmly, when, as, and if you get a promotion. Her answer was by no stretch of the imagination a reason for loud cheers, handsprings and cartwheels, because I'm a federal employee. The United States Patent Office is my beat. There's one nice thing to be said about working for the bewhiskered old gentleman in the star-spangled stovepipe and striped breeches. It's permanent. Once you get your name inscribed on the list of civil service employees, it takes an act of Congress to blast it off again. 
and of course I don't have to remind you how long it takes that body of vote-happy windbags to act. Terrapins in treacle are grease lightning by comparison. But advancement is painfully slow in a department where discharges are unheard of and resignations rare. When I started clerking for this madhouse, I was assistant to the assistant chief clerk's assistant. Now, ten years later, by dint of mighty effort and a cultivated facility for avoiding senatorial investigations, I've succeeded in losing only one of those redundant adjectives. Being my secretary, Joyce certainly realized this, but women have a remarkable ability to separate business and pleasure. So, a promotion, she insisted, or at least a good substantial raise. In case you don't know it, I told her gloomily, you are displaying a lamentably vulgar interest in one of life's lesser values. Happiness, not money, should be man's chief goal. What good is happiness, demanded Joyce, if you can't buy money with it? Why hoard lucre? I sniffed. You can't take it with you. In that case, said Joyce flatly, I'm not going. There's no use arguing, Don. I've made up my mind. At this moment, our dreary little impasse was ended by a sudden tumult outside my office. There was a squealing shriek, the shuffle of footsteps, the pounding of fists upon my door, and over all the shrill tones of an old familiar voice high-pitched in triumph. Let me in. I've got to see him instantaneously. This time I've got it. I've absolutely got it. Joyce and I gasped, then broke simultaneously for the door as it flew open to reveal a tableau resembling the Laocoon group sans snake and party of the third part. Back to the door, and struggling valiantly to defend it, stood the receptionist, Miss Thomas. Held briefly but volubly at bay was a red-thatched, buck-toothed individual, and I do mean individual, with a face like a map of error, who stopped wrestling as he saw us and grinned delightedly. "'Hello, Mr. Mallory,' he said. "'Hi, Miss Joyce.' "'Pat!' we both cried at once. "'Pat Pending!' Miss Thomas, a relative newcomer to our bellywick, seemed baffled by the warmth of our greeting. She entered the office with our visitor, and as Joyce and I pump-handled him enthusiastically, she asked, You, you know this gentleman, Mr. Mallory? I should say we do, I chortled. Pat, you old naughty word. Where on earth have you been hiding lately? Surely you've heard of the great Patrick Pending, Miss Thomas? Pending? faltered Miss Thomas. I seem to have heard the name, or seen it somewhere. Pat beamed upon her companionably. Stepping to my desk, he upended the typewriter and pointed to a legend in tiny letters stamped into the frame. Reg, U.S. Pat off, Pat pending. Here, perhaps, he suggested. I invented this, and the airplane, and the automobile, and, oh, ever so many things. You'll find my name inscribed on every one. I, he announced modestly, and Pat Pending, the greatest inventulator of all time. Miss Thomas stared at me, goggle-eyed. Is he? she demanded. I mean, did he? I nodded solemnly. Not only those, but a host of other marvels. The bacular clock, the transmatter, the predictograph. Miss Thomas turned on Pat, a gaze of fawning admiration. How wonderful, she breathed. Oh, nothing really, said Pat, wriggling. But it is. Most of the things brought here are so absurd. Automatic hat tippers, self-defrosting galoshes, punching bags that defend themselves. Disdainfully, she indicated the display collection of screwball items we call our chamber of horrors. It's simply marvellous to meet a man who has invented things really worthwhile. Honestly, the look in her eyes was sickening. But was Pat nauseated? Not he. The big goon was lapping it up like a famished feline. His simpering smirk stretched from ear to there as he murmured, Now, Miss Thomas. Sandra, Mr. Pending, she sighed softly. To you just plain Sandy, please? Well, Sandy, Pat gulped. I said disgustedly, Look, you two, break it up. Love at first sight is wonderful in books, but in a federal office I'm pretty sure it's unconstitutional, and it may be subversive. Would you mind coming down to earth? Pat, you barged in here, squalling about some new invention, is that correct? 
With an effort, Pat wrenched his gaze from his newfound admirer and nodded soberly. That's right, Mr. Mallory, and a great one, too, one that will revolutionate the world. Will you give me an applicatious form, please? I want to file it immediately. Not so fast, Pat. You know the routine. What's the nature of this remarkable discovery? You may write it down, said Pat grandiloquently, as Pat Pending's lightning rod. I glanced at Joyce, and she at me, then both of us at Pending. But Pat, I exclaimed, that's ridiculous. Ben Franklin invented the lightning rod two hundred years ago. I said lightning, retorted my red-headed friend, not lightning. My invention doesn't conduct electricity to the ground, but from it. He brandished a slim baton, which until then I had assumed to be an ordinary walking stick. With this, he claimed, I can make things weigh as much or as little as I please. The eyes of Sandy Thomas needed only jet propulsion to become flying saucers. Isn't he wonderful, Mr. Mallory, she gasped. But her enthusiasm wasn't contagious. I glowered at Pending coldly. Oh, come now, Pat, I scoffed. You can't really believe that yourself. After all, there are such things as basic principles. Weight is not a variable factor, and so far as I know, Congress hasn't repealed the law of gravity. Pat sighed regretfully. You're always so hard to convince, Mr. Mallory, he complained. But, oh well, take this. He handed me the baton. I stared at it curiously. It looked rather like a British swagger stick. Slim, dainty, well balanced. But the ornamental gadget at its top was not commonplace. It seemed to be a knob or a dial of some kind, divided into segments scored with vernier markings. I gazed at Pending, askance. Well, Pat, what now? How much do you weigh, Mr. Mallory? One sixty-five, I answered. You're sure of that? I'm not, but my bathroom scales appear to be this morning. Why? Do you think Miss Joyce could lift you? I said thoughtfully. Well, that's an idea, but I doubt it. She won't even let me try to support her. I'm serious, Mr. Mallory. Do you think she could lift you with one hand? Don't be silly, of course not. Nor could you. That's where you're wrong, said Pending firmly. She can and will. He reached forward suddenly and twisted the metal cap on the stick in my hands. As he did so, I loosed a cry of alarm and almost dropped the baton, for instantaneously I experienced a startling, flighty giddiness a sudden loss of weight that made me feel as if my soles were treading on sponge rubber, my shoulders sprouting wings. Hold on to it, cried Pat, then to Joyce. Lift him, Miss Joyce. Joyce faltered. How? Like th this? And touched a finger to my midriff. Immediately my feet left the floor. I started flailing futilely to trample six inches of ozone back to the solid floorboards, to no avail. With no effort whatever, Joyce raised me high above her head until my dazed dome was shedding dandruff on the ceiling. Well, Mr. Mallory, said Pat, do you believe me now? Get me down out of here, I howled. You know I can't stand high places. You now weigh less than ten pounds. Never mind the statistics. I feel like a circus balloon. How do I get down again? Turn the knob on the cane, advised Pat, to your normal weight. Careful now, not so fast. His warning came too late. I hit the deck with a resounding thud, and the cane came clattering after. Pat retrieved it hurriedly, inspected it to make sure it was not damaged. I glared at him as I picked myself off the floor. You might show some interest in me, I grumbled. I doubt if that stick will need a liniment rubdown tonight. Okay, Pat. You're right, and I'm wrong, as you usually are. That modern variation of a witch's broomstick does operate, only how? That dial at the top governs weight, explained Pat. When you turn it, skip that. I know how it is operated. I want to know what makes it work. Well, explained Pat, I'm not certain I can make it clear, but it's all tied up with the elemental scientific problems of mass, weight, gravity, and electric energy. What is electricity, for example? I used to know, I frowned, but I forget. Joyce shook her head sorrowfully. Friends, she intoned, let us all bow our heads. 
This is a moment of great tragedy. The only man in the world who ever knew what electricity is, and he has forgotten. That's the whole point, agreed Pending. No one knows what electricity really is. All we know is how to use it. Einstein has demonstrated that the force of gravity and electrical energy are kindred, perhaps different aspects of a common phenomenon. That was my starting point. So this rod, which enables you to defy the law of gravity, is electrical? Electricaceous, corrected Pat. You see, I have transmogrified the polarifity of certain ingredulous cellulations, a series of disentrigulated helicosities, activated by hypermagnetation, set up a disruptular wave motion which results in counter-gravity. And there you are. 99% of the time, Pat Pending talks like a normal human being, but asking him to explain the mechanism of one of his inventions and linguistic hell breaks loose. He begins jabbering like a schizophrenic parrot reading a Sanskrit dictionary backward. I sighed and surrendered all hope of ever actually learning how his great new discovery worked. I turn my thoughts to more important matters. Okay, Pat, we'll dismiss the details as trivial and get down to brass tacks. What is your invention used for? Eh? said the redhead. It is not enough that the idea is practicable, I pointed out. It must also be practical to be of any value in this frenzied modern era. What good is your invention? What good, demanded Joyce, is a newborn baby? Don't change the subject, I suggested. Or come to think of it, maybe you should. At the diaper level, life is just one damp thing after another. But how to turn Pat's brainchild into cold, hard cash? That's the question before the board now. Individual fly tell us Superman? No dice. I can testify from personal experience that once you get up there, you're completely out of control, and I can't see any sense in humans trying to fly with jet flames, scorching their base of operations. Elevators, derricks, building cranes? Possible. But lifting a couple hundred pounds is one thing. Lifting a few tons is a horse of a different colour. No, Pat. I continued, I don't see just how... Sandy Thomas squeaked suddenly and grasped my arm. That's it, Mr. Mallory, she cried. That's it. Huh? What's what? You wanted to know how Pat could make money from his invention. You've just answered your own question. I have? Horses. Horse racing, to be exact. You've heard of handicaps, haven't you? I'm overwhelmed with them, I nodded wearily. A secretary who repulses my honourable advances, a receptionist who squeals in my ear. Listen, Mr. Mallory, what's the last thing horses do before they go to the post? Check the tote board, I said promptly, to find out if I've got any money on them. Horses hate me. They formed an equine conspiracy to prove to me the ancient adage that a fool and his money are soon parted. Wait a minute, chimed in Joyce thoughtfully. I know what Sandy means. They weigh in. Is that right? Exactly. The more weight a horse is bearing, the slower it runs. That's the purpose of handicapping. But if a horse was supposed to be carrying more than a hundred pounds was actually carrying only ten... Well, you see... Sandy paused, breathless. I stared at her with a gathering respect. Never underestimate the power of a woman, I said, when it comes to devising new and ingenious methods of perpetrating petty larceny. There's only one small fly in the ointment, so far as I can see. How do we convince some racehorse owner that he should become a party to this gentle felony? Oh, you don't have to, smiled Sandy cheerfully. I'm already convinced. You? You own a horse? Yes, haven't you ever heard of tap water? Oh, sure, that drip's running all the time. Joyce tossed me a reproving glance. This is a matter of gravity, Donald, she stated and you keep treating it with levity. Sandy, do you really own Tapwater? He's the colt who won the Monmouth Futurity, isn't he? That's right, and four other starts this season. That's been our big trouble. He shows such promise that the judges have placed him under a terrific weight handicap. To run in next week's gold stakes, for instance, he would have to carry 124 pounds. I was hesitant to enter him because of that, but with Pat's new invention... She turned to Pat, eyes glowing. He could enter and win. Pat said uncertainly, I don't know. 
I don't like gambling, and it doesn't seem quite ethical somehow. I asked Sandy, suppose he ran carrying 124. What would be the probable odds? High, she replied, very high, perhaps as high as 40 to 1. In that case, I decided, it's not only ethical, it's a moral obligation. If you're opposed to gambling, Pat, what better way can you think of to put the parimutuals out of business? And besides, Sandy pointed out, this would be a wonderful opportunity to display your new discovery before an audience of thousands. Well, Pat, what do you say? Pat hesitated, caught a glimpse of Sandy's pleading eyes and was lost. Very well, he said, we'll do it. Mr. Mallory, enter Tapwater in the Gold States. We'll put on the most spectacious exhibition in the history of gambling. Thus it was that approximately one week later, my piratical little crew was assembled once again, this time in the paddock at Laurel. In case you're an inland aborigine, let me explain that Laurel Racetrack, from the township of the same name, is where horse fanciers from the District of Columbia go to abandon their capital, and capital, on weekends. We were briefing our jockey, a scrawny youth with a pair of oversized ears, on the use of Pat's lightning rod. Being short on grey matter as well as on stature, he wasn't getting it at all. You mean, he said for the third or thirty-third time, you don't want I should hit the nag with this bat? Heavens, no, gasped Pat, blanching. It's much too delicate for that. Don't fool yourself, mister. Horses can stand a lot of leather. Not the horse, stupid, I said. The bat. This is the only riding crop of its kind in the world. We don't want it damaged. All you have to do is carry it. We'll do the rest. How about setting the dial, Don? asked Joyce. Pat will do that just before the horses move on to the track. Now let's get going. It's way in time. We moved to the scales with our rider. He stepped aboard the platform, complete with silks and saddle, and the spinner leaped to a staggering 102, whereupon the officials started gravely handling him little leather sacks. What's this? I whispered to Sandy. Prizes for malnutrition? He must have won all the blackjacks east of the Mississippi. The handicap, she whispered back, lead weights at one pound each. If he starts to lose, I ruminated, they'd make wonderful ammunition. One hundred and twenty-four, announced the chief weigherina. Next entry. We returned to Tapwater. The jockey fastened the weights to his gear, saddled up and mounted. From the track came the traditional bugle call. Sandy nodded to Pat. All right, Pat, now. Pending twisted the knob of his lightning rod and handed the stick to the jockey. The little horseman gasped, rose three inches in his stirrup and almost let go of the baton. Hey, he exclaimed, I feel funny, I feel... Never mind that, I told him. Just you hold on to that rod until the race is over, and when you come back, give it to Pat immediately. Understand? Yes, but I feel so, so light-headed. That's because you're feather-brained, I advised him. Now, get going. Giddy up, Dobbin. I patted Tapwater's flank, and so help me Newton, I think that one gentle tap pushed the colt halfway to the starting gate. He pattered across the turf with a curious bouncing gait, as if he were running on tiptoe. We hastened to our seats in the grandstand. Did you get all the bets down? asked Joyce. I nodded and displayed a deck of ducats. It may not have occurred to you, my sweet, I announced gleefully, but these pasteboards are transferable on demand to rice and old shoes, the sweet strains of Oh Promise Me and the scent of orange blossoms. You insisted I should have a nest egg before you would murmur I do. Well, after this race, these tickets will be worth... I cast a swift glance at the tote board's closing odds, quoting Tapwater at 35 to 1. Approximately $70,000. Donald, gasped Joyce, you didn't bet all your savings. Every cent, I told her cheerfully. Why not? But if something should go wrong, if Tapwater should lose, he won't. See what I mean? For even as we were talking, the bell jangled, the crowd roared, and the horses were off. Eight entries surged from the starting gate, and already one full length out in front pranced the weight-free, light-foot Tapwater. At the quarter post, our colt had stretched his lead to three lengths, and I shouted in Pending's ear, How much does that jockey weigh, anyway? 
About six pounds, said Pat. I turned the knob to cancel one eighteen. At the half, all the other horses could glimpse of Tapwater was heels. At the three-quarter post, he was so far ahead that the jockey must have been lonely. As he rounded into the stretch, I caught a binocular view of his face, and he looked dazed and a little frightened. He wasn't actually riding Tapwater. The colt was simply skimming home, and he was holding on for dear life to make sure he didn't blow off the horse's back. The result was a foregone conclusion, of course. Tapwater crossed the finish line, nine lengths ahead, setting a new track record. The crowd went wild. Over the hubbub, I clutched Pat's arm and bawled, I'll go collect our winnings, hurry down to the track and swap that lightning rod for the real bat we brought along. He'll have to weigh out again, you know. Scoot. The others vanished paddockward as I went for the big payoff. It was dreary at the totalizer windows. I was one of a scant handful who had bet on tap water, so it took no time at all to scoop into the valise I had brought along the 70,000 bucks in crisp green lettuce, which an awed teller passed across the counter. Then I hurried back to join the others in the winner's circle, where bedlam was not only raining, but pouring. Flash bulbs were popping all over the place. Cameramen were screaming for just one more of the jockey, the owner, the fabulous tap water. The officials were vainly striving to quiet the tumult so they could award the prize. I found Pending worming his way out of the heart of the crowd. Did you get it? I demanded. He nodded, thrust the knobbed baton into my hand. You substituted the normal one? Again, he nodded. Hastily, I thrust the lightning rod out of sight into my valise, and we elbowed forward to share the triumphant moment. It was a great experience. I felt giddy with joy. I was walking on the pink clouds of happiness. Security was mine, at last, and Joyce as well. Ladies and gentlemen, cried the chief official, your attention, please. Today we have witnessed a truly spectacular feat, the setting of a new track record by a champion racing under a tremendous handicap. I give you a magnificent racehorse, Tapwater. That's right, folks, I bawled, carried away by the excitement. Give this little horse a big hand. Setting the example, I laid down the bag, started clapping vigorously. From a distance, I heard Pat Pending's agonized scream. Mr. Mallory, the suitcase, grab it. I glanced down, belatedly aware of the danger of theft, but too late. The bag had disappeared. Hey, I yelled. Who swiped my bag? Police. Up there, Mr. Mallory, bawled Pat. Jump. I glanced skyward. Three feet above my head and rising swiftly was the valise in which I had cashed not only our winnings but Pat's gravity-defying rod. I leaped, but in vain. I was still making feeble, futile efforts to make like the moon-hurdling nursery rhyme cow when quite a while later two strong young men in white jackets came and jabbed me with a sedative. Later, when time and barbiturates had dulled the biting edge of my despair, we assembled once again in my office, and I made my apologies to my friends. It was my fault, I acknowledged. I should have realized Pat hadn't readjusted the rod when I placed it in my bag. It felt lighter, but I was so excited. It was my fault, mourned Pat, for not changing it immediately, but I was afraid someone might see me. Perhaps if we hired an airplane, I suggested. Pat shook his head. No, Mr. Mallory. The rod was set to cancel 118 pounds. The bag weighed less than 20. It will go miles beyond the reach of any airplane before it settles into an orbit around Earth. Well, there goes my dreamed of fortune, I said sadly, accompanied by the fading strains of an unplayed wedding march. I'm sorry, Joyce. Isn't there one thing you folks are overlooking? asked Sandy Thomas. My goodness, you'd think we had lost our last cent just because that little old bag flew away. For your information, I told her, that is precisely what happened to me. My entire bank account vanished into the wild blue yonder, and some of Pat's money too. But have you forgotten, she insisted, that we won the race? Of course the track officials were a wee bit suspicious when your suitcase took off, but they couldn't prove anything. So they paid me the gold stakes prize. If we split it four ways, we all make a nice little profit. Or, she added, if you and Joyce want to make yours a double share, we could split it three ways. Or, she continued hopefully, if Pat wants to, we could make it two double shares and split it fifty-fifty. 
From the look in Pat's eyes, I knew he was stunned by this possibility, and from the look in hers, I felt she was going to make every effort to take advantage of his bewilderment. So, as I said before, what this country needs is a good cigar-shaped spaceship. There's a fortune waiting somewhere out in space for the man who can go out there and claim it, 70,000 bucks in cold, hard cash, indubitatiously. End of Lighter Than You Think by Nelson Bond Lost in Translation by Larry Harris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. Lost in Translation by Larry M. Harris. In language translation, you may get a literally accurate word for word translation, but miss the meaning entirely. And in space type translation, the effect may be the same. The cell had been put together more efficiently than any Corbin had ever been in. But that was only natural, he told himself sadly. The Trend were an efficient people. All the preliminary reports had agreed on that. Their efficiency, as a matter of fact, was what had made Corvin's arrival a necessity. They were well into the atomic era and were on the verge of developing space travel. Before long they'd be settling the other planets of their system and then the nearer stars. Faster than light travel couldn't be far away for the magnificently efficient physical scientists of the Trend and that would mean, in the ordinary course of events, an invitation to join the comedy of planets. An invitation to comedy was sure, which the Tren would not accept. Corvin stretched out on the cell's single bunk, a rigid affair which was hardly meant for comfort, and sighed. He'd had three days of isolation, with nothing to do but explore the resources of his own mind. He tried some of the ancient Rhine experiments, but that was no good. He still didn't show any particular psi talents. He couldn't unlock the cell door with his unaided mind. He couldn't even alter the probability of a single dust mote's Brownian path through the somewhat smelly air. Nor could he disappear from his cell and appear as if by magic several miles away near the slightly damaged hulk of his ship to the wonder and amazement of his trend captors. He could do, as a matter of fact, precisely nothing. He wished quietly that the Trent had seen fit to give him a pack of cards or a book or even a folder of tourist pictures. The wonders of Trent, according to all the advance reports, were likely to be pretty boring, but they'd have been better than nothing. In any decently run jail, he told himself with indignation, there would at least have been other prisoners to talk to. But on Trent, Corbin was all alone. True, every night the guards came in and gave him a concentrated lesson in the local language, but Corbin failed to get much pleasure out of that, being unconscious at the time. But now he was equipped to discuss almost anything from philosophy to plumbing, but there was nobody to discuss it with. He changed position on the bunk and stared at the walls. The trend were efficient. There weren't even any imperfections in the smooth surface to distract him. He wasn't tired, and he wasn't hungry. His captors had left him with a full stock of food concentrates. But he was almightily bored, and about ready to tell anything to anyone, just for the chance at a little conversation. As he reached this dismal conclusion, the cell door opened. Corbin got up off the bunk in a hurry and spun around to face his visitor. The trend was tall and slightly green. He looked, as all the trend did, vaguely humanoid, that is, if you don't bother to examine him closely. Life in the universe appeared to be rigidly limited to humanoid types on oxygen planets. Corvin didn't know why, and neither did anybody else. There were a lot of theories, but none that accounted for all the facts satisfactorily. Corvin really didn't care about it. It was none of his business. The trend regarded him narrowly through cat-like pupils. You are Corvin, he said. It was a ritual, Corvin had learned. You are of the Tren, he replied. The green being nodded. 
"'I am Didyak of the Trend,' he said. Amenities over, he relaxed slightly, but no more than slightly, and came into the cell, closing the door behind him. Corvin thought of jumping the trend, but decided quickly against it. He was a captive, and it was unwise to assume that his captors had no more resources than the ones he saw. A small translucent pistol-like affair in a holster at the trend's side, and a small knife in a sheath at the belt. Those Corvin could deal with, but there might be almost anything else hidden and ready to fire on him. "'What do you want with me?' Corvin said. The Trend's speech, apparently there was only one language on the planet, was stiff and slightly awkward, but easily enough learned under drug hypnosis. It was the most rigorously logical construction of its kind Corvin had ever come across. It reminded him of some of the mathematical meta-languages he'd dealt with back on Earth in training but it was more closely and carefully constructed than even those marvels. "'I want nothing with you,' Didyak said, leaning against the door-frame. "'You have other questions?' Corbin sighed. "'What are you doing here, then?' he asked. As conversation, it wasn't very choice, but it was, he admitted, better than solitude. "'I am leaning against the door,' Didyak said. The trend literalist approach to the smallest problems of everyday living was a little hard to get the hang of, Corvin told himself bitterly. He thought for a second. Why did you come to me? he said at last. Didyak beamed at him. The sight was remarkably unpleasant, involving as it did the disclosure of the Tren fifty-eight teeth, mostly pointed. Corvin stared back impassively. I have been ordered to come to you, Didyak said, by the ruler. The ruler wishes to talk with you. It wasn't quite talk. That was a general word in the trend language, and Didyak had used a specific meaning roughly, gain information from, by peaceful and vocal means. Corvin filed it away for future reference. Why did the ruler not come to me? Corvin asked. The ruler is the ruler, Didyak said, slightly discomfited. You are to go to him. Such is his command. Corvin shrugged, sighed, and smoothed back his hair. I obeyed the command of the ruler, he said, another ritual. Everybody obeyed the command of the ruler. If you didn't, you never had a second chance to try. But Corvin meant exactly what he'd said. He was going to obey the commands of the ruler of the trend, and remove the trend threat from the rest of the galaxy forever. That, after all, was his job. The room of the ruler was large, square, and excessively brown. The walls were dark brown, the furnishings, a single great chair, several kneeling benches, and a small table near the chair, were light brown of some metallic substance, and even the drapes were tan. It was, Corvin decided, much too much of a bad idea, even when the color contrast of the trend themselves were figured in. The ruler himself, a trend over seven feet tall and correspondingly broad, sat in the great chair, his four fingers tapping gently on the table near him, staring at Corvin and his guards. The guards stood on either side of their captive, looking as impassive as jade statues six and a half feet high. Corvin wasn't attempting to escape. He wasn't pleading with the ruler. He wasn't defying the ruler, either. He was just answering questions. The Tren liked to have everything clear. They were a logical race. The ruler had started with Corvin's race, his name, his sex, if any, and whether or not his appearance were normal for humanity. Corvin was answering the last question. Some men are larger than I am, he said, and some are smaller. Within what limits? Corvin shrugged. Some are over eight feet tall, he said, and others under four feet. He used the trend measurement scale, of course. It didn't seem necessary, though, to mention that both extremes of height were at the circus freak level. Then there is a group of humans, he went on, who are never more than a foot and a half in height, and usually less than that, approximately nine or ten inches. We call these children, he volunteered helpfully. Approximately, the ruler growled. We asked for precision here, he said. We are scientific men. We are exact. Corbin nodded hurriedly. 
our race is more more approximate he said apologetically slipshot the ruler muttered undoubtedly corbin agreed politely i'll try to do the best i can for you you will answer my questions the ruler said with exactitude he paused frowning slightly you landed your ship on this planet he went on why my job required it corbin said a clumsy lie the ruler said the ship crashed our examinations prove that beyond any doubt true corbin said and it is your job to crash your ship the ruler said wasteful corbin shrugged again what i say is true he announced do you have tests for such matters we do the ruler told him we are an exact and a scientific race a machine for the testing of truth has been adjusted to your physiology it will be attached to you corbin looked around and saw it coming through the door pushed by two technicians it was large and squat and metallic and it had wheels dials blinking lights tubes and wires and a seat with armrests and straps. It was obviously a form of lie detector, and Corbin felt himself marveling again at this race. Earth science had nothing to match their enormous command of the physical universe, adapting a hypnopedic language course to an alien being so quickly had been wondering enough, but adapting the perilously delicate mechanisms that necessarily made up any lie detector machinery was almost a miracle. The trend, under other circumstances, would have been a valuable addition to the comedy of nations. Being what they were, though, they could only be a menace. And Corbin's appreciation of the size of that menace was growing hourly. He hoped the lie detector had been adjusted correctly. If it showed him telling an untruth, he wasn't likely to live long, and his job, not to mention the strongest personal inclinations, demanded most strongly that he stay alive. He swallowed hard. But when the technicians forced him down into the seat, buckled straps around him, attached wires and electrodes and elastic bands to him at the appropriate places, and tightened some final screws, he made no resistance. We shall test the machine, the ruler said. In what room are you? In the room of the ruler, Corbin said equably. Are you standing or sitting? I am sitting. Corbin said. Are you a Chulad? the ruler asked. A Chulad was a small native pet Corbin knew, something like a great name magnified Death Watch beetle. I am not, he said. The ruler looked to his technicians for a signal and nodded on receiving it. You will tell an untruth now, he said. Are you standing or sitting? I am standing, Corbin said. The technicians gave another signal. The ruler looked in his frowning manner, reasonably satisfied. The machine, he announced, has been adjusted satisfactorily to your physiology. The questioning will now continue. Corbin swallowed again. The test hadn't really seemed extensive enough to him. But after all, the trend knew their business better than anyone else could know it. They had the technique and the logic and the training. He hoped they were right. The ruler was frowning at him. Corbin did his best to look receptive. Why did you land your ship on this planet? the ruler said. My job required it, Corbin said. The ruler nodded. Your job is to crash your ship, he said. It is wasteful, but the machines tell me it is true. Very well, then. We shall find out more about your job. Was the crash intentional? Corbin looked sober. Yes, he said. The ruler blinked. Very well, he said. Was your job ended when the ship crashed? The trend word, of course, wasn't ended, nor did it mean exactly that. As nearly as Corbin could make out, it meant disposed of for all time. No, he said. What else does your job entail? the ruler said. Corbin decided to throw his first spoke into the wheel. Staying alive. The ruler roared. Do not waste time with the obvious, he shouted. Do not try to trick us. We are a logical and scientific race. Answer correctly. I have told the truth, Corbin said. But it is not, not the truth we want, the ruler said. Corbin shrugged. I replied to your question, he said. I did not know that there was more than one kind of truth. Surely the truth is the truth, just as the ruler is the ruler? I 
the ruler stopped himself in mid-roar. "'You try to confuse the ruler,' he said at last, in an approximation of his usual one. "'But the ruler will not be confused. We have experts in matters of logic. The trend word seemed to mean right saying. Who will advise the ruler? They will be called. Corvin's guards were standing around doing nothing of importance now that their captor was strapped down in the lie detector. The ruler gestured, and they went out the door in a hurry. The ruler looked down at Corbin. "'You will find that you cannot trick us,' he said. "'You will find that such fiddling, should a like Corbin translated, attempts will get you nowhere.' Corbin devoutly hoped so. The experts in logic arrived shortly, and in no uncertain terms Corvin was given to understand that logical paradox was not going to confuse anybody on the planet. The barber who did or didn't shave himself, the secretary of the club whose members were secretaries, Achilles and the tortoise, and all the other lovely paradox models scattered around were so much primer material for the trend. They can be treated mathematically, one of the experts, a small emerald green being, told Corbin thinly. Of course, you would not understand the mathematics. But that is not important. You need only understand that we cannot be confused by such means. Good, Corbin said. The experts blinked. Good, he said. Naturally, Corbin said in a friendly tone. The expert frowned horribly, showing all of his teeth. Corvin did his best not to react. "'Your plan is a failure,' the expert said, "'and you call this a good thing. You can mean only that your plan is different from the one we are occupied with.' "'True,' Corvin said. There was a short silence. The expert beamed. He examined the indicators of the lie detector with great care. "'What is your plan?' he said at last, in a conspiratorial whisper. "'To answer your questions, truthfully and logically corbin said the silence this time was even longer the machine says that you tell the truth the expert said at last in an awed tone thus you must be a traitor to your native planet you must want us to conquer your planet and have come here secretly to wait us corbin was very glad that wasn't the question it was after all the only logical deduction but it happened to be wrong the name of your planet is Earth? the ruler asked. A few minutes had passed. The experts were clustered around the single chair. Corbin was still strapped to the machine. A logical race makes use of a traitor, but a logical race does not trust him. Sometimes, Corbin said. It is other names? the ruler said. It has no name, Corbin said truthfully. The trend idiom was like the earthly one and certainly a planet had no name. People attached names to it, that was all. It had none of its own. "'Yet you call it Earth,' the ruler said. "'I do,' Corbin said, "'for convenience.' "'Do you know its location?' the ruler said. "'Not with exactitude,' Corbin said. There was a stir. "'But you can find it again,' the ruler said. "'I can,' Corbin said. "'And you will tell us about it?' the ruler went on. "'I will,' Corbin said, "'so far as I am able. We will wish to know about weapons,' the ruler said, and about plans and fortifications. But we must first know of the manner of decision on this planet. Is your planet joined with others in a government, or does it exist alone?' Corbin nearly smiled. "'Both,' he said. A short silence was broken by one of the attendant experts. We have theorized that an underling may be permitted to make some of his own decisions, leaving only the more extensive ones for the master. This seems to us inefficient and liable to error, yet it is a possible system. Is it the system you mean? Very sharp, Corbin told himself grimly. It is, he said. Then the government which reigns over several planets is supreme, the ruler said. It is, Corbin said. Who is it that governs? the ruler said. The key question had at last been asked. Corvin felt grateful that the logical trend had determined to begin from the beginning, instead of going off after details of armament first. It saved a lot of time. The answer to that question, Corvin said, cannot be given to you. Any question of fact has an answer, the ruler snapped. A paradox is not involved here. 
a government exists and some being is the governor. Perhaps several beings share this task. Perhaps machines do the work. But where there is a government, there is a governor. Is this agreed? Certainly, Corbin said. It is completely obvious and true. The planet from which you come is part of a system of planets which are governed, you have said, the ruler went on. True, Corbin said. Then there is a governor for this system, the ruler said. True, Corbin said again. The ruler sighed gently. Explain this governor to us, he said. Corbin shrugged. The explanation cannot be given to you. The ruler turned to a group of his experts, and a short muttered conversation took place. At its end the ruler turned his gaze back to Corbin. Is the deficiency in you, he said, are you in some way unable to describe this government? It can be described, Corbin said. Then you will suffer unpleasant consequences if you describe it to us, the ruler went on. I will not, Corbin said. It was the signal for another conference. With some satisfaction, Corbin noticed that the trend were becoming slightly puzzled. They were no longer moving and speaking with calm assurance. The plan was taking hold. The ruler had finished his conference. You are attempting again to confuse us, he said. Corbin shook his head earnestly. I am attempting, he said, not to confuse you. Then I ask for an answer, the ruler said. I request that I be allowed to ask a question, Corbin said. The ruler hesitated, then nodded. Ask it, he said. We shall answer it if we see fit to do so. Corbin tried to look grateful. Well, then, he said, what is your government? The ruler beckoned to a heavy-set green being, who stepped forward from a knot of trend, inclined his head in Corvin's direction, and began. Our government is the only logical form of government, he said in a high, sweet tenor. The ruler orders all, and his subjects obey. In this way uniformity is gained, and this uniformity aids in the speed of possible action and in the weight of action. All trend act instantly in the same manner. The ruler is adopted by the previous ruler. In this way we are assured of a common wisdom and a steady judgment. You have heard our government defined, the ruler said. Now you will define yours for us. Corvin shook his head. If you insist, he said, I'll try it, but you won't understand it. The ruler frowned. We shall understand, he said. Begin. Who governs you? None, Corbin said. But you are governed. Corbin nodded. Yes. Then there is a governor, the ruler insisted. True, Corbin said, but everyone is the governor. Then there is no government, the ruler said. There is no single decision. No, Corbin said equably. There are many decisions binding on all. Who makes them binding, the ruler asked. Who forces you to accept these decisions? Some of them must be unfavorable to some beings. Many of them are unfavorable, Corbin said. But we are not forced to accept them. Do you act against your own interests? Corbin shrugged. Not knowingly, he said. The ruler flashed a look at the technicians handling the lie detector. Corbin turned to see their expression. They needed no words. The lie detector was telling them, perfectly obviously, that he was speaking the truth. But the truth wasn't making any sense. I told you you wouldn't understand it, he said. It is a defect in your explanation, the ruler almost snarled. My explanation is as exact as it can be, he said. The ruler breathed gustily. Let us try something else, he said. Everyone is the governor. Do you share a single mind? A racial mind has been theorized, though we have met with no examples. Neither have we, Corvin said. We are all individuals like yourselves. But with no single ruler to form policy, to make decisions. We have no need of one, Corvin said calmly. Ah, the ruler said suddenly, as if he saw daylight ahead. And why not? We call our form of government democracy, Corbin said. It means the rule of the people. There is no need for another ruler. One of the experts piped up suddenly. The beings themselves rule each other, he said. This is clearly impossible. 
for no one being can have the force to compel acceptance of his commands. Without his force there can be no effective rule. That is our form of government, Corbin said. You are lying, the expert said. One of the technicians chimed in. The machine tells us. The machine is faulty, the expert said. It will be corrected. Corvin wondered, as the technicians argued, how long they'd take studying the machine before they realized it didn't have any defects to correct. He hoped it wasn't going to be too long. He could foresee another stretch of boredom coming. And besides, he was getting homesick. It took three days, but boredom never really had a chance to set in. Corvin found himself the object of more attention than he had hoped for. One by one, the experts came to his cell, each with a different method of resolving the obvious contradictions in his statements. Some of them went away fuming. Others simply went away puzzled. On the third day, Corvin escaped. It wasn't very difficult. He hadn't thought it would be. Even the most logical of thinking beings has a subconscious as well as a conscious mind. And one of the ways of dealing with an insoluble problem is to make the problem disappear. There were only two ways of doing that, and killing the problem's main focus was a little more complicated. That couldn't be done by the subconscious mind. The conscious had to intervene somewhere. And it couldn't. Because that would mean recognizing, fully and consciously, that the problem was insoluble, and the trend weren't capable of that sort of thinking. Corbin thanked his lucky stars that their genius had been restricted to their physical and mathematical. Any insight at all into the mental sciences would have given them the key to his existence and his entire plan within seconds. But then it was lack of that insight that had called for this particular plan, that and the political structure of the trend. The same lack of insight let the trend subconscious work on his escape without any annoying distractions in the way of deep reflection. Someone left a door unlocked and a weapon nearby, all quite intent, Corvin was sure. Getting to the ship was a little more complicated, but presented no new problems. He was airborne and then spaceborne inside of a few hours after leaving the cell. He set his course, relaxed, and cleared his mind. He had no psionic talents, but the men at Earth Central did. He couldn't receive messages, but he could send them. He sent one now. Mission accomplished. The Tren aren't about to come marauding out into space too soon. They've been given food for thought, nice indigestible food that's going to stick in their craws until they finally manage to digest it. But they can't digest it and stay what they are. You've got to be democratic to some extent to understand the idea. What keeps us obeying laws we ourselves make? What keeps us obeying laws that make things inconvenient for us? Sheer self-interest, of course, but try to make a trend see it. With one government and one language, they just weren't equipped for translation. They were too efficient physically to try for the mental sciences at all. No mental sciences, no insight into my mind or their own, and that means no translation. But damn it, I wish I were home already. I'm bored absolutely stiff. End of Lost in Translation by Larry Harris. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Of Time and Texas by William F. Nolan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Justin Daniels Of Time and Texas by William F. Nolan In one fell swoop, declared Professor C. Sidwick Ohms, releasing a thin blue ribbon of pipe smoke and rocking back on his heels, I intend to solve the greatest problem facing mankind today. Colonizing the polar wastes was a messy and fruitless business, and the enforced birth control program couldn't be enforced. Overpopulation still remains the thorn in our side. Gentlemen, he paused to look each of the assembled reporters in the eye, there is but one answer. 
Mass annihilation, quavered a cub reporter. Posh boy, certainly not, the professor bristled. The answer is time. Time? Exactly, nodded Holmes. With a dramatic flourish, he swept aside a red velvet drape to reveal a tall structure of gleaming metal. As witness! Golly, what's that thing? queried the cub. This thing, replied the professor acidly, is the C. Sidwick Ohm's time door. Willikers, a time machine? Not so, not so. Please, boy. A time machine in the popular sense is impossible. Wild fancy. However, the professor tapped the dottle from his pipe. By a mathematically precise series of infinite calculations, I have developed the remarkable C. Sidwick Ohm's time door. Open it, take but a single step, and presto, the past. But where in the past, Professor? Ohm smiled easily down at the tense ring of faces. Gentlemen, beyond this door lies the sprawling giant of the southwest. Enough land to absorb Earth's overflow like that. He snapped his fingers. I speak, gentlemen, of Texas, 1957. What if the Texans object? They have no choice. The time door is strictly a one-way passage. I saw to that. It will be utterly impossible for anyone in 1957 to re-enter our world of 2057. And now, the past awaits. He tossed aside his professorial robes. Under them, Sidwick Ohms wore an ancient and bizarre costume. Black riding boots, highly polished and trimmed in silver, wool chaps, a wide, jewel-studded belt with an immense buckle, a brightly checked shirt topped by a blazing red bandana. Briskly, he snapped a tall ten-gallon hat on his head and stepped to the time door. Gripping an ebony handle, he tugged upward. The huge metal door oiled slowly back. Time, said Sidwick Ohms simply, gesturing toward the gray nothingness beyond the door. The reporters and photographers surged forward, notebooks and cameras at the ready. What if the door swings shut after you're gone, one of them asked. A groundless fear, boy, assured Ohms. I've seen to it that the time door can never be closed. And now, goodbye, gentlemen. Or to use the proper colloquialism, so long, hombres. Ohms bowed from the waist, gave his ten-gallon hat a final tug, and took a single step forward. And did not disappear. He stood blinking. Then he swore, beat upon the unyielding wall of grayness with clenched fists, and fell back, panting, to his desk. I failed, he moaned in a lost voice. The C. Sidwick Ohm's time door is a botch. He buried his head in trembling hands. The reporters and photographers began to file out. Suddenly, the professor raised his head. Listen, he warned. A slow rumbling, muted with distance, emanated from the dense grayness of the time door. Faint yips and whoopings were distinct above the rumble. The sounds grew steadily, to a thousand beating drums, to a rolling sea of thunder. Shrieking, the reporters and photographers scattered for the stairs. Ah, another knotty problem to be solved, mused Professor Sidwick Holmes, swinging, with some difficulty, onto one of the 3,000 Texas steers stampeding into the laboratory. End recording of Time in Texas by William F. Nolan. Read by Justin Daniels for LibriVox.org. Operation Earthworm by Joe Archibald this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Douglas Nelson Operation Earthworm Interplanetary Press, circa 2022 Septimus Spink, the first Earthman to reach and return from New Mu in a flying saucer, threw a hydroactive bombshell into the meeting of the leading cosmogonists at the University of Cincinnati today. The amazing Spink, uninvited, crashed this august body of scientists, and laughed at a statement made by Professor Apsox Zalfa as to the origin of Earth and other planets. "'That theory is older than the discovery of the antiquated zipper,' Spink orated. "Ha!" You big plexidome still believe the Earth was condensed from a filament, and was ejected by the sun under the gravitational attraction of a big star passing close to the Earth's surface. First, it was a liquid drop, and cooling solidified it after a period of a few million years. You citizens still think it has a liquid core. Some of you think it is pretty hot inside, 
like they had atomic furnaces all fired up. Ha! The exterior ain't so hot either, what with taxes we have to pay after seven wars. Professor Ilzich Mogagilvi of the University of Juno took violent exception to Septimus Spink's derisive attitude and stoutly defended the theory of adiabatic expansion. It was at this juncture that Spink practically disintegrated the meeting. For the last seventy years, he orated, all we have thought about was outer space. All that we have been hepped up about is what is up in the attic and have forgot the cellar. What proof has any knuckle-helmet got that nobody lives far under the coal mines and the oil pockets? Something lives everywhere. Adam never believed anything lived in water until he was bit by a crab. Gentlemen, I am announcing for the benefit of the press and everybody from here to Mars and Jupiter and back that I intend to explore inner space. I have already got the project under way." A near panic ensued as representatives of the press made for the audio-viso stellar types. "'You think volcanoes are caused by heat generated far down inside the Earth. They are only boils or carbuncles. All right, where do earthquakes come from?' Here Spink laughed once more. They are elastic waves sent out through the body of the earth, huh? Their observed times of transmission give a means of finding their velocities of propagation at great depths. I read that in a book that should be in the Terra Firmament Institute along with the spirit of St. Louis." Septimus Spink walked out at this point, surrounded by interplanetary scribes, one of whom was ex Mud Ars Moro. Spink informed the Fourteenth Estate that he would let them have a gander at the model of his inner space machine in due time. He inferred that one of his financial backers in the fabulous enterprise was Aquintax Jupont, and that the fact that Jupont had recently been brainwashed at the Neuropsychiatorium in Metropolita had no bearing on the case whatsoever. I am seeing and listening to that news item right now which has been repeated a dozen times the last twenty-four hours as if nobody could believe it. I am Septimus Spink, and descended from a long line of Spinks that began somewhere back at the time they put up the pyramids. All my ancestors was never satisfied with what progress they saw during when they lived, and they are the reasons we have got where we are today. And if there was no Spinks today, the scientists would get away with saying that the earth was only a drop from the sun that got a crust on it after millions of years, and they want to send me back to get fitted for a duro-nylon straitjacket again. An hour after I shut off the viso screen, and while I'm taking my calves liver and onion capsules, my friend and space lanceman D'Ambrosia Zuhuli comes in. He just qualifies as a spaceman, as he takes up very little and is not much easier to look at than a nougatine. Once D'Ambrosia applied for a plastisectomy, but the surgeons at the Maseo Clinic just laughed and told him there was a limit to science even in the year 2022. But the citizen was at home when they divided the brains. Of course, that is only my opinion. He is to fly with me into inner space. Greetings and salutations, and as the Martians say, Max Nabiscum, Sep, Zahuli says. I have been figuring that we won't have to go deeper than about four thousand kilometers. All that is worrying me is getting back up. I still do not fully believe that we won't melt. Supposing Professor Zalpha is right, and that we will dive down into a core of live iron ore. You have seen them poured out of the big dippers in the mills, Sep. Columbus started off like us, I says. Who knew what he would find, or where he ended up? Chris expected to fall right off the edge of the world, but did that scare him? No. Of course you can count on me, Zahuli says. When do we start building this mechanical mole? In just two days, I says. Our backers have purchased an extinct spaceship factory not far from Commonwealth Seven. Yeah, we will call our project Operation Earthworm, pal. D'Ambrosia sits down and starts licking chicken. We wouldn't get no astrogator in his right mind to go with us, Sep. How many times the thrust will we need over what we would use if we was just cutting space? We start in about foot of topsoil, 
then some hard rock and then more hard rock. Can we harness enough energy to last through the diggin'? Do you mind if I change my mind for a very good reason, which is that I'm an awful coward? Of course not, I says. It would be a coincidence if you quit, though, my dear old friend, and right after Coordinator One found out who was sipping Jovian Drambouille on a certain space bistro last Monday with his Venusian wife. You have sold me, Zahuli says. I would miss this trip for one of those four-legged turkey farms up in Maine. It is kind of frustrating, though, don't you think, Septimus? We are still not thirty and could live another hundred years, what with the new arteries they are making out of Nucralon and the new tickers they are replacing for the old ones. Let us look over the model again, I says. You are just moody today, D'Ambrosia. It still looks like it would work to me. It is just a rocket ship pointed toward terra firma instead of the other way, and has an auger fixed in place at the nose. It is about twenty feet long and four feet wide, and made out of the strongest metal known to modern science, crypto -plutonite. It won't heat up or break off, and it will start spinning around as soon as we cut loose with the tail blasts. How much time do we need, and how much energy for only four thousand kilometers? I asked Zahuli. We got enough stored up to go seventy million miles into space? We'll cross that bridge when we get to the river. You mean the sticks? That is one thing I will not believe, I sniff. We will never find Attila the Hun or Hitler down there, or Beelzebub. All at once we hear a big rumbling noise and the plexidomed house we are in shakes and rattles and we are knocked out of our chairs and deposited on the seats of our Corallon rompers. The viso screen blacks out, I get to all fours and ask, You think the Nucatines have gone to war again, D'Ambrosia? It was not mice, Zahuli gulps. It is either a hydro-radium plant backfired or a good old-fashioned earthquake. After a while we have the viso screen working. The face of Coordinator Five appears. He says the worst earthquake in five centuries has happened. There is a crack in the real estate of Department X-6 near the Rockies that makes the Grand Canyon look like a kid just scraped a stick through some mud. Infrared cross units, he says, are rocketing to the area. There might be something going on inside this earth, I says. If you don't poke a hole in a baked potato, it busts right open from the heat generated inside. Our project, Ambrosia, seems even more expedient than ever. That is a new word for insane I must look up, Zahuli says. Professor Apsok Zalfa comes out with a statement the next morning. He says the quake confirms his theory that the inside of the earth is as hot as a Venusian calypso number, and that gases are being generated by the heat and that we haven't volcanoes enough on the surface to allow them to escape. Exmud Arzmoro comes and asks me if I have an opinion. Ha! I laugh. I have many on file in the Neuropsychatorium. Just go and take your pick. However, I will give you one ad lib and sub rosa. There is more downstairs than Professor Zalfa dreams about. Who is he to say there is no civilization in inner space as well as outer? How do we know that there is not a globe inside a globe with some kind of space or atmosphere in between? Exmudar's Morrow says thanks and leaves in quite a hurry. I snap off the gadget and head for my rocket jeep and fifteen seconds later I am walking into the factory where a hundred citizens are already at work on the inner spaceship. It is listing a little to port from the quake, but the head mech says it will be all straightened out in a few hours. It is just a skeleton ship at the moment with the auger already in place and the point about three feet into the ground. D'Ambrosia Zahuli comes in and says he has been to see Commander Bismuth Aquinox. He will give us just enough of the atom pile for seventy million miles, he says, and only enough superhydrogenated radium to push us twenty million miles, Sep. I think we should write to number one. I explained to the space brass that we have got to come up again after going down and have to reverse the blast tubes. It is radium we have to have to make the return trip. I says a half a pound would do it. You know what I think? I bet they don't believe we'll ever get back, and was their laughs dirty. Skeptics have lived since the beginning of time, I scoff. They laughed at Leonardo da Vinci, Columbus, Edison, a guy named Durante, even the guy who first sat down at the piano. We will take what we can get, pal, and then come back and laugh at them. 
I wish you was more convincing, D'Ambrosia says. I have claustrophobia and would hate to get stuck in an oversized fountain pen halfway to the middle of this earth. Hand me those plans, I says sharply, and stop scaring me. Three months later we have it made. Technicians come from four planets to look at the magnificent mole. The area is alive with members of the Interplanetary Press, the Cosmic News Bureau, and the Universe Feature Service. Two perspiring citizens arrive and tear up two insurance policies right in front of my eyes. An old buddy of mine in the war against the nicotine says he wants to go with me. His name is Axotope Werps. He has been flying cargo between Earth and Parsonipia and says he is quite unable to explain certain expense items in his book. A Parsonipian D.A. is trying to serve him a subpoena. You are in, Axie, I says. A crew of three is enough, as that is about all the oxygen we can store up. Meet D'Ambrosia Zahuli. Why is he wearing a mask? Werps quips. You are as funny as a plutonium crutch, Zahuli says. No hard feelings, Werps says, and takes a small flask out of his pocket. We will drink to Operation Earthworm. As might have been expected, we run into some snags. The Euthanasia Society serves us with papers, as they maintain nobody can commit suicide in the year 22 without permission from the board. Gulflex and other oil companies protest in number one, as they say we might open up a hole that will spill all the petroleum out of the earth all at once, so fast they couldn't refine it. A spark could ignite it and set the globe on fire, like it was a brandied Christmas pudding. But then another earthquake shakes earth, from the rice fields of China to the llamas in Peru, just when it looks as if we were about to be tossed into an outer space pokey. The seismologists get together and agree that they can't possibly figure out the depth of the focus and state that the long waves have to pass through the epicenter or some such spot underground. Anyway, all the brass agrees that something is going on in inner space not according to Hoyle or Euclid or anybody else, and that we three characters might just hit on something of scientific value. The magnificent mole is built mostly of titanium, a metal which is only about half as heavy as steel and twice as rugged. It is not quite as big in diameter as the auger, or if it was, any Martian moron knows we would scrape our sides away before we got down three miles. We store concentrated chow to last six months and get the acceleration couches ready. We are to blast down at 18.04 hours, Friday, May 26, 2022. Today is Wednesday. The big space brass, the 14th estate, haunt the spot marked X. We get it both barrels from the jokers carrying press cards. They call it Operation Upside Down. At last, three characters were really going to dig a hole and pull it in after them. Three hours before dig day, X Mud Ars Moro interviews us. We are televised around the orbit. Laying all joking aside, Spink, the news analyst says dolefully, you don't expect this to work. Of course, I says emphatically. You forget, the first man to reach New Moo was a spink. A spink helped Columbus wade ashore in the West Indies. The first man to invent a road map all citizens could unfold and understand was a spink. Zmoro turns to Zahuli and werps. Don't ask us anything, they yelp in unison. You would only get a silly answer. A world inside of a world, you said once, Spink. Huh, is that impossible? You have seen the most ancient sailing ships built inside of a bottle, Mr. Zmoro, I says. He paws at his dome and takes a hyperbenzadrine tablet. Well, thank you, Septimus Spink, and have a good trip. It is Friday. We climb up the ladder and into the magnificent mole. Check everything, I says to Werps. You are the substrata astrogator. Rogeria, I hope this worm can turn, Werps says. Zahuli checks the instruments. We don't put on spacesuits, but have a pressure chamber built in to ensure against the bends. I wave goodbye to the citizens outside and close the door. I have to get out. D'Ambrosia Zahuli says and heads for the door. I forgot something. Huh? I forgot to resign, he says, and I pull a disintegrator Betsy on him and tell him to hop back to the controls. All right, we have computed the masses of fuel we need. Stand by for the takeoff. 
Er, take down. Eight seconds, seven, six, five, four. I know now my mother raised one idiot, Zahuli says. Three seconds, two seconds, one second. I go on. All right, I'll load the pile in one and three tubes. Then, when we have gone about five hundred miles, give us the radium push. Vroom. The mole shudders like a citizen looking at his income tax bite, and then starts boring. There is a big bright light all around us, changing color every second. Then there is a sound like all the pneumo-atomic drills in all the universe is biting through a thousand four-inch layers of titanium plate. And with it is a rumble of thunder from all the electric storms since the snake-bit Cleopatra. In less than five seconds we turn on the oxygen just in case, and I jump to the instrument panel and look at the arrow on a dial. Hey! I yell. We are making a thousand miles per hour through the ground. Don't look through the ports, Werp says. In passing, I saw an angle worm three times the size of a fire hose and a beetle big enough to saddle. Get into the compression chamber quick, I says to him. You are getting hallucinations. I turn on the air conditioning as it gets as humid in the mole as in the Amazon jungle during the dog days. The boring inner spaceship starts screeching like a banshee. I look at the instrument panel again and see we are close to being seven thousand miles down, and all at once the gauges show we are out of energy. I look out the port and see a fish staring in at me, and a crab with eyes like two poached eggs swimming in ketchup. Then we are going through dirt again, and all of a sudden we come out of it and I see a city below us all lit up, and the buildings are made of stuff that looks like jade run through with streaks of black. The mole drops down about a thousand more feet and then hits the floor of the subterranean city, and we land like a fountain pen with its point slammed into the top of a lump of clay. Boing! We twang like a plucked harp string for nearly five minutes, and I hit my noggin against the pilot seat. When I pick up my marbles, I look around for either an Elysium field or a slag heap, but instead a creep is staring down at me. He looks part human and part beetle and has a face the color of the meat of an avocado. His head is shaped like a pear standing on its stem, and has two eyes spaced about six inches apart, and they are as friendly as those of a spitting cobra irked by hives. He is about four feet tall and has two pairs of arms. I guess I am still a little delirious, or I would not have told the thing he would make a swell paper hanger. The subterranean creep throws a fit and belts me with four fists. Domkoff it says, and then I really get scared, as he has got a lop of hair falling down over one eye, and has a black mustache the size of a Venusian four-centrist stamp over his mouth, which is like that of a pouting goldfish. I get to my feet and grab for a railing, and I see Werps and Zahuli held by two other monsters that look more like beetles than the one standing beside me. Zo, the creep with the mustache says, it is a surprise I talk universa. We have radar and telepathometers that give us everything that is said in the upper world. I think back and try not to. In the hermetically sealed cylinder back upstairs among my Americana spink I have some photographs circa 1945. One is of a citizen of old Nazi Germany who was supposed to have cremated himself in a bunker. Papers there record that my forebear, Cyril Spink, had his doubts at the time. I am the Neofur, Earthman, this creep says. I will conquer the universe. Look, I says, pawing beads of sweat as big as the creep's eyes from my brow, have you been testing atom bombs and worse down here? Yeah. There, I knew Professor Zalpha was off the beam, I yelp at Werps. This is what is causing the earthquakes. Come, Schwein, the creep says. I will show you something, the tomb of my ancestor, then to the museum to show you how he arrived in Subterro in the year 1945. This is the city of Adolphus. Mach schnell, Heil Hitler, I am Agrodite Hitler, grandson of the Liberator. The short hairs on the back of my neck start crawling down my spine. We leave the mole and walk along a big square paved with a mineral we never saw upstairs. 
thousands of inhabitants of Subtero hiss at us and click their long black fingers. We walk up a long flight of stairs and come to a cadaver memorial, and on the front there are big letters and numerals in what looks like bloodstone that says, Adolf Hitler, 1981. Ah, Earthmen, mortal enemies of Subtero's hero, you thought he did not escape, ha? Huh? Come, we go to the museum. We do. In a glass case is an antique U-boat. I can't believe it, I says to Zahuli. Neither do I. We never took off. They have us locked up in the booby hatch in Metropolita. We went nuts. He escaped in a submarine, bringing three of Nazi Germany's smartest scientists with him. He brought plans showing us he could split the atom. He brought working models. The creep laughs mockingly. We have certain elements down here also. Puranium, better than your uranium and pitch blend plus nine. It will power a fleet of submarines that will conquer Earth. It is nearly der Tug. We will leave through the underground river that our benefactor found three miles below the surface of the ocean near Brazil. It spirals down through this Earth and empties into Lake Schickelgruber, eighty miles from here. And Hitler took one of those sub dames as a mate, huh? I says. It figures. He was not human himself. I get another cuffing around, but I'm too punchy already to feel anything. The next thing I know, I am in this subtero clink with Werps and Zahuli. D'Ambrosia says maybe we will get released from the straitjacket soon and get shock treatments, and find ourselves back in Metropolita in our favorite night spot. We have to be dreaming this, I keep telling myself. The guard looks in at us, and he has little slanting eyes. How did Jap beetles get here? I ask Werps. I shiver. I think of all the Subtero subs pouring out of a hole under Brazil and sinking all earthy and merchant marines and shooting guided missiles that will land all over the U.S. They could have rays that would reach up over a million miles and wash up space traffic. Then we get another jolt. They bring us our chow and say it is angleworm and hell gramite porridge as that is what the subtero denizens live on mostly. There is a salad made out of what looks like skunk cabbage leaves. We found out later that Hitler's brain trust had made an artificial sun for the subterrors, and they had been given greens for the first time and increased in size over a hundred percent. We have got to escape, I say to my pals. That is easy, Zahuli sniffs. First, we have to break through the walls here, get to the mole which can't never move again, and then fight off maybe six million creeps. We would get reduced to cinders by Ray Betsy's the minute we hit the street. I sigh deeply and reach into my knapsack. I find some lamb stew and tapioca pudding capsules and split them with Zahuli and Werps. Then I come up with a little box and glance at the label. It says, Ergoxa's insect powder contains radiatol. I get up nonchalantly and call the guard to the barred window. Beetlehead sticks his face in close and asks what I want. I empty some of the powder into the palm of my hand and then blow it into his face. The subtero sentry's eyes cross. His face turns as pale as milk and he collapses like a camp stool. Eureka! I yelp. We are in business, pals. I hide the box of bug powder when I hear two other creeps come running. They start yakking in Universa and in bug language both. Agrodite Hitler appears and looks in at us. What happened, Great One? I ask very politely. We will perform an autopsy, Hitler's grandson says, and turns to another beetlehead. Opens a door, he says. I am showing my guests something before we exterminate them. To bat about Voklogu, most likely a coronary thrombosis. Achtung, Rausmit! It means, get the lad out in old Germanic literature, I says to Werps and Zahuli. It is curtains, D'Ambrosia gulps. In about five minutes, we will be residue. The neo is like all egomaniacs before him. He wants to brag. We get into a subtero jet jeep and drive about twenty miles through the underground countryside to the entrance to a cave guarded by some extra-tall sub-terrors. 
Hitler the Third leads us into the Spelunker's nightmare, and we finally come to a big metal door about eighty feet long and twenty feet high. Agridite pushes a button, and the steel door lifts. Then we walk up a flight of steps to the top of a dam and take a gander at a fleet of submarines that makes earthy and pig boats look like they belonged in antique shops. We will take you for a ride in one, the dictator of Subtero says. After that, I will turn you over to the executioner. We need lawyers, Werp says. We cross a thin gangplank and enter the sub. The lights in it are indirect and are purplish green. Hitler number three shows us the telepathic machine, the radar, and the viso screen that pictures everything going on upstairs on Earth, and on Mars, Jupiter, and all other planets. There are four other beetleheads on the sub, and they carry disintegrators. These subtero U boats, our genial host brags, can go as fast in reverse as full speed ahead, as the situation warrants. They are alive with guided missiles no larger than this flashlight I have here, but one would blow up your metropolita and leave hardly an ash. He looks at me and then goes on. We will proceed to the lock that will raise us to the underground river and cruise along its course for a few hundred miles. It is the treat I should accord such distinguished visitors from the outside of Earth, Nine. The skipper of the Subterro sub pulls a switch, and there is a noise like three contented cats purring. The metal fish slides along the surface of the underground lake and comes to a hole in a big rock ledge. We see all this through a monitor which registers the scenery outside the sub within a radius of three miles. The sub slides into the side of the rock and then is lifted up to the underground river that winds and winds upward like a corkscrew to the outlet under Brazil. Every once in a while, a blast of air that smells like a dentist's office goes through the sub from bow to stern, and I ask why. There is such terrific potency to the power we use from our puranium, Hitler number three says, that we purify the air every few seconds with formula XYB and three-fifth. The basis of the gas is galena. I nudge Werps and Zahuli as the neo Fuhrer goes over to converse with his crew. It is our big chance, I whisper. You watch how they run this tub for the next few minutes. Then, when I cough three times, you be ready. I do not know how much powder it will take to knock off the big bug, as he is half human. Once I blow this insect powder at the same time as the purifying blast is to take place, you two be ready to jump Agridite. I notice that a small purple light flashes on over the monitor just before that stuff turns loose. It is a warning so the beetleheads can take deep breaths. Sep, D'Ambrosia Zauhuli says, I take back all the insults of the past five hours. Shake. I am doing that already, I says. We have to work fast while we are in the underground river. We wait. The neo Fuhrer comes walking back to where we are sitting. The purple light flashes on, and I count to three. Just as the blast of air loaded with XYB plus cuts loose, I throw all the bug powder left in the box into the current. Hitler number three breathes in a big gob of it and buckles a little at the knees. Grab him, I screech. Don't let him yank that disintegrator loose. Hit him with anything you see, pals. I see the other beetleheads collapse like they have been hit with bulldozers and I know now that insecticide is more dangerous in Subtero than all the radioactivity harnessed up on six planets. Agridite Hitler, however, has some moxie left in him as he has two of his hands around Werps' throat, the third around Zahuli's leg, and is reaching for a ray Betsy with his fourth. He grabs the disintegrator just as I belt him over his ugly noggin with a wrench about two feet long and which was certainly not made of aluminum or balsa wood. Himmel! The neo fear gulps. Ach, du Liebensraum! He has to be hit once more, which is enough, and we tie him up with rope that looks like it was made out of plutonium filaments. Well, I says, we have a sub from Subtero. Werps, you just sit there at the controls and make sure that needle on the big dial don't move, as I am sure this creep has it on robot, so that this tub will automatically follow the course of the river. We are sure taking a powder. D'Ambrosia yelps, look at the monitor!
We see fish gaping at us from the screen that even Earth citizens with delirium tremens never saw, and I look quite anxiously at the instrument panel. A thousand miles per and we are climbing, I says. I'm glad this Hitler used old Germanic on his subs and that I majored in it once. I, er, I am getting arthritis all at once. The bends. Uh, er, look, peel them suits off the other creeps and fast, Zahuli, as I bet they can be inflated and made into compression chambers. They have got connections that plug into something. We pull on the suits, which were too big for the beetleheads, and for a good reason. More bends than there are in the Ohio River are with us before we plug into the right socket. The suits bulge out until our feet almost leave the floor. I grin through my helmet at Werps. The sub keeps purring and purring. The altimeter registers four thousand feet. It is a caution, an altimeter in a sub. Two hours later we shoot out through a hole deep under the coast of Brazil, and I know we are in the ocean as the monitor shows some old wrecked ships about three miles from us. We disconnect the sub anti-bends kimonos and peel them off. Agrodite Hitler is moving two of his arms when we climb toward the surface. Ha! We will make a sucker out of history, I says to Werps, and wait until we show this creep to Professor Zalfa and Exmud Ars Moro. We come to the surface and contact an earthy and Franco-Austro-atomic luxury liner. The skipper's pan registers on the viso screen. This is Septimus Spink, I says, commander of inner spaceship Magnificent Mole. I have come from the center of Earth with a captured subtero submarine and Agrodite Hitler, the Neo-Führer. Over and out. The universe goes into a cosmic dither when we slide into a berth in Hampton Rotus. Thousands of citizens hail us as we ride to Metropolita in a super caddy jet. Behind us, in a truck trailer made mostly of transparent dura lucite, is our captive, the descendant of Adolf Hitler and three dead subtero beetle people. Well, you won't give up so easy on a spink from now on, I says to Zahuli. We are heroes, and we'll get medals. First thing we have to do, though, I says to Coordinator One, sitting in the jet sedan with us, is to take care of the hole Earth has in its head. All we have to do is drop that new bomb down the tunnel we made, and it will wash up all those subs that are left and most likely cause a flood that will inundate Subtero. What do you think? The brass is still tongue-tied. One thing I must do, and that is to see that a certain insecticide manufacturer gets a plug on interplanetary TV, I continue. Ah, we took the bugs out of this planet. It should work quite smooth from now on. I still believe in reincarnation, D'Ambrosia Zahuli says. I have the darndest feeling I've been through almost as big nightmares with you before, Sep. Interplanetary Press, circa 2022, Junius 24. Professor Apsox Zalfa, eminent professor of cosmogony, and Exmud Ars Moro, leading news analyst of Seven Worlds, have entered the Metropolita Neuropsychiatorium for a routine checkup. They emphatically denied that it was connected in any way with a lecture given recently by Septimus Spink, first man to explore inner space at the Celestial Cow Palace in San Francisco. Both men expect to remain for two weeks. Of course, there is nothing wrong with either of us, Professor Zalfa told your correspondent. But if you see a beetle, please do not step on it. It could be somebody's mother. The End of Operation Earthworm by Joe Archibald Question of Comfort by Les Collins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Question of Comfort by Les Collins. The Gravity Gang was a group of geniuses devoting its brilliance to creating a realistic solar system for Disneyland. That was the story, anyway. No one would have believed all that stuff about cops and robbers from outer space. My job, finished now, had been getting them to Disneyland. The problem was bringing one in particular, 
one I had to find. The timing was uncomfortably close. I'd taken the last of the yellow pills yesterday, tossing the bottle away with a sort of indifferent frustration. I won or lost on the validity of my logic and whether I'd built a better mousetrap. The pills had given me twenty-four hours before the fatal weakness took hold. Nevertheless, I waited as long as I could. That left me less than an hour now. Strangely, as I walked in the eerie darkness of an early morning, virtually deserted Disneyland, I felt calm, and yet my life depended on the one I sought being inside the tour building. I was seeking a monster of terrible potential, yet so innocuous-looking that he'd not stand out. I couldn't produce him, couldn't say where in the world he was. Nevertheless, he was the basis, the motivation second only to mine. I took the long, hard way, three years, making him come to me. Two years were devoted to acclimatization, learning, and then swinging this job, just to put the idea across. Assigned to Disneyland Public Relations in the offices at Burbank, I'd begun with the usual low-pay, low-level jobs. I didn't, couldn't mind. At least I had a foot in the right door. Within six months, I reached a point where I could present the idea. It had enough merit. My boss, Thirty-five years' experience enabled him to recognize a good idea, took it to his boss, who took it to the boss. Tomorrowland is the orphan division of Disneyland, thrown in as sop to those interested more in the future than the past. My idea was to sex up Tomorrowland, tour the solar system. Not really, but we'd bill it that way. The tour of the solar system building was to be large. Its rooms would reproduce environments of parts of the system as best we knew them. I'll never forget the first planning session when we realists were underdogs, yet swung the basic direction. By then, the Hollywood mind had appeared. The Hollywood mind is definitely a real thing, a vicious thing, a blank thing, that paternalistically insists it knows what the public wants. There was general agreement on broad outlines. Trouble began over Venus. Of course, said one of the mines, we'll easily create a swampy environment. I burst out with quiet desperation. May I comment? The realists were churning. Right there, sides were being chosen. I let all know my side immediately. Venus is hot, but it's desert heat. Continuous dust storms with fantastic winds. People never go for that junk, interrupted the mind. Everyone knows Venus is swampy. Everyone whose reading tastes matured no further than Edgar Rice Burroughs. The mind, with a if-you-know-so-much-why-ain't-you-rich look, sneered. How come you know all about it? Speechless, I spread my hands. This joker was leading with his chin, forcing the fight. I had to hit him again. If I lost, I lost good. A person, I said slowly and rhythmically, with normal intelligence and a minute interest in the universe, will keep step with the major sciences at least on an elementary level, I must stress the qualification of normal intelligence. The mind, face contorted, was determined to get me. I was in a very vulnerable spot. More important, so was the idea. Mind began an emotional tirade, and mentally I damned him. It couldn't have mattered to him what environment we used, but he was politicking where he shouldn't. There was silence when he stopped. This was the crux. The boss would decide. I held my breath. He said, We'll make it hot and dusty. The realists had won. The rest climbed on the bandwagon, 
but quick, and the temple was cleansed. It was natural, because at the moment I was fair-haired for the project to become mine. God knows I worked hard for it. I'd have to watch the mind, though. He would make things as difficult as possible. However, he proved he was the one person I wasn't seeking. One down and two billion, four hundred and ninety-nine million, nine hundred and ninety-nine thousand, nine hundred and ninety-nine to go. Within a few days, a new opposition coalition formed, headed by the mind. Fortunately, they helped. I'd hesitated on one last point, pushed. I gambled the momentum of the initial enthusiasm would carry it. Originally, the plan was a series of rooms, glassed off, that people could stare into. There was something much better. Engineering and I spent 36 hours straight, figuring costs, juggling space and equipment, until the modification didn't look too expensive. Juggling is always possible in technical proposals. For the results, the cost was worth it. I hand-carried the proposal, and why not take people through the rooms? We could even design a simulated, usable spacesuit. There'd be airlock doors between the rooms for effectiveness, insulation, economy. No children under ten allowed, no adults over fifty. They'd go through in groups of ten or eleven. Sure, I realized this was the most elaborate, most ambitious concession ever planned. The greatest ever attempted in its line, it would cost both us and the public. But people will pay for value. They'd go for a buck and a half or even two. The lines of those filing past the windows at fifty cents a crack would also bring in the dough. They bought it. Not all. They nixed my idea of creating exact environmental conditions. And I didn't insist, luck and Hollywood being what they are. From the first, I established a special group to work on one problem. They were dubbed the Gravity Gang, and immediately after that, the GG. I hired them for the gravity of the situation, a standard gag that, once uttered, became as trite as the phrase. The tour's realism would be affected by normal weight sensations. The team consisted of a female set designer, who'd turn any male head from the studio, a garage mechanic with thirty years' experience, an electronics engineer, a science fiction writer, and the prettiest competent secretary available. I found Hazel, discovering with delight she'd had three years of anthropology at UCLA. As soon as they assembled, I explained their job find a way to give the illusion of lessened gravity. Working conditions would be the best possible. Why I'd wanted the women pretty, and their time was their own. I found the GG responded by working ten hours a day and thinking another fourteen. They were that sort. I couldn't know the GG was foredoomed to failure by its very collective nature, nor could I know by its nature the GG meant the difference between my success and failure. The opposition put one over. We'd start referring to the job as Tour of the Systems Project. Next day, it was going the rounds as TS Project. Words, words, and men will always fight with words. Actually, the initials were worthy of the name. The engineering problems mounted like crazy. Words, words, and one of them got to the outside world. Or maybe it was the additional construction crew we hired. One logical spot for the building was next to the moon flight. The tour building now would be bigger than first planned, so we extended it southeasterly. This meant changing the roadbed of the Santa Fe and Disneyland RR. It put me up to my ears in plain surveying and gave me a nasty shock. I looked up at someone's shout, in time to see a ton of cat rolling down the embankment at me. What we were doing was easy, using a spiral to transition gradually from tangent to circular curve, and from circular curve 
to tangent. Easy? Yeah, sure. If this was my baby, I'd damn well better know its personality traits. I was out with the surveyors. I was out with the construction gang. I was out at the wrong time. As the yellow beast, mindless servant of man, thundered down, I dove for the rocks. Thank God for the rocks. We'd had to import them. The soil in Orange County is fine for oranges, but too soft for train roadbeds. Choking on the dust, I rolled over. The cat perched, grinning drunkenly on the rocks. The opposition? Or an accident? Surely the mind wasn't that desperate. But I was. I had to keep the idea alive, for myself, as well as completion of the original mission. Several million hands pulled me out. Several million more patted away the dust. Motionless, I'd just seen the driver of the cat. Seen him, and was sorry. He stood tall, but hunched over. Gaunt, with pasty skin, vapid eyes, and a kind of yellow, nondescript hair. It wasn't the physical characteristics, very similar to mine, that bothered me. Once, after an incomplete pass, I'd been told by a young lady that I was a thin, sallow lecher. I was swept by waves of impending trouble, more frightened of him than of the opposition in Toto. Then, relieved, I realized the man wasn't the one I was expecting. Back in my office, I wasn't allowed the luxury of nervous reaction. Our spacesuit man wanted an okay on design changes. Changes? What changes? Oh, yes, go ahead. A materials man wanted to know about weight. I told him where to go, for the information. A written progress report from the GG briefly, sardonically, said, All the talk about increased costs and lowered budget has decided us to ask if any aircraft, missile, or AEC groups have come up with anti-gravity. It'd be a lot simpler that way. Love and kisses. I shrugged, wrote them a memo to take a week off for fishing, wenching, or reading Van S. on the Pleistone stratigraphy of Java. I didn't care, as long as they returned with a fresh point of view. Things were hectic already, less than four months after we'd started, and we hadn't much to show except a shift in the roadbed of the SF and D RR. The opposition, growing stronger each day, could sit back and rest the case, with nothing more than a smug, needling, I told you so, look. The day finally came when we broke ground for the building. It was quite an achievement, and I invited the GG to dinner. I'd been drawn to the bunch of screwballs, the only name possible, more and more. Maybe because they were my brainchild, or maybe because lately they were the only human company in which I could relax. The hotel is about a half mile south of Disneyland. I arrived early, hoping to grab a ginger ale. Our set designer, Frank, christened Francis, caught me at the door. Wanted to buy you a drink. This is the first time we've met socially. That was true. It was equally true something bothered her. Damn it. Trapped, I'd have to drink. We ordered, and I mulled it over. Waited, but she said nothing. The drinks came. I shook several little, bright yellow pills from the bottle, swallowed them, then drank. Frank cocked her head inquisitively. If you must know, they're for my ulcer. Didn't know you had one. Don't, but I'll probably get one any day. She laughed, and I drank again. I should do my drinking alone because I get boiled incredibly fast. It happened now. One second I was sober, the next drunk. Resting a cheek on a wobbly palm and elbow, I said, Has everyone ever said you are the most beautiful? Yes, but in your present state, it isn't a good idea for you to add to that number. I shifted to the other forearm. Frank, things might be different if I weren't a thin, sallow lecher. What a nice compliment. Uh-huh. 
especially since I work for you, nominally anyway. Uh-huh, nominally. Bosses should not make passes at gals who work as lower classes. Uh-huh, familiar. But you are, and getting more so daily. Uh-huh, or what? I asked in surprise. Then, tired, the GG has decided you're working too hard. Because I don't use Veno, I grinned, having waited too long to put that one across. Be serious and listen. You listen. If I'm working too hard, it's to finish. I must, and soon. This compulsion, she paced her words, will kill you if you let it. It'll kill me if I don't let it. Here comes Harry. It was time. Blearily, I fumbled with the pills, spilled the bottle. Frank helped me gather them up as Harry arrived. He said, a look of worry on his gaunt, gray features, The rest of us are waiting. Concerned, Frank asked, Think you're able? Any time you say, I answered in a cold, sober monotone. She flushed, knowing I was sober, not knowing certainly if I were serious. When we were seated, I said enthusiastically, Chateaubriand tonight, gangsters. The GG did not react as expected. Dex, the electronics engineer, said quietly, If it's stake when the ground is broken, what'll it be when the thing is finished? A feast for all the animals in the world, just like Suleiman bin Daoud, this from the GG writer. Mel. Their faces showed the same thing that bothered Frank. Harry said, We have something to do. Well, do it! I tried weak joviality. It can't be anything of earth-shaking gravity. Hazel, long since accepted as a GG member, replied, It's just that we're resigned. What? We've produced nothing in months of sustained effort. That's why we're resigning, Dex replied disgustedly. Frank touched my arm, said softly, We've examined every angle. With the money available, it's just impossible to give a sensation of changed weight. And we know they've been pressuring you about us being on the payroll. Wait, desperately. If you pull out, everything will go. The opposition needs only something like this. Besides, the GG is the one bit of insanity I can depend on in a practical world. The prop for my judgment. Harry. Clouded judgment. Mel. Expensive prop. Having grown used to their friendly insults, I sensed their resolution weakening, felt the pendulum swinging back. The waitress interrupted with news of an urgent phone call. It was the worst possible time for me to leave, and the news I got threw me. Feeling the weight of the world, I returned. Can't be in two places at once, I said bitterly. Go ahead without me. I'm leaving. Wait a few minutes, Mel said, between bites of steak. We want to resign. Sit down. Damn it, I can't. I spoke to the boss. I've pulled a boo-boo, but big. What happened? Bonestell will do the backgrounds, but he has to know what rocks we're putting in the rooms. What rocks are we? Anybody have an idea what the surface of Mars looks like? God, how could I have missed that? Sit down, Dex said casually. We want to resign. Hazel added, You can have your rocks in 24 hours. We worked it out weeks ago i did read van s and harry has prospected and dex knows minerals and mel pushed his way through tyrell's principles of petrology the science of rocks mel interrupted between bites of steak we got interested one day frank's pretty dark eyes danced we want to resign dex repeated casually so sit down i sat they began throwing the ball faster than I could catch. No atmosphere on Mercury, 
then no oxidation. I insist there be no straight metals. The asteroids? Ferromagnesian blocks of some kind. Any basalts around here? For Venus, grab a truckload of granodiorite, the spotted stuff from the Sierra Nevadas in tinted pink. Lateritic soils for Mars? You crazy? Must have water and a subtropical climate. It hit me. A valid use for the GG. One that already saved money. Make them a brain team, troubleshooters, or problem solvers on questions that could not be solved. I said, Fine, go ahead. About your resignations. Mel said something indistinguishable. I caught him on a bite of steak. Hazel, belligerent, demanded, Are you asking us to resign? Apparently, I wasn't. So they stuck, and another crisis was met. Unfortunately, by then, I'd forgotten the shock and warning I got from the cat. Things moved swiftly, more easily. The GG took over, becoming, in effect, my staff. They'd become more, five different extensions of me, each capable of acting correctly. As a team, they meshed beautifully. Too beautifully, at one point. Dex and Hazel were seeing eye to eye, even in the dark, and I worried about the effect on the others. I might as well have worried about the effect of a light bulb on the sun. They married, or some such, refused time off, and the GG functioned, if anything, better. It was almost indecent the way the five got along together. A new problem arose. Temperature. We weren't reproducing actual temperatures, but the rooms needed a marked change, for reality's sake. I'd insisted on that, and, having won the point, was stuck with it. It was after 2 a.m. I was alone in the office. The sound of the outer door closing startled me. Footsteps approached. I hurried to clean my desk, sweeping the bottle into the drawer. You're up too late. Go home. Frank had a non-arguable look in her eye. You're supposed to be getting sleep. I am, far more than before you guys began helping. But... But with all that extra sleep, you're looking worse. I don't need any more sleep, I said angrily, then tried diversion. Been on a date? Yes, but I thought I'd better check on you. She moved close to the desk, and I remembered the last time we'd been alone, in the bar. Now I was glad I wasn't drunk. What the devil are you up to? She pawed through the desk drawers. Finding what you tried to hide. Wait, Frank, I yelled. Too late. She looked at the bottle, then me, with a strange expression. A little pity, not patronizing, but mostly feminine understanding. Soda pop? Of course. You don't like alcohol, do you? No. Gruffly. Her eyes blinked rapidly, as though holding back tears. I know what's the matter with you. I really know. There's nothing the matter with me that that beating this mess won't solve. We hadn't heard Mel enter. He leaned casually against the door. Terrific idea for a story. I shrug. Seems to be homecoming night. Not quite, he glanced at his watch. But wait another few minutes. He was right. Harry, out of breath, was the last of the GG to arrive. Now what? I asked. Surely this meeting isn't an accident. Dex said thoughtfully. No, not really. But it is in the sense you mean. We didn't agree to appear tonight. Yet? Logically, it's time for the temperature problem. Well, I guess each of us came down to help. What could I do? That was a GG, characteristically, so we talked temperatures. What I was thinking, Harry began slowly, was a sort of super thermostat. Harry, as usual, came to the right starting point. Frank smiled. That's right. Especially considering layout. Venus and Mercury are hot, the others cold. What about a control console 
that'll light when the rooms get outside normal temperature range. Then the operator... Hey, why an operator? Mel questioned. We ought to make this automatic. He grinned. Giant computer. Can see it now. The brain comes alive. Tries to destroy anyone turning it off. I asked. Have you been reading the stuff you write? Funny enough for 3 a.m. Dex said calmly, We can work this. In fact, we can tie it in pink ribbons and forget it. An electronics outfit in Pasadena makes an automatic scanning and logging system. Works off punch paper tape. We'll code the right poop, and the system will compare it with the actual raw data. Feedback will be to a master control servo that'll activate the heater or cooler. Now, we need the right pickup. I snap my fingers. Variable resistor bridge. Couple of resistors equal at the right temperature. There'll be a frequency change with changing temperature. Better than a thermocouple, I think. They looked at me as though I were butting in. You've been reading, too, Dex accused. Okay, we'll use a temperature bulb. Trouble is, with this system, we'd better let it run continuously. That'll drive costs up. Hazel asked, Can't we use the heat, maybe to drive a compressor? The sudden expansion of air could cool the rest, Harry. Harry hadn't time to answer. What'll this cost? I snapped. Roughly fifteen to eighteen thousand, Dex replied. What? With fine impartiality, they ignored me completely. Harry continued, as though without interruption. Y yes, I guess a compressor and coolant system could be arranged. We broke up at 6 a.m. I took one of my pills, frowning at the bottle. Seemed to be emptying fast. Sleepily, I shook the thought off and faced the new day, little knowing the opposition had managed to skizzle us again. The last displays were moons of Jupiter and Saturn. It was impossible to recreate tortured conditions of the planets themselves. Saturn's closest moon, Mimas, was picked. For our grand finale, landing on Mimas, with Saturn rising spectacularly out of the east, Mimas is in the plane of the rings, so they couldn't be obvious. We'd show enough, however, to make it damned impressive and explain it by libration of the satellite. The mechanics of realistically moving Saturn was rougher than a cob, and that's where the opposition fixed us. They claimed there wasn't enough drama in the tour. Let it end with a flash of light, a roar, and a meteor striking nearby. The roar came from us. Mimas had no atmosphere. How could the meteor sound off or burn up? We finally compromised, permitting the meteor to hit. We decided early the customers couldn't walk through. Mel first, Harry, then Dex, together produced an electric-powered open runabout. The cart ran on treads in contact with skillfully hidden tracks for the current channel. A futuristic touch, that. We'd say the cart ran on broadcast power. The power source provided cart headlights and made batteries unnecessary for the guide's walkie-talkie and the customer's helmet receivers. My missus' last section of track was on a vibrating platform. The cart tripped a switch. When the meteor supposedly hit, the platform would drop and rise three inches, fast, twisting while it did. Enough! Mel said grimly, to shake the damn kishkas out of them. We cracked that one just in time for another. It began with Venus, as most of my problems had. We planned constant dust storms for Venus. Real quick, there'd be nothing left of the Bonestell's backgrounds but a blank wall from mechanical erosion. And how did we intend? Glass. Too easily scratched. Lord, another one, how will the half-a-buck customers be able to get inside? Glass, and one of those silicon plastics? 
better, but Harry beat it. Glass, plastic, and a boundary layer of cold air jetted down from the ceiling. In front of the background painting and back of the look-in window, I was glad, for lately Harry had begun to age. Thin and gray, he showed the strain, as did all of us. We were sitting in an administration office at the park. I now recognized the symptoms. When the GG had no real problems, its collective mind usually turned to my health. I wouldn't admit it, but I felt a little peaked. Little? Hell, bone tired, dog weary, pooped. Seemed every motion was effort, but soon it would end. The phone rang. With a message, it was ended. Let's go, Crosscuteers. There was almost a pregnant pause. Six months. Conception of the idea to delivery a finished product. Six months working together, fighting men, nature, and the perversity of inanimate objects. All of this now was done. No one moved. Frank verbalized it. I'm scared. She sounded scared. Better than being petrified, which I am, I answered. But we might as well face it. We dragged over to the T.S. building, an impressive structure. The guide played it straight, told us exactly how to suit up. Then, in the cart, we edged into the tunnel that was the first lock, and, warned to set our filters, emerged onto the blinding surface of Mercury. We felt the heat momentarily. Mercury and Venus were kept at a constant 140 degrees, the others at zero degrees Fahrenheit. But it was a deliberate thrill. Then cool air from the cart suit connections began circulating. Bonestell was magnificent, as always. Yellow landscape, spatter cones, glittering streaks that might be metal in the volcanic ground, created by dusting ground mica on wet glue to catch the reflection of the sun. It was a masterpiece. The sun. Black sky holding a giant blazing ball. Too damned yellow, but filtered carbon arcs were the best we could do. Down into the tunnel, that was locked too. This one. Venus. Obvious opposition point of attack, where we'd had the most trouble. Venus had to be right. It was. A blast of wind struck us, and dust swirling everywhere. We'd discovered there's no such thing as a sandstorm. It's really dust. So we'd taken pains making things look right. Sand dunes were carefully cemented in place. Dust rippling over gave the proper illusion. Oddly shaped rocks, dimly seen, strengthened the impression of wind-abraded topography. Rocks were reddish, overlain by smears of bright yellow. Lot of trouble placing all that flowers of sulfur. But we postulated a liquid sulfur, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide cycle. Overhead, a diffused, intense yellow light. The sun, we were on the daylight side. I sighed, relaxed, knowing this one had worked out. We gave the moon little time. For those who had become homesick, Earth was hanging magnificently in the sky. At a crater wall, we stopped, ostensibly to let souvenir hunters pick at small pieces of lunar rock without leaving the cart. We'd argued hours on what type to use till Mel dragged out his rock book. Most automatically had wanted basalt. However, the moon's density being low, heavier rocks are probably scarce. One good reason not to expect radioactive ores there. We finally settled for rhyolite and obsidian. Stopping on the moon had another purpose. We kept the room temperature at 70 Fahrenheit for heating and cooling economy. The transition from Venus to Mars was much simpler. If ambient temperature dropped from 140 to 70 and 70 to 0 rather than straight through the range. Next, a Martian polar cap, and we looked down a long canal that disappeared on the horizon. Water appeared to run uphill for that effect. 
The whole scene looked like an Arizona highway at dusk, what it should have. To our right, a suggestion of, damn the opposition's eyes, culture, a large stone woods it. It was a jarring note. We selected one of those nondescript asteroids with just enough diameter to show extreme curvature. Frank had done magnificently. I found myself hanging onto the cart, headlights deliberately dimmed. On the rocky surface, the cart bumped wildly. The sky was black, broken only by little hard chunks of light. No horizon. The feeling of being ready to drop was intense, possibly too much so. Europa, then, in a valley of ice. We would picked Jupiter's third moon because its frozen atmosphere permitted some eerie pseudo-ice sculpturing. As we moved, Jupiter appeared between breaks and peaks in the sheer wall. Worked nicely, seeing the monstrous planet distended overhead, like a gaily colored beach ball moving with us, as the moon from a train window. Unfortunately, the ice forms detracted somewhat. Mimas, pitch black, then a glow, stark landscape quickly becoming visible, steep cliffs, rocky plain, Saturn rising. The rings, their shadow on the globe, the beauty of it, made me sit stunned, though I knew what to expect. The guide warned us, radar spotted an approaching object, probably a meteor. We ran the cart at maximum speed, not much really, it tore at you, wanting to stare at Saturn, wanting to duck. Hit the special section, dropped and rose our three inches, one hell of a distance, and the tour was over. I kept thinking, insanely, that the meteor was a perfect conflict touch. We unsuited silently. Finally, Hazel breathed. Hallelujah! It was summation of success. There now remained but one thing. Wait for the quarry to show. I estimated the necessary time at four days and nights after opening. It was hard to wait, hard not to fidget under the watchful, the only word, eyes of the GG. They were up to something, undoubtedly, but there was something far more important. I'd narrowed the 2,499,999,999 down to five. The one I sought was a member of the GG. Opening night brought Harry and Frank to my office. They tried to be casual, engaged me in desultory nothings. Frank looked reproachful. I was there too late. The following night, Mel ambled in at midnight. He grinned, discussed a plot, suggested we go out for a beer, changed his mind, left. The third night, I waited in the dark. Nor was I disappointed. Dex and Hazel showed. What do you want? It's 2 a.m. There was a long, regrouping pause. Then Hazel said, Dex has a fine idea. Well? I've been thinking about gravity. About time, I said sarcastically, disliking myself, but hoping it would get rid of them. We opened three days ago. He ignored my petulance and grinned. No, I meant anti-gravity. I think it's possible. If you had a superconductor in an inductance field, why tell me? Thought you'd have some ideas. I shook my head. That's what I hired you for. My only idea right now is going to sleep. Bewildered, they left. And on the fourth night, no one came. So I headed for the tour. Now, having risked everything on my logic, I was a dead pigeon if wrong. There were only minutes left. I eased through the back door, heard our automation equipment humming. Despite darkness, I shortcut it, nearly reaching the door to the service hallway in back of the planetary rooms. There was a distinct click, and a flashlight blinded me. I waited, stifling a cry, knowing if it were he, death was next. Death never spoke in such quiet, sweet tones. Frank asked, What are you doing here? Frank, Frank, not you. Surprise shocked me. The light 
her voice, the sudden suspicion, still diversion and counter-attack. Perhaps you've the explaining to do, I said nastily. Why are you here? Her wide-eyed ingenuousness, making me more suspicious, she answered, Waiting to see if you'd appear. Then she stopped being truthful. You forgot we had a date. We didn't have any damn date, I said flatly, hurting deep within. All right, I want to know why you're still driving yourself. It isn't work. That's finished. The way she talked made me hopeful. Maybe she wasn't the one. And then came fear. Frank, if he's here, you're in danger. The monster respects nothing we hold dear. Law, property, dignity, life. There was one way to find out. Make her leave. I wrenched the flashlight from her, smashed it on the concrete floor. I mean this. Get the hell out of here and stay out. She said distastefully, I've seen it happen, but never this fast. You've gone Hollywood. You're a genius. You're tremendous for getting other people who helped. Go ahead with your mysterious deal, and I hope we never meet again. I struggled with ambivalence. This might be a trick. If not, Frank now hated me irreparably. No time to worry about human emotions. Not any more. Nausea reminded me of the primary purpose. I continued down the dark hallway, listening for Frank's return, hoping she needn't die. Light was unnecessary. I knew the right door. Because it started here, it would end here. Quickly, silently, I slipped into the Venus room. With peculiar relief, I realized Frank wasn't. My nose led me right to the monster. In an ecstatic, semi-stuporous state, smelling strongly of sulfur dioxide, he couldn't have been aware of me. Couldn't? It took you long enough. He didn't bother to turn from the rock he was huddled against. I had to be sure. I felt anything but the calm carried in my voice. No wonder the GG got the right answers, with you making initial starts. Say, were you responsible for the cat that rolled at me? An accident, obviously. I wanted this room built as much as you. Harry, now undisguised, languorously turned. Your little trap didn't quite come off. A danger in fighting a superior intellect. No trap. I had a job to do. It's done. Job? Job? Infuriated, leaping to his feet, he shouted. Speak the native tongue, filth. What's the use? Because of you, I'll never again have the chance. And you no longer have a native tongue. Who were those judges? He asked bitterly to declare me an outcast. Representatives of an outraged society, I almost lost my temper, thinking of this deviant's crimes. You were lucky to get banishment instead of death. He grinned. So were you. True. I tried to find the proper place, where you'd have some chance. He laughed openly. Ha, ha, ha. I fixed the ship nicely. You don't understand at all. I counted on your being a hero, trying to save us, so I escaped. For three years only. What do you mean? One of us won't leave here. Harry frowned, then tried cunning. Aren't you being silly? We are hopelessly marooned. Surely there are overriding considerations to your childish devotion to duty. I shook my head. This is too small a room for us. Even if I trusted you, I couldn't allow you at this naive young world. Voices suddenly approached. The GG? Harry questioned. Didn't know they were coming. Desperately, I looked about, found an eroded mass. Hide there. I'll get rid of them. You'd better. We have business. Possibly it was the only time I've agreed with him. Mel and Dex came in. I called. Over here, Dex snapped his fingers. Knew it was Venus. Mel wrinkled his nose. Sulfur dioxide, too, like we figured. Soda pop, when I broke into that 
tender scene between you and Frank. That gave you necessary carbon dioxide, right? Am I not? Yes. Why don't you guys leave me alone? Beginning to falter in the heat, they dripped perspiration. You could die in this chilly climate. Dex said, Listen for a second. We don't have to break up. Let's form a service organization. Problems Incorporated, or some equally stupid title. Very soon we could afford a private bedroom like this for you to stay in all the time. Need only two or three nights in ten. Harry was moving restlessly. He wouldn't wait much longer. Combination of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and sulfur under relatively high temperatures is how I eat. Pills can substitute, but not for protracted periods. That's why I had to build this room. Couple of weeks, and I'll be in the pink. As pink as you, anyway. Abruptly, I lay down, ignoring them. I had to make my friends go. Harry could literally have shredded them. Footsteps. The door closed. Relief and loneliness joined me, but only for a moment. His voice sliced the darkness. I'm a man of honor and must warn you, if we fight, you'll lose. I escaped with far more pills than you. You're weaker, I said sardonically. With you stealing parts of my supply, that's probably the only truthful thing you've said. I've been in here three nights, adjusting my metabolism. He came at me then, not breaking his flow of speech. At home, I'd have been surprised at the dishonor. Instead, I was expecting it. He ran into my bald fist. If we'd been home. If, 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 if. At full strength, I could have broken his neck with a blow. Now he simply rolled back and fell. Laughing, he attacked again. We were weak as babes and fought like it. Clumsily, slowly, we went through the motions. He'd been right. He was a little stronger, and the relative difference began to tell. Soon I was falling from his blows. Hands on my neck, he kneed me hard in the stomach. Violently ill, I felt the sulfur dioxide rush from my lungs. I remembered one trick they'd taught me at school, and I used it. Unable to break his hold, I managed to get my hands around his throat. We locked, each silent. Silent until I felt my last reserves going, until the crooning of the Song of Eternity began. This couldn't happen, not to this planet. With all my strength, I gave one last squeeze, but it failed. From somewhere, light years of light years away, I heard Frank. Realized I'd played the fool. She'd been working for the monster. A blinding flash inside my head, and the last darkness descended. The light hadn't been inside my head. It flooded the room. Dimly, I was aware of the injection, and immediately felt better. Harry was gone. The GG-1 was gathered around me. Mel said, It was a dilute solution of cerium nitrate. We figured the percentage on the basis of the pill Frank swiped. Hope you aren't poisoned. No, my voice was weak. Need it. Oxidizing agent for the sulfur. Harry's dead, Hazel frowned. When we came in, you'd broken his neck. We're crooning to yourself. So I had been crooning the Song of Eternity? I'm a, I felt silly, a cop on a mission. I waited until whichever of you it was settled down here. That one had to be the criminal, to be done away with. Dex and I got rid of the body, Mel said. No need to worry unless, unless you've read my stories. Perhaps you are the criminal. I'll be watching. No proof, of course. Do you believe I'm the criminal? Mel smiled. No, but I'll watch anyway. More closely than tonight, I hope, Hazel said acidly. If it hadn't been for her... I saw Frank, and was ashamed of my suspicions. She was silent, looking concerned. They all did, and I was warmed. Because, despite discomfort, they worried about me. An alien, a stranger. Better leave. 
Heat's getting you. Dex asked. When are you going back? I shrugged. Never. The ship is in the Gulf of California. Harry did that. What about our company? We can research anti-gravity. You might reach home yet. I shook my head. Said I was a policeman. I don't know very much. Perfectly normal, Mel said before Hazel shushed him. Dex was insistent. Any cop knows at least something about his motorcycle. Was I right about the superconductor? Yes. Now get out of here, idiots, before there's no one left to form the company. Hazel, perspiring freely, red hair shimmering, kissed me. We figured you out real, real early. You aren't ever wrong, and I'm glad we stayed with you, Mr. Venus. She laughed joyously. First time I've ever kissed a Venusian. Frank, head close to mine, said softly, I'm terribly sorry I said those things, but you had to believe I was angry so I could call the others. And I did everything possible to get you out. We were silent. Then I said what I'd been fighting not to for so long. Frank? Francis? She understood and stared horrified at me. I'd lost, bowed my head, feeling like the damned fool I was. She looked around the room. It's so strange. And with ingrained racial conditioning, you couldn't respond to a thin, sallow alien. I don't know, she said hesitantly. I do, Mel said, the oldest story in science fiction. It's true. I can't write it. Why not? No editor in right or wrong mind would buy the beautiful earth damsel after whom lusts the monster from Venus. Frank snapped. He isn't a monster, and his manners are better than many writers I could name. Her voice trailed off with awareness of Mel's tiny smile, a smile that widened. He pulled her toward the door. What a story! We'll hold the wedding in a Turkish bath. Alone, I sighed. Comfortable again after three years, I was grateful to the GG and would do anything within limits, for them. Yet my newly adopted planet needed protection. Babes in the woods, they'd be torn to pieces outside. Fortunately, the GG didn't know my meaning of policeman. My home's highest order of intellect, I'd assure the group finally getting anti-gravity and use of planetary lines of force, but not the hyperspace drive, not for a good long while. I certainly couldn't destroy the GG's confidence. I couldn't hurt them. They were so sure about me, so sure they were never wrong. How could I explain I'd been looking for a decent, habitable planet like Venus to discharge my captive, that I was from another galaxy? End of Question of Comfort by Les Collins